Star Wars The Corellian Trilogy Book 3 Shut Down at Centerpoint By Roger McBride Allen Chapter 2 Approach Honored Solo, we are running out of time. The voice squawked from the calm unit. We will be entering atmosphere soonest if our approach is not controlled. The intercom gave out a strangled squeal. Either the calm circuit up to the ship's control cabin was on the verge of giving out again, or else Han had just gotten lucky, and Drachmas was about to lose her voice. That would be a blessing. Han slapped the answer switch and tried to stay focused on his work. Keep your shirt on, Drachmas, he said, shouting just a bit. The comm unit send circuits needed work as well. Tell honored pilot Salco that I'm nearly done. Why did the universe require all shipboard repairs to be on the rush? What I wouldn't give to have Chewbacca here, Han thought. What shirt? The voice asked worriedly. Should shirts be worn? Is this for safety? Han sighed and pushed the answer button again. It's an expression. It means be patient he said, struggling to keep his own patience. Drachmas was a Salonian, and most Salonians did not like being in space. Understandable for a species that mostly lived underground, but having an agoraphobic being in command was enough to drive anyone crazy. Han Solo made the last hookup, closed down the last of the inspection hatches, and crossed his fingers. For luck. That ought to do the trick, he told himself. It had better. It was about time that something worked properly. If the cone ship he was aboard was a fair example of the breed, Salonian spacecraft weren't much for reliability. Han engaged the power switch and waited for the inverter system to energize. Han was starting to question his own sanity in volunteering to help fly this particular cone ship down out of free space to the surface of Salonia. He could have said so long and good luck and ridden down with Leia on the Jade's fire. But when a job needed doing, and no one else could do it, volunteering was not really all that voluntary. He hadn't had much choice in the matter. He couldn't have left Drachmas high and dry. He had obligations to her, and to her people. And Drachmas had made it clear they had to get this ship down. Her people couldn't afford to abandon any spacecraft, no matter what shape the craft was in. The nameless cone ship might be a piece of space-going junk, but Drachmas had assured Han that it was better than anything else the Salonians had at the moment. Or, more accurately, it was better than anything that the Hunchuzik Den and their republicists had. Hurry, honored Solo. Drachmas called again. Why couldn't that intercom break down the way everything else did on this ship? Han hit the answer button again. Stand by, Drachmas. Pilot Salkold watched your power settings. Knowing he was with the Hunchuzik would have been a bit more useful if Han had had some clear idea about who or what the Hunchuzik Den was. All he knew for sure about them was that the Den was part of an amorphous faction of Salonians who lived on Karelia, and that, so far as Drachmas knew, they were still allied to a pro-new Republic alliance of Salonian Dens called the Republicists, and that he was mixed up with them. Drachmas was a member of the Hunchuzik and she had either kidnapped Han or rescued him from Thrak and Salsolo or both. Han was still not sure. The Hunchuzik seemed to be having a fight with the Overden, the leadership on Salonia proper, a fight that was going on in parallel with the Republic's battle against the rebellions in the Corellia system, though the two fights did not seem to be directly related to each other. The Overden was on the absolutist side, which wanted absolute independence for Salonia. But even if the Ilanchuzuk were repubicists and the Overden were absolutists, Han was coming to the conclusion that neither side much cared about principles, either way. Each was primarily against the other. But Han did know a few things for sure. 
He knew that Drachmas had saved his life and that she had taken risks to treat him well. He knew that a member of his own family Thrak and Sal Solo had treated Drachmas's people with the utmost cruelty. By Salonian standards, that alone was enough to brand Han himself as a villain, a killer, a monster. Yet Drachmas had given Han every benefit of the doubt. She had treated him with decency and respect. If that was all Han knew, it was also all he had to know. When will it be working? Drachmas called, her voice growing more strident. The planet is getting closer. That is the idea when you're trying to re-enter. Han muttered to himself. Decency and respect to one side, there was no denying that Drachmas could be one major pain in the neck. Han pressed the answer stud again and spoke. It's working now. Tell Salkold the inverter is back online. Have her power up the control circuits and let's see how it goes. We shall do so, honored Solo, said the faint, worried-sounding voice from the comm unit. Sealed says she is initiating control circuit power-up. Han was kneeling down in front of the inspection hatch, and a low-powered hum made him think he might be just a bit too close to the inverter array. He stood up and backed away. The hum faded out after a moment, and the array's indicator lights came on, showing normal operation. Han pressed down the answer button again. Don't hold me to this. He shouted, HUD I think it's working. The spare parts off Mara's ship did the trick. We ought to be able to get underway any time you like. Good to hear, most honorable Solo. Drachmas said, the relief in her voice almost painfully obvious. Very good to hear indeed. We shall proceed at once. The indicators flickered a bit to show the inverters were drawing more power. Take it easy up there, Han said. Throttle up nice and slow, all right? We are doing so, honored Solo. And we shall hold that one-third power. We have no desire to overload our systems again. That's very reassuring, Han said. But I think I'd better head up there and keep an eye on you just the same. Han crossed to the access ladder and climbed up to the nose cabin of the cone ship. The cone ship was just at a fat cone, with the engines at the base and the control cabin in the point. The nose itself was nearly all transparent transplex affording a spectacular overhead view. The pilot, Salkold, lay flat on her back, looking up and out at the sky ahead. For a human pilot, it would not be the most comfortable way to work. Of course, Salonians were most decidedly not human. Salkold looked over to the lower deck access hatch as Han climbed out of it. She gave him a toothy smile and then returned her attention to her work. She looked comfortable enough. Drachmas was pacing at the rear of the cabin, looking anything but Karen or relaxed. Though they were fairly standard bipeds, Salonians were taller but thinner than humans. Their arms and legs were shorter, and their bodies rather longer. They could manage equally well walking on two feet or four. Retractable claws in both their hand paws and foot paws made them impressive climbers and diggers. Their tails were only about half a meter long, but they packed a major wallop when used as a club as Han had reason to know. They had long, pointed faces, and their entire bodies were covered in sleek, short-haired fur. Drachmas was dark brown. Salkold was mostly black, but her belly fur was light brown. They both had bristly whiskers that were as expressive as human eyebrows, once you got a little practice in interpreting them. They also had mouths full of very sharp teeth. Han had been able to interpret the teeth with no practice at all. In short, they were elegant and impressive-looking creatures. How does all go? Han asked Salkold the pilot, speaking in his rather labored Salonian. Salkold did not speak basic. All is well. 
honored Solo, Salkold replied. At least until the next subsystem flips out. Wonderful, Hans said to himself. Everything be well, honored Drachmas? He asked in Salonian. Fine, line, all is fine, until we crash and die, Drachmas replied. Glad we have a consensus, Han muttered to himself. It is good to plan ahead like that, Salkold said. Here I was just going to land the ship the regular way. Now I are knowing that I will fail and we will crash. It is most comforting. That is enough, pilot Salkold. Drachmas snapped. Concentrate all attention on your duties. Yes, honored Drachmas, Salkold said at once, her tone of voice most apologetic. Salkold was a fairly experienced Petal, and knew her ship at least reasonably well, if not as well as Han would have preferred. Drachmas, on the other hand, was trained to deal with humans, and incompletely trained at that. When it came to ship handling, she had no experience, no knowledge, and no skill. Even so, she commanded the ship not just in deciding where it would go, but down to the last detail of every maneuver. Salkold could not, or would not, overrule her. Drachmas was of higher status, or seniority, or something, relative to Salkold, and that was that, insofar as either of the Salonians was concerned. Neither seemed much concerned by the fact that Drachmas had only the slightest understanding of space operations or by the fact that during the raid on Salonia she had repeatedly ordered the ship to do things it could not, and come alarmingly close to getting them all killed. Sakeld might have a smart mouth and an irreverent attitude, but she followed all of Drachmas's orders no matter how boneheaded with alarming dispatch. It took some getting used to. Han took his own place in the control seat next to Salkeld. He had done his best to adjust the padding to fit a human frame, but the seat would never be comfortable. Han lay back and looked up. The view out the transparent nose of the cone ship was nothing less than spectacular. The planet Salonia hung big and bright in the sky, filling the middle third of the field of view. Salonia had smaller oceans than Corellia, and the land mass was broken up into thousands of medium-sized islands more or less evenly spaced across the face of the planet. Instead of two or three large oceans and four or five continental landmasses, Salonia's surface was a maze of water and land. Hundreds of seas and bays and inlets and straits and shoals separated the islands. Han remembered reading somewhere that no point on land anywhere on Salonia was more than 150 kilometers from open water and no point on the water was more than 200 kilometers from the nearest shoreline. But there was more to the view than the spectacular planet. Mara Jade's personal ship, the Jade's Fire, hung in space a kilometer or two away, her bow hiding a bit of the planet's equatorial region. She was a long, low, streamlined ship, painted in a flame pattern of red and gold. The ship looked fast, sleek, strong. Maneuverable and Han knew she was all of those things. He wished, not for the first time, that he was aboard her, and not just because the fire was a better ship. Leia was aboard the fire, along with Mara Jade. After Drachmas had managed to blow out nearly every system on board the cone ship, the fire had rescued them and provided Han with the spare parts he needed to repair the craft. Now the fire was preparing to see the cone ship to a safe landing. Han did not like Leia being on one ship while he was on the other, but the arrangement made too much sense. Mara, not yet completely recovered from her leg injury, still needed some looking after, and she needed a co-pilot, at least until she recovered. Space knew the Salonians, Drachmas and Salkold, needed all the help they could get. Besides which, Leia spoke Salonian, spoke it better than Han. For that matter and given recent events it made more than a little sense to have at least one speaker of the Salonian language aboard each ship, in case of difficulties at the landing field. 
The plan was for the two ships to fly toward Salonia in formation and land side by side. But even if it all seemed perfectly reasonable and harmless for Leia to stay on Mara's ship while he flew in the cone ship, Han didn't have to like it. He didn't need to ask what could go wrong. So many things had gone wrong already. A bright light flashed on and off from the forward port of the fire. Leia was using the landing lights on the Jade's fire to send Mon Calamari blink code combinations of long and short flashes to form the letters of the basic alphabet. The technique was slow and clumsy, but the normal calm channels were jammed and it beat not being able to talk at all. Ready to begin entry, Han read. Signal when you are ready. They say they are ready. He turned to Salkult. Are we prepared? Yes, said Salkult. Very well, Han said. Honored Drachmas, he said in basic so that Salkult could not understand. You will now do what I say. Stop pacing, take your seat, and instruct Salkult to accept orders from me. I would then ask you most kindly to shut up until we are on the ground. I want you to give no orders and say nothing. I just want you to sit quietly. Or else I tell the Jade's Fire that escorting us is a suicide run. I will instruct them to leave us here. It was all bluff, of course. Hud Drachmas was panicky enough that she wasn't likely to think it through. But dash. She protested. But nothing. I know blink code and you don't. I can talk to the fire and you can't. You nearly got us killed ordering this ship around before, and I'm not going to put up with that again. I must protest. This is robbery of the worst kind. Han grinned. Actually, it's more like piracy. Or you could call it a pretty mid-form of hijacking. And I might add that if you don't know robbery from piracy, you have no business running a ship. Drachmas glared at Han, about to protest but then she shook to her head. So be it. I must accede. Even to my eye, my ship orders were none too good, and I wished to live some more. She shifted to Salonian. Pilot Sal called. You will obey the orders of honored Han Solo as you would are in Wyoming and do so until such time as we reach the ground. Salkold sat up in her seat and looked from one to the other before grinning even more widely than before. Yes, honored Drachmas. She said. I obey with pleasure. See that you don't find too much pleasure in obeying, Salkold. Drachmas growled. Honored Solo, if you would proceed. Take your seat. Han said to Drachmas in Salonian, We all must strap in and prepare for acceleration. Salkold, you will fly a standard approach to the intended field of landing, starting on my command. Is that understood? Yes, indeed, Salkold said. Absolutely. Han picked up the handlight placed next to his seat for the purpose, and signaled back to the fire. BDFO commence entry maneuvers, he signaled, managing to spot every mistake just after he made it. Someday I gotta take the time to brush up on this stuff, he muttered to himself. We are just I about BD ourselves, Leia signaled back. Taking position to your stern. We'll follow. You in. Ha ha ha, Han said. Glad I married such a humorist. He shifted back to Salonian. Very well, Salkold, take us in. With much care. As he watched, the Jade's fire came about on her long axis, putting her stern toward the cone ship. Salkold edged the throttle upward, transferring minimum power to the engines. As the cone ship began to accelerate toward the planet, the fire drifted back, falling astern off the port side. As the faster, more maneuverable ship, and the one that was easier to control, it made sense for the fire to go in second, where she could keep watch on the cone ship. 
But even the spares on board the fire had not been enough to patch up the cone ship's stern detector grid. The cone ship was, and would continue to be, all but completely blind astern. All she had was one wide-angle holocom set in the base of the cone, between two of the sublight engines. It would be useful during the final approach and landing, but even with the main engines off, its resolution was so poor that the jade's fire would be lost to view if she drifted only a few kilometers away. Once the engines came on, the stern holocom view could only get worse. In other words, Han might or might not be able to see the fire's blink code signals if she signaled again. In theory, he could use the cone ship's running lights to send blink code of his own, but he would not be able to see the lights himself, rendering it just that much harder to send accurate code. Han was hoping the question of signaling wouldn't come up. The poor visibility to the stern made for another good reason to have the fire go in second. Better to have a ship you trusted at your back. At least a ship you more or less trusted. Han had managed to put to rest most but not all of his reservations regarding Mara. He could think of no reason, no motive, for her acting against Han and Leia and the Republic, and there was no hard evidence that she had done so. But she had never explained her actions to his satisfaction either. She had been in the right places at the right times and Aichi wrong places at the wrong times a bit too often in recent days. On the other hand, if she had wanted to do real damage, Mara was too much of a pro to let things be bungled. And the opposition had certainly done some bungling, thank the stars. Not everything had gone their way. Say whatever else you might about the woman, but Mara was competent. And that was a compelling argument. No, Han told himself as the jade's fire was lost completely to forward view. Leave to be. They really had no choice but to trust Jade. He watched as the fire came into somewhat fuzzy view on the stern view screen. It was time to forget everything else and remember that the main thing was to get this crate down onto the surface. Now, Salkald, it is your task, he said. Do well. I will, Salkald said. Don't worry about that. The ship chose that moment to lurch to one side, and Salkold grabbed frantically at the controls. Sorry, sorry, Salkold said. Stabilizer overcompensating. All right now. I can't tell you what a comfort that is, Han said. For a moment he considered the idea of shoving Salkold out of the pilot's station and taking over, but he knew better than that. The controls were set up for a Salonian, and the cone ship had so many idiosyncrasies that made the Millennium Falcon look like a standard production ship. It might be an alarming thought, but unless things got really hairy, it was probably safest to trust Salkold. Salkold edged the throttle up just a trifle more, and the cone ship moved just a bit faster and toward the planet. At least the cone ship was not such a relic that it relied on ballistic reentry using friction with the atmosphere to slow itself down. It could make a nice, civilized, powered re-entry. At least Han hoped so. Most spacecraft were designed to survive at least one ballistic re-entry, but not this thing. The planet moved closer. In another few minutes Salkold would have to turn the ship over and point its engines forward to slow the craft. That was the part that worried Han. Once they were decelerating, they would be at their most vulnerable. The cone ship's fragility was far from the only source of danger. Someone on Salonia had sent a whole fleet of light attack fighters up to meet the Bakuran ships. The Bakurans had done a fair amount of damage to the LAFs, but Han had to assume that whoever commanded them would have the sense to hold some of them in reserve. And as Drachmas assured him that the Hunchuzik had no such ships, it only made sense to assume that whoever it was who did have light attack fighters might take a dim view of the cone ship's arrival. Thing could get sticky. Han had worked on the assumption that there would be trouble, and done his best to plan accordingly.
The jade's fire could provide a certain amount of covering fire, if push came to shove, but the other ship would be an uncertain protection at best. The cone ship was completely unarmed, and had no shields at all. It didn't even have enough reserve power to hook up any weaponry a moot point in any event, as there was no practical way to dismount any of the jade's weapons or attach them to the cone ship. Han had looked into it. Short of standing in the airlock and taking pot shots at any attackers with his hand blaster, there was not much he could do. But Han was used to working with nothing. Even a ship as decrepit as this one could play a few tricks if need be. He had found a way to rig up a defense that might provide some measure of protection if things got hot. Of course, sometimes, when you worked with nothing, nothing was exactly what you got. And sometimes, if you got into a fight with people who had better hardware, those other people won. Not a happy line of thought when you were on board a flying practice target headed into a war zone. And his thoughts didn't get any happier a few minutes later when Leia sent that attack warning. Cha PTR2 Landing Leia Organa Solo, Chief of State of the New Republic, sat at the navigator's station aboard the Jade's Fire watching the cone ship drift in toward the planet Salonia. She had been a fool to let Han stay aboard that bucket of bolts. But she knew perfectly well that there had been no chance at all to get him off that ship, once he had decided he owed something to the Salonians on board. But what, exactly, was he getting them into? Leia was forced to think not just like a wife but like a politician. She could not see any way of avoiding it, but there was no question that Han was being drawn in by these Salonians and that Leia was being drawn in as well. It would be easy, all too easy, for the New Republic to find itself on one side or another of a light it had no business in. It would be even easier to get tempted into bargains with these Hunchuziks, bargains that had a few too many hidden strings attached. He'll be all right, Leia, Mara said. We'll stay right with them, all the way down. The fire can offer them more protection than you think. Hmm? What? Oh, yes, Leia said, pointlessly embarrassed. It was somewhat mortifying to be reassured by Mara Jade, of all people. Somehow to have Mara assume that Leia was worrying about her husband's safety when she was really thinking about the Politics of the situation made it even worse. Was she so callous that calculation of political advantage even pushed aside worries about her husband? So calculating that even Mara Jade was capable of more concern for Han? But Leia told herself, rather firmly, that she had more sense than that. She had no choice but to think on more than one level. What good would it do Han if she got so tied up in sentimental worrying that she failed to foresee the dangers ahead? Han will be all right, Leia said again, trying to convince herself as much as her companion. If anyone can get that tub down to the surface, he can. If anyone can. Mara agreed, none too reassuringly. Mara was at her usual post, at the pilot's station guiding the jade's fire down toward the surface. She frowned and adjusted the thrust controls a bit, slowing them down again. Trouble? Leia asked. Mara shook her head without taking her eyes off the viewport. Nothing we can handle, but I don't like being behind the cone ship. That Siphonian pilot needs a flying lesson or two. If she hits the brakes like that too many times, she's going to get our nose assembly right up her stern. Can we back off a little? Not if we want them to stay in visual contact with us. That stern holocum has no resolution at all. We might be too far back for it to see us as it is. Burning stars, she doesn't know how to fly. Mara pulled her joystick violently up and to the right. She's doing the pitch-over maneuver way too early and without shutting off her engines. Nearly clipped her. Leia watched as the lumbering bulk of the cone ship began its turnover, 
flipping end over end to direct its sublight engines toward the planet and slow its descent. It was painfully obvious that the pilot was not managing very well. The ship was lurching abruptly from one attitude to the next, pausing at intermediate. Stages of the maneuver instead of moving smoothly from a nose-to-planet attitude direct to stern-to-planet. It only made it worse much worse that the pilot was doing it under power. Leia was a pretty fair pilot, and she would have been very reluctant to try doing it that way. Mara was forced to fly two more evasive patterns just to keep the fire from crashing into the other ship. Finally she backed the fire off by five kilometers. They're going to be nose on to us anyway, Mara said. They'll be able to see us reasonably well. With a little luck, Leia said a bit doubtfully. The fire had first-rate detection systems and could have tracked the cone ship halfway across the Corellian system, but all the Yant ship had was straight visual. Leia peered out the fire's viewport and managed, with great difficulty, to spot the tiny dot that was the cone ship. The bright bulk of the planet's day side loomed up behind the ship, rendering it all but invisible. How easy would the fire be to see? A little spot of red against the blackness of space. Mara wasn't even using the main view screen anymore, but watching her detector displays. She wasn't relying on visual detection. Oh, well. As long as at least one ship could see the other, things should be all right. Trouble. Mara announced. Leia, weapons and shields to stand by, fast. Leia ran the power-up routines as quickly as she could. She ran quick checks on the ship's turbolasers and shields. All weapon and shield systems functional and online. She announced, What's happened? Power up the defense tracking systems and tell me, Mara said. All the NAV systems can tell me is that a bunch of blips just showed up out of nowhere. Light attack fighters, Leia announced as the defense trackers came on. A double flight of them, twelve in all, coming in from right over our stern. Must have dropped out of a high polar orbit. Mara shook her head as she stared down at the navigation display. We can handle them, but it won't be easy. Not with the cone ship to cover. We're too far off to extend our shields toward the cone ship. And we're going to stay that way, Mara said sharply. I'm not getting any closer to that pilot than I have to especially in combat. She's already nearly rammed us twice. Get close enough to provide shield cover, and we'll all be dead. Covering fire is the best I'm going to be able to do. How soon until the LAFs get here? Firing range in 30 seconds. Stand by for combat maneuvers. No. Wait. We have to blink code to Han, warn them. You've got 25 seconds, Mara said, steel in her voice. There was no point even trying to argue. Leia reached for the landing light controls and flipped them back to blink code mode. She forced herself to take a full five seconds to compose her message, and then sent it three times, in rapid succession. Done, Leia said. Good, Mara said. Hang on. Han was almost too busy trying to keep from being flung out of his chair to notice the flashing lights visible in the overhead viewport. Smooth and gentle, Sal called. Not sudden. He shouted as he tried to concentrate on the blink code not easy to do when the ship he was on was flailing about like a cornered banda. The trouble was that Han was only marginally better at reading code than he was at sending it. Even under perfect conditions, he might have had problems. He struggled to catch it all. At least Leia used the special word and signal between words. Otherwise, he'd have never gotten anywhere. BNDI, something something word ends. He muttered to himself. Bandy? Bandits. Oh, great. 
He tried to concentrate on the next word. Miss something R.O.M. Word ends. Burning suns, Leia, do you have to send so fast? Miss something Yachelendi, -E word ends, J.D.S.F.I. Han missed the end of it as the cone ship bobbled about again. But he had read enough to know the score. Bandits, enemy fighters, were headed this way, coming from behind the Jade's fire. And either by bad luck or good timing they were heading in right as the cone ship was at its most vulnerable. Han glanced over at the Salonians. You didn't have to be an expert at reading Salonian expressions to know that they were both scared silly, Sal called only slightly less so than Dreamus. Han reminded himself she did not speak basic. There was no point at all to telling Salkald about the bandits until she had the ship under control. Han was sure she hadn't even seen the blink code message. Good. Let her work. Let her work. The cone ship slowly lumbered around into braking position, its fat stern pointed almost precisely straight down at the planet, but canted just slightly into the ship's direction of travel so the braking run could kill the craft's forward momentum as well. Han checked his instruments, doing his best to make sense out of the Salonian notation. By some miracle or other, Salkold seemed I-0 have gotten them into the right position and at the right attitude. Good, good, he said as calmly as he could. Probably they had just a few seconds left before the bandits jumped them but trying to rush Salkold would be worse than useless at this point. If she got any more scared, she might freeze completely. Now then, Salkold, one other matter. It's time to, ah, uh, lest our defense plan. You will bring the ship to spin, please, of three spins per minute. Test? Dreamus sputtered. But you said it was a one-time-only trick. Han had been hoping no one would bring that up. At least Drachmas had spoken in basic. There was still a million to one chance Salkuld hadn't caught on. Quiet, he said in basic before switching back to Salonian. Make the spins, please, honored Salkuld. Make sure all is waily, in case needed. It was clear that Salkuld did not believe him, but it would seem she was willing to pretend she did at least for a little while. Yes, yes. She said, Of course. Commencing axial spin. The ship began to rotate around its conical axis, so the stars pinwheeled across the sky. Han studied the overhead view, as best he was able. He could just about spot the fire, and the bandits were almost certainly smaller, and coming from behind. There was no way he could find them, especially with the ship spinning like a top. He gave it up. No point in worrying about things he could not change. Disable internal damping, Han said calmly, casually. The inertial dampers prevented anything more than a few percent of a ship's acceleration and motion from being felt by those aboard. Without them... The occupants of a ship accelerating to light speed could be squashed to jelly. No one liked turning them off, but sometimes you had to do what you didn't like. But if we cannot restart inertial damping dash, worry about such later. Han snapped. He knew better than Salkald what it might mean if they couldn't get the dampers back on. But they would have to live long enough for the problem to come up. We need to use centrifugal effective plan is to work, and inertial damping cancels it out. End damping. Salkuld inhaled nervously and reached out her hand to cut off the inertial damping system. All of a sudden, Han felt his weight double, then triple, as the dampers stopped compensating for the ship's deceleration. A moment later he felt the disorienting sensation of the ship spinning. Confirm all inner airlocks sealed. Han ordered. All inner airlock doors sealed. Pressure in locks, Salkold said. Honored Solo, must we truly? Quiet. We must. Be ready for next step. 
maintain course, maintain thrust, unless I order otherwise. Hans struggled to concentrate on the spinning starfield overhead. If this was going to work, it would take exact timing. But how could he time anything if he couldn't see? Maybe he would get lucky and the jade's fire would signal the all clear. And maybe he would wake up and discover the whole nightmare trip to Corellia had just been a dream. If only wishing could make it true. He had done his best. Now all they could do was hang on and see how it came out. Rear, ventral, and dorsal shields to full, forward shields to one quarter. Mara ordered. Divert shields as needed for ship's safety. Leia worked the shield settings. Shields can ligured as ordered. Good, Mara said. Maintain turbolasers at standby. We aren't going to hold this course and speed. Act like they aren't there. They can't know how good or bad our detectors are. They've never seen this kind of ship before, but I know LAFs. They have the gear to detect turbos going online, but not shield activation. If we keep the guns off and stay on course, they might decide we can't see them. What good does that do us? Lei asked. They might blow right past us and zero in on the Eon ship. My guess is that whoever is on those LAFs is targeting the Hunchuzik, not us. But Han is. Safer this way, Mara said, watching her displays. We can handle seven or eight of them at once, but not twelve. Not in a direct engagement. But if the LAFs don't engage us, we'll have nice, clear forward view. Shots right up their stern plates while they're focused on the cone ship. We can pick off three or four of them before the rest bring fire to bear on us. Set up the targeting system for tracking follow fire. If they engage us directly, we return fire. If they go past us, commence fire when they are three kilometers past us. Understood? Yes, but... No buts, Mara said. This ship fights my way, or not at Ali. Leia gave in again. Mara had far more experience at this sort of fight than she did. Very well, she said. Stand by. Here they come. Leia watched the stern detector displays as the LAFs came in, directly behind the fire's stern, trying to hide in the detection shadow produced by the sublight engines. They were trying to sneak up. From that bearing they wouldn't even show up on most ships' detectors. The LAF swept in, their images in the detection screen breaking up just a bit due to interference from the sublight engines. Leia tensed up as they swept through the optimum firing range, and felt herself relax just a trifle as they swept on, past the fire. But she didn't relax too far now when they were passing her by to take a crack at her husband's ship. The LAFs flashed past the fire, zeroing in on the cone ship. The cone ship. She cried out. It's spinning up. They must have got our warning. Let's hope Han's idea works better than it ought to, Mara said. It wasn't the most tactful thing to say, even if Leia had been thinking the same thing herself. But there was no time. Coming up on three kilometers distance, she said. Commence fire, Mara ordered. Not unless they fire first, Leia said. Maybe they're just here to throw a scare into us, or they might be on escort duty. No way to tell with communications jammed. All right, Mara said, the doubt plain in her voice. You can make that but the first flash of turbo laser fire from the lead LAF shut down the argument. Leia released the safeties on the fire's follow fire circuits and started selecting targets, aiming first for the LAF that had opened fire. Here they come. Han Dot shouted in basic, forgetting for a moment to speak in Salonian. Salkold got the message all the same. 
She looked up through the viewport at the tiny spots of light in the sky and understood precisely what was going on. She let out a most undignified squawk. The whole slowly spinning cone ship lurched to one side and came close to heeling over into a disastrous tumble. Calmness! Han shouted. Be calm, alert. Throttle down all engines. And all thrust. Stand by to open outer airlock doors on my command. Throw throttling down all the engines, Salkold said. Ready on the airlock doors. Wait for it, Han said, watching the LAFs come closer. Weight faded away as Salkold powered down the engines. With the inertia, dampers offline, and the engine thrust gone, Han found himself in zero G for the first time in a long time. Han knew people who had spent half their lives in space without experiencing zero gravity and with the flip-flops his stomach was doing all of a sudden, he could understand why. But there was no time for that now. Not with a sky full of light attack fighters heading in. Be ready, ready, he told Salkult. The lead LAF fired and caught them with a glancing blow to the starboard side, slamming into the hull like a giant fist. It's all right. Han shouted, having not the least idea if it was or not. It's all right. Stand by on the airlock doors. Wait for it. Be ready, Dash. The Jade's fire's forward quad turbo laser blazed away, tracking the lead lap across the sky. The lap broke off its attack run, trying to fly an evasive pattern and escape. For a moment it managed to break out of the tracking pattern, but the jade's fire regained a positive lock and poured in fire again. The LAF shields flared and blazed for a moment before giving way altogether. The fighter exploded, a blossom of fire that flared up and was gone. Leif fed two new targets to the follow fire system and got busy herself with the manual guns, reading the detection screens for herself. But the rest of the LAFs were not going to be such easy pickings. They had their rear shields powered up to maximum and did a better job of evasive maneuvers, good enough to completely bamboozle the follow fire systems. But not good enough to free Leia. She settled in with the manual controls and began looking for targets. She concentrated her fire on the toughest shots, the LFs closest to the cone ship. She got a lock on one and fired, holding the guns on target long enough to burn through the shields and blow the fighter to bits. Just then the cone ship cut its engines, allowing it to drop straight for the planet's surface. It threw the LAFs off, if only for a moment or two. Leia shook her head and sighed. Not much of an evasive maneuver, but probably the best Han could manage with that clunky piece of junk. But suddenly her detector displays showed a cloud of debris blooming out from the cone ship in all directions. Fear stabbed at her heart. That one hit on the cone ship's hull couldn't have done that much damage, could it? Could the craft be breaking up before her eyes, with Han aboard? She had no desire to watch the death of her husband but then something happened to one of the LAFs, and then another, and another. As they swooped in close to the cone ship, they bounced and skittered and wobbled off course. Two of them lost power, and the third was rocked by a small explosion amidships. Leia got a target lock on one of the survivors and fired, catching a piece of him before he managed to get his shields up. Leia tried to track to a new target, but the LAFs had plainly decided low take the hint and accept the fact they weren't welcome. They scattered, hightailing out of there in all directions. But how in the blazes had, suddenly she understood. Of course. Of course. Mara. His trick worked. Get us out from behind Han, fast. New course, five or six kilometers to one side of him, and try to overtake him if you can. It's not going to be so safe to be behind him for a while. 
She smiled, relief flooding over her. She should have known Han wouldn't give up without a fight. Han listened closely as the last of the junk went lumbering out of the airlocks, banging and clattering and thudding and reverberating through the ship. There was no air in the locks left to transmit noise, of course, but there was on the other side of the interior bulkheads a fact that had made itself known with every bit of broken-down hardware that had slammed around the locks. Han had spent half a day policing the ship, looking for every bit of surplus or broken hardware he could. Buckets of bolts, worn-out spare parts, garbage from the galley, unidentifiable bits of machinery that had been sitting in the hold for who knew how long he had thrown all of it into the locks. And all of it had tumbled out into space when the locks were opened, thrown clear by centrifugal force. Result a cloud of slow-moving space junk left right in the path of the attacking LAFs. And the LAFs had quite sensibly configured their shields for maximum power aft, to defend against laser blasts from the jade's fire leaving them with minimum power forward. But plowing through a cloud of hits and pieces of broken meta, and plastic at a closing speed of something like a thousand kilometers an hour was very far from a good idea. However, piling a ship into a planet was an even worse one. Good, Han said. They're gone. But we are not out of this yet. Re-establish inertial dampers and cut ship's spin. At once, honored Solo, Salkald replied. There was an odd shimmering sort of vibration as the inertial field came back on and weight returned. The ship's ungainly spin slowed, and stopped and then started up again in the opposite direction and started low get faster. Sal called. Han called out. This is no time for the playing of games. I am not doing so, honored Solo. Failure in lateral atelute control system. I cannot shut it off. Oh, for dash. Han scrambled up out of his seat and dove for the main circuit breaker box. He yanked it open and tripped the lateral attitude control breaker by hand. That killed the thrusters that were producing the spin but also killed the ones that fired in the opposite direction and could bring it to a halt. He slapped the access door shut and returned to his seat. Hope everyone is liking low spin. Han announced in Salonian. We are to do it for a while. Sakled. Restart to main sublight engines and nice, slow throttle up, please. At once, honored Solo. Salkald replied. She reached for the throttle controls and began adjusting them. Nothing seemed to happen. Not that slow, Salkald. We need to do some braking. Salkald looked a. Han and the panicked. Okay, that had seemed on the verge of fading away was therein. Full force, and no doubt. No activation. She announced. Engine initiator not responding. Horror. Cried Drachmus. We incinerate for certain. Quiet, Drachmus, or I send you out the airlock. Sal called. Try again, Han said. Firstly, confirm you have power to all engine systems. Board shows all power systems fine and lovely, Salkold said. Board says is working, but it not. Not helpful, Han said, jumping up. Off I go again. Keep trying, and listen to the calm. Han rushed for the ladder to the lower decks and clambered down as fast as he could. As soon as he reached the lower deck, he smelled smoke. There was trouble, big trouble. That one hit from the LAF must have hit something in the transverse power coupling. Han jogged around the circumferentia corridor until he reached the proper access hatch. It was sealed, praise be. The bad news was the smoke was coming off the painted metal on the hatch. Han checked the readouts. 
They showed there was still pressure in there, if the numbers were to be believed. The temperature gauge was pegged at the high end. He worked the hatch controls to pop the compartment's spill valves. They should have operated automatically once fire broke out. Obviously, they hadn't. But even if the automatics were out, at least the manual controls were still working. There was a sort of clank and a thud from behind the hatch, and then a roaring hiss that faded off into nothing as the air in the compartment vented into space. The ship lurched slightly to one side before the inertial dampers corrected for the off-center thrust. Han resealed the spill valves. The hatch had a manual spill valve of its own that allowed pressure between the two sides of the hatch to equalize without opening it up. Han burned his fingers getting the safeties off, and then popped the hatch valve. The corridor was suddenly filled with a roaring, thundering rush of air that almost knocked Han over. Han looked around, and for a miracle, spotted a fire extinguisher within reach right where it was supposed to be. He peeled off his shirt and wrapped it around his left hand, then looked the extinguisher in his right. He grabbed the manual hatch control with his left hand, and the shirt instantly began to smolder. He pulled the lever and swung the hatch open. A blast of heat struck him in the face. He hecked his grip on the extinguisher. If the renewed supply of oxygen started something burning, he wanted to be ready for it. But he did not want to try doing emergency repairs on equipment that was covered with spray foam if he could possibly avoid it. Not that spray foam could have made things much worse. Han stood in the hatchway, stared at the compartment, and felt sick. The initiator was just not there anymore. There was no need for the extinguisher. Anything that could have burned already had. Han looked down at the blackened deck plates. The compartment was just under the outer hull. FT looked as if the LAF's turbolaser hadn't quite burned through the hull, but it had clearly come close. The entire compartment was still hot, but was cooling rapidly now, the metal pinging and clinging as it gave up its heat to space. But Han wasn't here to see what happened after an equipment bay fire. Think, Han told himself. Think as Foz. As you ever have. The cone ship had a very awkward engine start system, and one that had caused plenty of trouble already on this trip. More modern systems work differently, but on this bucket, the initiators served as massive capacitors, storing up huge amounts of energy and slamming it all out at once to get the sublight engines over the power threshold where their energy reaction was self-sustaining. With the initiators out, the sublight engines could not restart. And without those engines the cone ship was going to drop like a Sloan, a shooting star aimed. Straight for the planet. They had to restart those engines. They had to. But there was no other system in the ship with anything like enough power to let the sublights reach their minimum startup energy. Even if they overloaded every single. Wait a second. Tie was it? It was unlikely it would work. But it definitely wouldn't work if he didn't give it a try. And give it a ITY fast. They were in free fall heading straight for a spot that was going to have a new crater in a few minutes. Han stepped back out of the initiator compartment and resealed the hatch. Where would the repulsor feedback dispersal system be on this tub? Useless to ask Salkult. She was so close to the edge she probably wouldn't remember where the pilot's station was. She had given him a tour of the ship when he had first come aboard that was it just on the other side of the main power room. Perfect. Han rushed back down the circumferential corridor the way he had come and found the right access panel on the wall. He pulled it open and traced the connections. Good. Good. For a wonder, they were all standard hookups. He tripped the breaker by hand. Cable. He needed power cable. Stores room. 
They had all but cleaned it out to fill the airlocks with junk, but there had to be something left. He charged down the corridor and threw open the hatch to the store's room. Nothing. Down to the bare walls. Utterly empty. Hans started to swear to himself and at himself with impressive fluency, but there was no time for such indulgences. Think, think. Life support. Main power to life support. No sense keeping it on. They were all going to be dead in about five minutes anyway if he didn't get some power cable. Life support. Where could he kill power to life support? Right. Cut it right at main power and yank the cable from there. Han rushed back to the main power room, threw the hatch open, and went inside. Not everything was labeled, and what was labeled was in Salonian, of course. He struggled to sort out what was what. There. If he was reading the labels right, that junction was main device for rube blowing of air. Meant for breathing, and tilt one was cleansing of air from. Pollutants for pleasant breathing. A little verbose, perhaps, but clear enough. He found the circuit breakers on the junctions and slammed them off. Han could hear the fans and blowers dying all over the ship. He yanked the power cables out of their sockets and pulled them down off their cable guides. He pulled the other ends of the cables and then found a label reading power input herc from the powerful initiators which are in another compartment. He pulled the cables running from the destroyed initiators and plugged in his borrowed life support cables. He snaked the cables out into the corridor, praying they would reach, and gave thanks when they did. He made sure the repulsors were offline, then yanked the lines running to the repulsor feedback dispersal unit and plugged in his borrowed cables. He stepped back and double-checked his work. Okay, he said to no one at all. That ought to work. I think. He turned and ran for the ladder up to the command deck. Something's wrong, Leia said, watching her detector screens. The spin has reversed instead of stopping, and they haven't restarted their main engines. Maybe they took some bad damage from that hit, Mara said. Can we dock with the ship and get them off? Leia asked. Not before they hit atmosphere, Mara said. There's nowhere near enough time. Besides, that cloud of debris they threw out is still traveling with them. We'd get hit the same way the LAFs were. A tractor beam, then, Leia said. We could set that up and... And what? That ship isn't all that much smaller than this one. The tractor on this ship doesn't have a tenth the power to hold that ship. If we tried it, more than likely they'd pull us down instead. I'm sorry, Leia. There's nothing at all we can do. Deep in her heart, Leia knew Mara was right. But it felt wrong to give up without a fight. They had to do some eyeing. Stay close, Leia said. Get as close as you can without getting into the debris cloud and take up station keeping. Leia, there is nothing we can. Suppose they get temporary control, or slow just enough tie they can abandon ship. Leia asked. We need to be close enough to get in and help. Mara hesitated a moment. All right. But we won't be able to hold station keeping long. We're about five minutes from atmosphere right now, and once we hit it well, that will be the end of things. Leia knew that. Without shielding, without breaking from the engines, the cone ship would turn into a meteorite, a streak of fire that burned across the sky before crashing in the planet. I'll stay close as long as I can, Mara said. But it won't be long. Do it, Leia said. But even as she urged Mara onward, she wondered why. What good would it do to watch from closer in as her husband was incinerated? Out. 
Han shouted at Salkald as he came up out the hatch to the command deck. Out of pilot chair now. I take over. But what are you? No time. He snapped. He sealed the hatch, just in case they lived long enough to worry about air leaks. I must take over. No time to explain what to do. Out. Move. Salkold moved, undoing her seal restraints and bailing out of the pilot's station. Han dove into the vacated seat and checked the status board. Good. Good. Repulsors showing full power in reserve. Switching on repulsors. He announced. He adjusted them for their tightest beam and maximum range. Honored Solo. The repulsors cannot work at this range, Drachmas said in basic. They arc only effective within two kilometers of surface. I know that, Han said. They need something to work against before they can set up a repulsion effect. But at these speeds, they'll encounter a fair amount of resistance from the top of the atmosphere. I know, I know. Not enough to slow us down but enough to start large power transfers through the feedback dispersal loop. But what good does that do? I've taken the disperser out of the loop and run the cables through the initiator, power intake on the engine power system. The feedback energy is just accumulating in the repulsor system. When the power level is high enough, I'll reset the feedback power breaker and dump the energy right into the initiator intake on the engine power systems. What? Jumpstart it, Han said. I'm going to jumpstart it. There was a moment of dead silence in the control cabin before Drachmas let out a strangled moan and covered her face with her hands. What is going on? Salkold demanded in Salonian. I go to start engines by accumulating repulsive feedback power and dumping through initiator manifold, Han replied. But feedback buildup will destroy repulsors. Get even more destroyed by crashing into Salonia, Han said in his awkward Salonian. This not work and you have idea you try yours. Hang on. The idea was crazy. Han knew that. But not doing anything at all would be crazier still. Even a million to one shot was better than no chance at all. He watched the feedback charge accumulator display as the excess energy built up in the repulsor system. The more power, the better the chance of restarting the engines unless he accumulated so much power the repulsors simply blew out. The closer they got to the planet, the more resistance the repulsors encountered and the faster the feedback accumulated. But of course, the farther they fell, the less time they would have to put on the brakes, if and when the engines did light. Han knew that even the maximum power output he could hope for would be borderline minimum to get the sublight engines going and he was going to gel exactly one chance. Whether or not this stunt worked, it was going to blow out the repulsors and the feedback accumulator, and half the other systems on the ship. Han checked his estimated flight path meters. Twenty seconds from the average top of the sensible atmosphere, though the tops of atmospheres had a nasty habit of not being where they were supposed to be, raising and lowering depending on storms and tides and solar heating. But twenty seconds was the outside, the longest he could possibly wait. The repulsors were not likely to provide much more charging of the accumulator if they were being melted off. It was going to be a tough call, a threading of the needle between competing disasters. Han checked the altitude and acceleration displays. The cone ship was gathering speed, terrifying speed, with every second. Even if he got the engines lit, there might not be time to slow the ship before piling it in. Honored Solo. Hull temperature suddenly increasing. Salkold cried. Atmosphere's here a little early, Han said. Hang on. We're going to jump this thing and see what happens. One chance, Han told himself. 
exactly one chance. For a fleeting moment he thought of Leia, watching from the jade's fire and unable to do anything. He thought of his three children, off somewhere in the care of Chewbacca and Ibrahim the Drawl. No. No. He could not die. Not when they Ali needed him. One chance. The ship bucked and shuddered as the atmospheric buffering shook it hard enough to get past the inertial dampers. One chance. Han waited as long as he dared, then one moment longer, then one more. And then he slammed down the relay reset switch as hard as he could, dumping all of the feedback energy directly into the engine start manifold. He stabbed down on the engine start button and felt a horrifying lurch, just as a low, rumbling explosion shook the ship from base to apex. That would have to be the repulsors blowing. For a long, sickening moment, nothing else happened. But then the engine's now certainly arc-initiated Kij.Y indicator came on, and Han had three good engines. Three? Not four? One of them must have been blown out by that LAF. Fighter. Han had been afraid of that. But even if he had one less engine than he had hoped for, that was three more than he had expected. Ignoring all his own advice on the subject, he brought the throttle up fast. There wasn't time to nurse the engines. There was a distant bang and sudden flurry of violent vibrations that faded almost before they started, but the engines were holding. At least for now. At least for now. Han watched the acceleration meter, the velocity gauge and the none-too-reliable altitude meter. For a wonder, the displays were all in standard units, and not some obscure Salonian format he had never seen before. But what he was seeing was by no means reassuring. He had flown enough re-entries to know at a glance that they were far from out of trouble. The best they were going to manage was a controlled crash. Han risked a glance out the viewport, and saw that the jade's fire was still staying close somehow. Mara was some kind of pilot. Now if only he had a view that would show him the direction he was going. Unfortunately, the ship was flying stern first, and the stern holocom, which might have shown him at least a vague idea of where he was heading, had given up altogether at some point in the proceedings. On the bright side, Air friction was slowing down the ship's axial spin. Finally it stopped altogether, which at least made piloting the cone ship that much easier. It was about time something got easier. Han watched his velocity and altitude gauges, and knew just how much trouble he was still in. He had to shed some more speed. He had no choice in the matter. There was a way to do it, but it had its own drawbacks and making it work without maneuvering thrusters was not going to be easier. He would have to do all his steering by playing with the thrust of the main engines not simple when he was already juggling their thrust vectors to compensate for the missing engine. Still, it was doable. Maybe. He's back just a trifle on the thrust to number three engine, and the cone ship slowly pitched back, until it was flying at about a 45-degree angle of attack. It was still falling straight down, but now its nose was pointed an eighth of a turn away from the vertical. If Han had it figured right, that ought to start the cone ship developing a bit of aerodynamic lift, in effect causing it to work like an airfoil. The cone ship began to move sideways as well as down, and every millimeter of lateral movement came straight from the energy of their fall. The ship began to bang and shudder violently but every crash and rattle was that much more excess energy expended. Honored Solo. Drachmas protested above the racket. You have put us in lateral flight. Where are you taking us? I haven't the faintest idea, Hans said. But we have to go lateral to shed some speed. But suppose we land outside the zone controlled by my den? Then we have a problem. Han shouted back. 
Drachmas did not reply to that, but she had a point. Landing completely at random on a planet in the midst of civil war was not exactly prudent. Han pushed it from his mind. The job of the moment was getting this thing down in one piece. Down where they could sort out later. He checked his gauges. They were still falling like a rock but like a slower rock, a gliding rock. And hull temperatures were actually falling, just a trifle. Maybe, maybe, they were going to make it. Of course, landing on the sublight engines, rather than on the now-dead repulsors, and landing blind would be challenges in their own right. It would be at least another 90 seconds before he had to worry about such things. He checked the gauges and shook his head. The lateral flight trick was slowing them down, but nowhere near enough. At this rate, they'd be lucky to drop below the speed of sound before they hit. There was no way around it. He was going to have to get something more out of the engines. What about that fourth engine, the one that had refused to light? Maybe it was just its initiator link that had been blown off. Maybe the engine itself was still there, if he could just get it to come on. Maybe if he tried a parallel backfeed start. With the other engines up and running, he could borrow part of their energy output and backflush it through the unlit engine. It might work. Han reset the power flow from the number 2 engine, routing 5% of it through the initiator lines to engine 3. He stabbed down the button marked pressing here will cause engine number 4 to start. A weird high-pitched squeal cut through the clamoring roar that filled the command deck and the cone ship began to oscillate wildly as the engine lit and died and lit and died. A display indicator came on, announcing engine 4 now operating nicely, but it went out again, then popped on and faded one more time before coming back on and staying that way. Four engines. He had four good engines. He might come out of this alive after all. But then he checked his altitude and found good reason to doubt it. They were only three kilometers up. Han realized that he would have to shed all of his lateral speed immediately if he was going to set this thing down. He pitched the ship around until it was flying flat on its side, the thrust axis parallel to the ground. The planetary horizon swooped into view and kept going right past, until Han was flying exactly upside down, his feet pointed at the sky and his head pointed at the ground. He throttled all the engines up to maximum, and just a bit beyond, and held it there, until the ground stopped rushing past from side to side and was simply coming straight at him. Zero forward velocity, or close enough but plenty of velocity in the direction of down. Han pitched the conch ship over again, until he was flat on his back, looking at the sky, and made sure the engines were cranked up to maximum power. There was nothing else he could do. Hanging on. He shouted in Salonian. Be strapped and embraced. We are going to be hitting hard. Green lights started to flash all over the propulsion status display. In most ships that would have been a good thing, but not on this crate. To a Salonian. Green was the color of danger, disaster. The engines were running full out. At or beyond the point of catastrophe. Han wanted desperately to see if he could bully or tempt just a little bit more out of them, but did not. Dare. No point in coming this far just to have the ship detonate a half kilometer off the ground. Maybe, maybe, they had slowed down enough to make this a survivable crash. Han cut power to all systems and diverted it all into the inertial dampers. There was no way the dampers could absorb all the energy of impact, but they would soak up some of it. Maybe if they were running at max power, it would be just enough. 
And that was it. That was all. There were no tricks left. Nothing left to do but hold on and watch the numbers in the altimeter evaporate. Han had not the faintest idea where they were about to land. There had not been time, in his one quick glance at the ground, to do anything more than see that it was there. He had seen water, flat land, and some good-sized hills, but which of them he was about to hit, he had no idea. One kilometer up. Eight hundred meters. Seven hundred. Five hundred. Four hundred. Three fifty. If only the repulses were still working. Too bad he had been forced to fry them to a crisp starting the engines. Three hundred. How accurate was that altimeter anyway? Two hundred. One fifty. One hundred meters up. Seventy-five. Fifty. Han braced for the impact and resisted the impulse to shut his eyes. Zero. Negative ten meters. Not all that accurate. But every extra meter was another fraction of a second for the cone ship's engines to slow them down. Neg twenty. Neg fifty slam. A hundred crazed banthas jumped onto Han's chest all at once, driving him down into the padding of the pilot's flight station. Drachmas screamed, a startling, high-pitched ulation. A metal bulkhead tore itself apart somewhere in the ship with a terrible metallic shriek, and a dozen alarms started hooting at once. The overhead viewport held together somehow, and Han could see the sky was filled with smoke and steam and mud. Huge gobs of sodden earth splattered down on the viewport, covering it all but completely. Han hit the alarm cut off and was astonished. By the sudden near silence. But for Drachmas moaning in fright and the plopping sounds of the last of the mud raining down on the ship's hull, all was quiet. They were down and alive. A sudden flurry of water falling in a single thin sheet of droplets, fell on the ship, washing some but far from all of the mud off the viewport. Han got to his, feel, feeling more than a little wobbly. That one was close. He said in basic, to himself as much as anything. Come, he said in Salonian. We must leave ship. Might be dash. He stopped dead. Half his Salonian seemed to have faded away, at least for the moment. After that close a call, it was a wonder he was calm enough to remember his own name. But he couldn't think of the words for chemical leak, or fire, or short circuits. Bad things, he said at last. Might be bad things on ship. Must leave now. The two Salonians, both of them clearly shaken up, got to their feet and followed Han down the ladder to the lower deck and over to the main hatch. Han punched at the open button, and was not the least bit surprised when nothing at all happened. The ship they had risked their lives to land, the ship that the Hunchuzik needed so badly, was a write-off. A complete loss. Han knelt down fumbled with the access panel for the manual controls, got the cover off, and turned the hand crank. The hatch swung reluctantly open, and jammed up twice before it swung wide enough for them to get out. Han stuck his head out first and looked around. It looked like they had landed square in the middle of a shallow pond and splashed it dry on impact. The bottom of the pond was completely exposed, but for one or two puddles here and there. The mud was steaming here and there, letting off the heat produced. By the ship's impact. It was a beautiful, perfect spring day. Somehow, the picturesque meadows and woodlands that surrounded the splashed-out pond made the mud and the mire and the mess of the landing seem just that much more out of place, just that much more absurd. The cone ship had buried itself at least a half-meter into the soft mud of the pond bottom. 
What had been a meter and a half drop from the hatch to the ground was suddenly a lot shorter. Hans sailed down on the edge of the hatch and hopped down only to sink it over his ankles in the thick mud. He lifted his left foot up out of the muck, nearly losing a boot in the process, and planted it as far away from the ship as possible before pulling his right foot out. He squelched out of the pond basin toward dry land and saw a Salonian, an older-looking female with graying dark brown fur and a moody look in her eyes. That's a hunch as a cone ship, be it not? The Salonian asked, watching Drachmus and Salkold stagger out of the craft. That's right, Hans said, a bit distractedly as he slogged through the mud. That was the Sclonians for you. A spaceship crash lands in a pond in front of one, and what was the response? Not shock, or surprise, or fear. Not. Hello? Not. What an amazing escape. Not. Are you all right? No. The first thing to worry about was what den was involved. Umph, said the Salonian. This is Shanzari land. We be republicists, Hunchuzik allies. Good, said Han, still struggling toward shore. Glad to hear it. Han half climbed, half crawled out of the pond basin, and paused there a moment. The old Salonian looked at the ship and shook her head. Cone ships, she said, her Tory derisive. The Hunchuzik are foolhardy. Salonians do not belong in space. Han looked at the Salonian for a long moment. You know, he said, I just about worked that out for myself. He turned his back on the cone ship and staggered off toward the other side of the clearing, where the jade's fire was settling in for a nice, calm, sedate landing. Chapter 3 At the Source Tendra Risen sat in the pilot's station of the gentleman caller and wondered if it was going to be all right, wondered how it could be all right. She had done her part, however little that might be. In purely objective terms, all was well. She had used the radonics transmitter to tell Lando of the fleet hidden in the Sikorian system. His friends had gotten the news, and it might well prove vital to them. She knew Lando was alive, and well and that he was glad she was in system. But none of that you changed the fact that she was stuck out here, and no one could get to her. She looked through the forward viewport at the bright star of Corel, dead ahead. Unless that interdiction field went down, it was going to take her months to cross the distance from here to there. It was worth it, she knew that. She had more than likely saved lives, many lives perhaps even Lando's life. But the thought of more months alone on this ship was more than she could bear. But the people Lando was with, the Bakurans, had asked her to send them more information. There was not much she could tell them that she had not said already but she would tell them what she could. She switched on the radionics transmitter and set to work. The Bakuran light cruiser intruder fired her main forward turbo laser battery three times, and three times pocket patrol boats exploded. Very well, said Admiral Hordel Osilich. You may hold your fire. Bring the turbolasers to their stowed position and power them down. Make sure our friends can detect what you are doing. We have shown we can hurt them at will. Now we extend an invitation to leave. Let us see if our friends out there understand that we plan to play rough if they stay. A reasonable tactic, Luke Skywalker thought feeling none too happy about it. A show of overwhelming force might convince the surviving defenders to withdraw. After all, the odds of a handful of fighters defeating the Enmiter and her sister's ships, Sentinel and Defender, and all their fighters were almost zero. On the other hand, the rebels had faced such odds more than once in the war against the Empire, and had emerged victorious. Good training, strong motivation, Good equipment, good intelligence and plain good luck could even up the odds quite a bit. There was no such thing as certainty in war. 
Luke Skywalker stood next to Admiral Osilich on the bridge of the intruder. As always when he agreed with the man, he did not feel comfortable doing so. Luke glanced at Lando Calrissian, standing on the other side of Osilich, and the look on his face told Luke that Lando shared his concerns. The tactics were sound, even conservative. The enemy forces consisted of little more than twenty or so PPBs. There was nothing much to be gained in wiping out such a small force. If Osilich could convince them to withdraw without exposing his own forces to needless casualties, that would be all to the good. Very sensible and cautious. Except that Osilich was not a cautious commander. If it seemed he was trying something careful, Luke had a hunch that it was merely a cover for something madly audacious to follow. Osilage had shown a tendency to dare too much rather than too little. When he played a conservative game, the odds were fair that what appeared to be caution was just an elaborate preparation for a very large gamble indeed. Or had losing the watchkeeper to the Salonian planetary repulsor cost him his nerve? Osilage was a small, wiry-looking man who favored dress-white uniforms that set off his collection of medals and ribbons. He was a dried-up, self-important little man who seemed to have little patience for anyone or anything. He looked to be a comic opera caricature of an admiro, but Luke had never met as hard-edged, as cold-blooded, a military commander. No one found it relaxing to spend time in the presence of Admiral Osilich. Of course, with the massive, overwhelming bulk of Centerpoint Station dominating the sky outside the viewports. Luke would have felt a little edgy even if the watchkeeper hadn't been destroyed. There they go, Lando announced, pointing toward a cloud of tiny dots lifting away from one of the docking bays of center point. The defending fighters were withdrawing. Decided they couldn't do any good against us, I guess. Or perhaps they decided we would be unable to do center point any harm, said Osilich. A wise tactician retreats from an indefensible position in order to preserve his forces. But a wise tactician will likewise avoid expending his forces needlessly in the defense of the impregnable. What are you saying? asked Luke. Osilage gestured towards Centerpent. We are dismissing the enemy fighters because they are so small. In comparison. Two. Us. But proportionately, we are far smaller in comparison to center point. It is, somehow, the source of power that can impose an interdiction field over an entire planetary system. What other powers might it have? No way to know, said Lando. I figure the one thing we can count on is being surprised and I doubt that many of the surprises are going to be pleasant. Just at that moment, a service droid wheeled up from behind them and came around to stop in front of Lando. And here's a surprise now. Lando muttered. Yes, what is it? He asked the droid. Begging your pardon, sir, but Lieutenant Kalenda wishes to see both you and Master Skywalker, sir. A new message from Source T has come in. Lando looked worriedly at Luke. That ought to make me happy, he said. But I have the feeling she's not calling in just to chat. He turned toward the service droid. Lead the way. Source T was Tendra Risen. Lando and Luke had met Tendra on her home world of Sicoria, one of the so-called outlier worlds of the Corellian sector. The local authorities had kicked Lando and Luke off Sicoria almost immediately after meeting Tendra. As they followed the droid down to the cruiser's comp section, it crossed Lando's mind, not for the first time, that Tendra would be vastly amused to learn that Bakuran military intelligence had given her a name as ridiculously pompous as Source T. Lando had met Tendra while searching the galaxy for a rich wife. Tendra was certainly well off enough to qualify as rich, 
and it was certainly within the realm of possibility that she would make a good wife for Lando if they could get together in the same place at the same time long enough to get to know each other. But even if they had not had the time to fall madly, passionately in love with each other, the two of them had very definitely made a connection with each other, established a solid bond, something that they could build on, someday, if the universe gave them that chance. As best he could piece together, Tendra had somehow managed to spot some sort of military build-up in the Sikorian system. Connecting the build-up to the interdiction field, she had decided she had to get word to Lando. Toward that end, it would seem she had gotten her hands on a spaceship, bribed her way off Sikoria, and crashed it into the Corellian interdiction field. None of that would have done anyone much good, but for one other fact Lando had given her a radonics communication set. The radionics set did not use any of the standard comlink frequencies, but instead sent and received messages on a modulated carrier wave in the radio band of the electromagnetic spectrum. The radionics signals were completely immune to the system-wide jamming, and were likewise completely undetectable to anyone using comlink equipment. The downside was that like all other forms of electromagnetic radiation infrared, visual light, ultraviolet, gamma ray, x-ray, and so on radio band radiation traveled at the speed of light. Tendra's messages to Lando, and his replies therefore likewise crawled along at the speed of light, and were highly susceptible to interfering. She was still aboard her ship, the gentleman caller, at the outskirts of the Corellian system, ambling gradually in toward the inner system at speeds that were distinctly sublight. It took long hours for her messages to reach him but it could well take long, weary months before her ship could cross the same distance. Unless, of course, they could bring down the interdiction field. And that was what they were here to do. They arrived at the comm section. He and Luke waited as the service droid extended a data probe and plugged into the security port by the comm section door. Lando's original radonics set was still aboard his ship. The Lady Luck, but the intruder's tech staff had had no trouble at all putting together their own radonics set from the plans and spec sheets the Lady Luck also carried, and had actually managed to make their transmitter more powerful, and their receiver more sensitive. But it wasn't radonics Lando had on his mind. He was concerned with Kundra. As if the situation with Tendra wasn't complied enough, there was the small matter of the actual information she was broadcasting to Lando. It was enough to give the intelligence staff fits. The security system beeped its clearance code, and the hatch to the comm section slid open. Lando looked inside before entering and let out a small sigh. There she was, as if the mere thought of anxious intelligence officers was enough to summon one. Lieutenant Belindy Kalenda, of New Republic Intelligence, was waiting for them, and she did not look happy. Didn't anyone ever tell your lady friend how to count? She demanded the moment the hatch slid shut. Kalenda had never been much for small talk, and she was just about at the end of her tether now. What's the problem now, Lieutenant Kalenda? Lando asked wearily. The same as always. Numbers, that's the problem, Kalenda said. She was a somewhat odd-looking young woman. Her wide-spaced eyes were glassy, almost milky, and a bit off-kilter. She was almost, but not quite, cross-eyed. She was a bit darker-skinned than Lando, and her black hair was done up in a complicated sort of braid piled on top of her head. The scuttlebutt was that she had at least some small skill in the force, or at least that her intuition was good, and her hunches tended to play out, that she seemed to see more than most people. In any event, she had an odd way of seeming to look past your shoulder at something behind you, even when she was glaring right at you as she was right now. Numbers We still have no idea how many ships are waiting out there at Sikoria. We wouldn't know there were any ships at all there, if not for Lady Tendra, Lando said sharply. 
Maybe your NRI operatives on Sicoria know more about ship spotting, but did any of them have the initiative to get into the Corellian system and let us know about them? Kalenda looked woodenly at Lando. I never told you there were NRI agents on Sicoria, she said warily. And I never told you I used to be a smuggler, but you know it just the same. Lando snapped. Don't treat me like a fool. If you didn't have agents there, someone wasn't doing their job. Let's try and get back on track here, Luke said, attempting to smooth things over a bit. What's wrong with Lady Tender's message? We have sent three follow-up queries asking her to give further details of the types, sizes, and numbers of ships she saw. Her latest message seems longer and more detailed, but once you weed out all the qualifiers and caveats, we still have nothing but the vaguest sorts of estimates. She can't tell you what she doesn't know, Lando said, wondering how many times he would have to tell that to Kalenda before she would believe it or when he would stop being frustrated by the intelligence group reading messages intended for him and reading them first. But we have to know more than we do, Kalenda said. Whose ships are those? How many are there, and how well armed are they? Who commands them, and what are their intentions? You'll have to transmit again, and ask for more information. I won't, Lando said sharply. I don't care what your psych teams say about her responding best to me. She told you all she can, and I'm not going to help you harass her anymore. But we need more dash. The trouble is, she doesn't have any more. He snapped. You have all the details you're going to get. Did you expect Tender to be able to tell you the fleet? Commander's middle name by looking at ships in orbit. Through macro binoculars? She's given us a warning, and a very useful one. She's given you all the information she can, and there are limits on how far we can press her. And there are also limits to how many messages you can ask her to send. Luke put in. Every time she sends us one, the odds of her being detected go up. Kalenda looked at Luke sharply. Detected? How? By whom? Think about it, Lando said. You're the intelligence officer. The way she's broadcasting is secret, but it's not hidden in any way. She's broadcasting in clear, without any coding or encryption. Anyone who had the right sort of gear for scanning radio band frequencies could lock in on her radionics transmission in a heartbeat. You did it easily enough then they'd not only know that we know about the ships tucked away in orbit of Sicoria, they'd be able to triangulate back and zero in on her location, the same way we did. What difference would that make? Kalenda asked. Plenty if we're talking about the people who control the interdiction field. They'd want to silence her. Say they switched the field off for 30 seconds. With good targeting and good planning, that would be enough time for a ship to drop into hyperspace, pop out next to the gentleman caller, blow Tendra out of the sky, and then return to base before the field went back up. But she broadcasted constantly for days without anything happening to her. Kalenda objected. She didn't have any choice. She had to transmit until I responded. Now she doesn't have to take that chance. Your radonics broadcasts are much more powerful than hers, and they're closer to anyone listening in the inner system. If the opposition spots your transmissions, they'll know to look for her. Kalenda's face was expressionless. Had she known all this, and elected to risk Tender's life on the chance of getting more information? Or had it not occurred to her? That seemed unlikely enough in an officer as sharp as Kalenda seemed to be though the last few days had been hard on all of them. Lando half expected her to offer excuses, to lie and say she hadn't thought it through. But even if Kalenda played a cagey game, she didn't play a dishonest one. It's never easy, she said, figuring the balance. 
I knew the risk was there, but I had to weigh the danger to her against the consequences if she had some bit of data without knowing about it something that could save dozens, or hundreds, or millions of lives. If I had her here, and I could do a proper debriefing, I'm sure she could tell us all sorts of useful things. But you don't have her here, Luke said. No, I don't, Kalencia agreed. Even with a standard comm link I could get somewhere. But this business of waiting hours and hours for an answer, and then waiting hours and hours for her to hear the next question it makes it impossible to get anywhere. If I had a comm link we could scramble so there was at least some chance of keeping it private then we could get somewhere. That's a lot of ifs, Luke said. Let's leave them all out. What are the odds on your being able to get anything more out of Tendra as things stand? Kalenda sighed and shook her head. Just about zero, she said. But the stakes are so high. So high you had to try. Luke said. I understand. But if it can't be done, it can't be done. Kalenda smiled humorlessly. That doesn't sound like a Jedi attitude, she said. Even Jedi know their limits, said Luke. Kalenda nodded reluctantly. Very well, she said. There are a large number of warships parked in orbit. Of Sicoria. That's Al. We're going to get out of Source T. Al. Right then, Lando said. Let's leave it there. We're coming up on Centerpoint Station. Figuring it out ought to be enough to keep us busy right there. Kalenda looked toward Lando again, and this time her glance seemed to meet his. Ties an understatement if ever I heard one, she said. It didn't take Belindy Kalenda long to confirm that idea. Centerpoint was so absurdly big, so complex, and so unlike anything in her experience, that it was all but impossible to know where to start. Over the next day or so the Bakuran fleet moved in on Centerpoint, advancing very slowly. If Asuch was merely pretending to be cautious, He was doing a good job of it. He moved his ships in carefully, pausing repeatedly in his approach to scan every bit of the station to the limits of the Bakuran detection systems. Not that Kalenda could blame him for caution. Not when Centerpoint could have swallowed the intruder hole through the smallest of its sally ports. But even from the closest range Oscillage was willing to risk, the scan results weren't good enough to satisfy Kalenda. She sat at a skin station in the intruder's intelligence section, sifting. Through. The. Endless, inconclusive images of Centerpoint. It seemed as if the place was deserted, but go try to prove a negative. The enemy could have hidden a whole fleet of Star Destroyer-type warships in there, and a whole army of stormtroopers. If the ships were properly powered down to standby, and if the enemy was using the right sort of shielding, there would be no way to detect them. What made it even more worrisome was that the enemy had shown almost no large ships so far. They had to be hidden somewhere. That was part of why. Kalenda had wanted better numbers from Source T. If she had gotten good, hard data from Source T about the types of ships she had seen at Sikoria, she would have some idea of what might be lying in wait inside Centerpoint. For that matter, Centerpoint might not even need ships to defend itself. She had spotted 50 or 60 points on the exterior of the station that might be weapons ports. The station was an incredible amalgam of familiar and alien, modern and ancient. There was no way to know how long a given object had been there, or who had built it, or if it still operated. She ran the images across her skin screen, one after the other. Armored portals and hemispherical blisters, long cylindrical objects on what looked like aiming platforms, attached to complicated plumbing and wiring. Some of them might be massive covered over turbo sites. 
and those phalanxes of dark circular openings. Some could be missile batteries, and some might be refueling stations or docking facilities for refreshment bars. There was no way to tell. They would have to send in a team. The Lady Luck launched itself out of the intruder's landing bay and lifted off into the blackness of the sky and towards center point. Why do I always get handed these jobs? Lando asked no one in particular as he guided his ship toward the station. Maybe it has something to do with the way you volunteered, replied Gary O'Captison from the seat behind the co-pilot's station. Lando didn't feel too happy about having her along. But she had insisted. The ex prime minister of Bakura had been granted full rights to speak for her government by the present prime minister, and she had been determined to join the scouting party, so that the Bakuran government was properly represented. Much to Lando's regret, three PO was also along for the ride in case any translation was needed. I had to volunteer, Lando growled. Once Luke volunteered, I knew he was going to need his wingman. Luke had launched first in his X-wing. He was flying about two kilometers ahead of Lando, just close enough for easy visual tracking. Kalenda, in the co-pilot's seat of the Lady Luck, gave Lando an odd look. Of course, all of her looks were pretty odd, so maybe it didn't mean much of anything. Or maybe she was wondering why a man who had worked so hard to establish a reputation as a devil-may-care adventurer, the sort who only looked out for himself, was sticking his neck out. Again, somehow I think a Jedi Master would be able to take care of himself, she said. Maybe, Lando said. And maybe not. Let's just say that I owe him one. Who in the galaxy doesn't? Gary asked. Actually, Lady Captison, said Kalenda, you're the one I most wish weren't here. Thanks for that compliment, Lando muttered. Kalenda winced. Sorry, that came out wrong. What I meant was that Captain Kalrishan and Master Skywalker have military training. They're more likely to be ready for for whatever we find. Not really the job for an ex prime minister. There are other skills in the universe besides knowing how to shoot and fly and fight without getting killed, Gariel said. If we get lucky, there might be someone reasonable on that station. Someone we can negotiate with. If so, having a trained negotiator with plenipotentiary powers on hand might be a good thing. We're going to have to get really lucky for that to happen, Lando said. So far, we haven't found many people who are particularly reasonable in this star system. Luke Skywalker felt good. He was back at the controls of his X-wing, alone, except for our two D2 riding in his socket in the aft of the fighter. Maybe Mon Mothma wanted to push him into a position of leadership. Maybe circumstances were pushing him that way, or maybe the whole universe was pushing him that way. But right now, at this very moment, it was just Luke, his droid, and his X-wing. Nearly all pilots loved the solitude, the distance of flying, and Luke was no exception there. Flying was, in and of itself, a pleasure, an escape from his worries and cares and duties. Not that the escape would last for long. There was, as always, a job to do. Luke looked toward the massive station. Indeed, they were now close enough that he would have been hard pressed not to look at it. It all but filled the X-wing's viewports. Luke could scarcely believe his eyes. He had seen all the reports. He knew how big Center Point was, or at least he had read the numbers. But somehow, numbers did not express the hugeness of the object hanging in the sky. Center Point Station consisted of a huge sphere, a hundred kilometers across, with a massive cylinder stuck to each pole of the sphere. The station was roughly three hundred kilometers from end to end, and rotated slowly around the axis defined by the two polar cylinders. 
To judge by looking at the entire exterior surface, it had been built almost at random over the millennia. Boxy thinks the size of large buildings, pipes and cables and tubes of all sizes running in all directions, parabolic antennae and strange patterns of conical shapes sprouted everywhere. Luke spotted what seemed to be the remains of a spacecraft that had crashed into the exterior hull and then been welded in place and made into living quarters of some sort. At least it looked that way. It seemed like a rather ad hoc way to add living space and adding living space seemed more than a bit redundant for something the size of Kenterpoint. And yet none of that spoke of the real size of the thing. It was, after all, the size of a small moon by some standards, maybe even the size of a largish one. Luke had been on worlds smaller than this station. This station was large enough to be a world, large enough to contain all the myriad complexities, all the variety, all the mystery of a world. Large enough that it would take a long time indeed to get from one end of it to the other. Large enough that you could live your whole life there without seeing all of it. Tai was Luke's definition of a world, a place too large for one person to experience in a lifetime. Luke had been to countless worlds, and yet he knew he had never seen all there was to see on any of them. People tended to label a world, and leave it at that, as if it could be all one thing. But that was wrong. Another part of Luke's definition was that a world couldn't be all one thing. It was easy to say Coruscant was a city world, or that Mon Calamari was a water world, or that Kashyyyk was a jungle world, and leave it at that. But there could be infinite variety in the forms of a city, or an ocean, or a jungle and it was rare for a world really to be all one thing. The metal world would have a mountain or two, the volcano world would have its impact craters, the bird planet would have insects. And Centerpoint Station was big so big it was difficult to judge the scale of the place. Space provided few visual cues available on the ground to tell the eye how big things were. Apart from the questions of size, the idea of a spinning space station was disconcerting. Spinning was something that planets did, and they did it slowly. Center point station was spinning at a slow and stately rate, but you could see it moving. The techniques for producing artificial gravity on a station or ship without spinning the object on its axis had been old at the founding of the Old Republic. Luke had never seen such a thing as a spinning space station. It seemed, somehow, not part of the natural order of things. An absurd thought, of course. What was natural about starships and space stations? But there was something else something more fundamental than size or spin, bothering Luke about the station. The station was old. Old by any human standard, old by the standard of virtually any sentient being. So old that no one knew how long ago it had been built, or who had built it, or why. And yet, it was not truly old at all. Not compared to the ages of planets, or stars, or the galaxy. Even ten million years was not so much as an eye blink to the four, or five or six billion year old planets and stars and moons that filled the universe. But if what seemed ancient to humans was all but newly minted in the eyes of the universe, then surely all the endless generations of remembered galactic history were nothing more than an eye blink of time. The birth, the rise, the fall of the old republic, the emergence and collapse of the empire, the dawn of the new republic all shrank down into a single brief moment, compared to the immensity of time on a truly galactic scale. You go you the... I'm here, Lando, but your signal is breaking up badly. Our signa caking up tea. Luke sighed. Another nuisance. With normal communication styli utterly jammed throughout the Corellian system, the Bakurans had done their best to improvise a laser comm system that sent voice signals over low-power laser beams. It did not work well, but it did work. Maybe they would have done better to use a version of Lando's radonics system, but it was too late. To think of that now, 
Arlo, see if you can clean that up a little. Artu booped and bleeped, and Luke nodded. Okay, Lando, try it again. How do you read me? Much better, Anks, but I won't mind when we can go BA to regular comm systems. You and me both. Well, I'm not holding my breath. But never mind that now. Calcutta spotted something. Look at the base of the closest cylinder, I where it joins the sphere. There's a inking light air. See it? Luke peered through the view screen and nodded. I see it. Hold on a second while I get a magnified view. Luke activated the targeting computer and used it to get a lock on the blinking light, then slaved his long-range holocom to the targeting system. An image popped into being on the fighter's main view screen. There was the blinking light next to a large outer airlock door that was opening and shutting, over and over again. If that's not an invitation to come on in, I don't know what is. Luke said. We all agree with that back his end. Lando's voice replied. Even Golden Boy understood what it meant, and he's incoherent in over six million forms of communication. Luke grinned at that. There had never been a great deal of love lost between C-3PO and Lando, and the last few weeks had not done much to endear the droid to the human. Glad it's unanimous, Luke said. The question is, do we accept the invitation? Chapter 4 Child's Play Anakin Solo stared at the featureless silver wall for a full minute, and then thumped twice, hard, at one particular spot on it. Sure enough, an access door popped open, revealing another purple and green control keypad with a 5x5 grid of keys. Anakin frowned at the keypad, as if trying to decide his next move. The experimental droid Q9X2 watched Anakin carefully which was really the only prudent way to watch him, when one thought about it. Q9 Found Anakin's skill with machinery his seemingly instinctive ability to make devices work, even when he had no idea what the devices were, to be remarkably disconcerting. It seemed to have something to do with this force business that was so important to this group of humans. The theory seemed to be that Anakin's talent in the force had somehow given him the ability to see inside machines, to manipulate them from the outside, down to the microscopic level. Not that Anakin was infallible by any means. He made mistakes and sometimes he just deliberately made machines do things that no one else would want them to do. But one could learn a lot about an unknown device by watching Anakin figure it out. Thus, the droid had two purposes and watching the child first was at least to attempt to prevent him from doing too much damage as he wandered from one piece of machinery to the other. His other duty was simply to record what the chili did when he started fiddling with the hardware he found. It was a full-time job, a more than full-time job, really. Q9X2 drew most of the duty, thanks to high, built-in recording systems. But even a droid had TC recharge once in a while, and besides. Q9X2 did no, want to spend all day. Every day preventing this Mose peculiar child from pushing the wrong button A and C melting the planet. If nothing else, the constant strayer would be too much for his judgment circuits. At least two might be, and that came to much the same thing. Perhaps not the most straightforward thought process, jussel there, but it was enough of an argument to get him tea break from Anakin watching once in a while, and Ty was more than good enough. Anakin punched a code into the access panel, and low chimes sounded. Past experience had taught QC that this sound was not a good sign. It seemed to be Jay's sort of warning bell. That will do, Anakin, said Q9. Anakin looked around in surprise, as if he had known Q9 was there. Q9! Anakin shouted. Oh! If the droid had been programmed to do so, Lit would have let out a sigh. Q9 had been with him FOI hours now, 
so it seemed unlikely the child could be too surprised by his arrival. On the other, manipulator Anakin hadn't shown much sign of acting talent. QL had heard of the phenomenon known as absent mindedness but he hadn't had any reason to believe I really existed until he met Anakin. I think it would be best if you stopped examining that machine on tight Chewbacca or one of the others can take a look at it. But I've almost got it working. Anakin protested. Do you know what it does? Do you have any idea what it does? And then no, Anakin admitted quite reluctantly. Do you remember what happened the last time you heard that chime and you kept going? A trap door opened. Anakin said, suddenly finding reasons to look everywhere but at Q9. Yes. A trap door opened. Under me. And I fell into a waste disposal of heat. If I had not managed to jump my repulsors to high power in time and bounce back up, what would I be right now? Mash down to a 10 centimeter cube. Unless the machine had melted you down by now. Quite right. But Chubasia only found that out afterward, didn't he? I helped him. Anakin protested. Yes, you did. And we need you around to help him more. So what would we do if the trapdoor was under you this time? Anakin's eyes grew wide with alarm. Oh, he said. Maybe I'd better stop and let Chu look. Maybe you'd better, agreed Q9. Come on, let's go find the others. Anakin nodded. Okay, he said, and turned back the way they had come. Q9 followed after on his repulsors, relieved that Anakin had decided to be cooperative this time. Q9X2 had been designed with the capacity to learn new behaviors by trial and error, but he had never expected to use that capacity to learn practical child psychology. The skills required to handle Anakin with even marginal success were taking up an inordinate portion of system resources. Q9 decided he was going to have to perform a partial memory wipe on himself and free up some capacity when this was over if it ever was over. As they came out of the side passage and into the central chamber, Q9 reflected that this situation was starting to look rather permanent. They were a motley crew, all of them holed up in this huge and alien place. Anakin and Q9 paused at the exit from the side passage and looked around. Seen from this vantage point, the repulsor chamber seemed too large and obvious for a hiding place. But from the surface, Q9 knew just how difficult it would be for outsiders to find this place. It was shielded from every detection system that Q9 knew about with the exception of Anakin Solo. He had found this chamber and us identical twin on Corellia with no trouble whatsoever. And there were good reasons for hiding the chamber. It contained the planetary repulsor that had propelled Drawl into its current orbit unknown millennia ago. Likewise with Corellia and, no doubt, with the other inhabited worlds of the Corellia system Salonia and the double worlds, Talus and Trains. Each of them had a hidden chamber like this one. Each of them had a planetary repulsor like this one. And each of them had been transported into the Corellian system long, long ago, by some long-forgotten race for some long-forgotten reason. But now the hunt for the repulsors was on. The party in the repulsor chamber had been cut off from outside contact for some time, but the last information they had was that the rebel forces on at least some and probably all of the inhabited worlds were actively searching for the repulsors. The reason was not entirely clear. While the repulsors would make powerful and effective weapons, they were not war winners, not by any means. According to Arihim, a planetary repulsor could be used to knock out a ship in orbit, but it would be hard to aim and unwieldy to use. There would be the element of surprise, but only the first time the repulsor was used. There were other, simpler, cheaper, more reliable ways of shooting down. Enemy spacecraft, 
and many of them were available to the rebel groups. So why were they expending precious time and effort in the middle of a war in order to find weapons of marginal utility? Q9 gave it up. He had come to that point in the analysis 239 times before, and it didn't seem likely that an answer that did not spring to mind any of those times would do so on the 240th attempt. Instead, he admired the strange and massive forms that made up the main planetary repulsor chamber. The chamber itself was a huge vertical cone, just under a kilometer from lop to bottom, the walls of which appeared to be gleaming, perfect metallic silver. At the base of the conical chamber were six smaller cones of the same silver material, each just over 100 meters tall. They were spaced evenly around a circle centered on the axis of the pyramid. In the exact center of the chamber's base was a seventh, larger cone, twice as tall as the others, but with the same slender proportions. Passages to side chambers were spaced around the circumference of the chamber and vertical shafts in the floor of the chamber led to a series of lower levels they hadn't even started to explore. It was a huge, artificial, gleaming, impersonal alien place in a ramshackle, improvised, crude, homely-looking campsite was sitting right in the middle of it. Right by the base of the central cone. No doubt to human or drawlish or even wookie eyes, the camp looked incongruous enough. To the droid's eyes, it looked absurd. The Millennium Falcon was there and it had been a very close job flying it into tree-concealed topside entrance. The Duchess's hoverier was parked alongside it. A line with washing on it was strung between the Falcon's topside parabolic antenna and a spike antenna on the roof of the hover car. Chewbacca was trying to use as little power as possible to reduce the chance of detection. Even the Falcon's clothes dryer was off for the duration. Folding chairs and tables were set up to one side of the two vehicles, and the children, tired of the close confines of the Falcon, had moved there. Sleeping pads outside and under the ship. As always, the children had arranged their beds so they could all sleep together the twins' beds close together, with Anakin just a bit farther off. Zero Nine could see all the rest of the party from here, Jason and Jaina carrying some sort of gear out of the Millennium Falcon. Chewbacca the Wookiee, sitting at his camp chair, fiddling with some recalcitrant bit of hardware or other, and the two drawl, Ebrahim and his aunt, Mariha, the Duchess of Mastigophorus, at the other end of the table, hunched over their own work. The two drawl, like all of their species, were rather short by human standards, Ebrahim being just about Jason's height. They were short-limbed and thick-bodied, downright plump, in fact and covered with thick brown fur. As Q9 had learned, to human eyes they tended to look like stuffed toy animals. Some humans found them hard to take seriously but failing to take drawl seriously was always a huge mistake. They were sober, serious, level-headed beings in general. Even if Ebrahim was found to be a bit highly by drawlish standards, his aunt was one of the most commonsensical beings Q9 had ever met. No doubt Anakin's latest somewhat unnerving discovery would give them something else to work on, give them another piece to the puzzle they were struggling to put together. They intended to develop a useful understanding of the Repulsor's control system. All in all, Q9 felt the two drawl had the hardest job of anyone in the camp. The hardest job besides waiting, of course. And they were all doing that. Come on, Q9, said Anakin. Quit dawdling. Another bit of child psychology to note down no matter how slow they might be when one was waiting for them, no caregiver had ever moved fast enough when it was the child doing the waiting. Coming, Anakin. Jack set down the crate he was lugging out of the F.A. slash con, looked up, and saw Q9 and Anakin heading back to camp. Finally, he said. I thought they'd never get back. Now we can eat. 
Darn. We can? Maybe we can get them to stay away a little longer. Jaina set down her own crate and waved to Anakin. Her little brother waved back. Come on, the survival rations aren't that bad. They aren't that good either. Especially the nine millionth time in a row. I think they call them survival rations because no one knows if you'll survive eating them. Ha ha. Very funny. I think you've told me that joke nine million times and it wasn't so good the first time. Sorry, Jaina said, sitting down on her crate. Not much new inspiration here. I know, I know, Jason said. Things here don't change much. He could have gone and checked the Millennium Falcon's chronometer, but without that and Chewbacca's rigid insistence that they all eat and sleep at normal intervals, there was no LU at all to how much time had passed. The light in the chamber was unchangeably bright, coming from some diffuse and undefinable source in the upper reaches of the cavern. There was no sound at all from the massive cavern, except the sound of their own moving around and talking. But every sound anyone made produced a series of faint, distant echoes, whispering down from the top of the chamber for long seconds afterward. And the echoes of every sound mingled with all the others, Anakin's laughter blending with Chewbacca's growl, or the whir of a machine, or the bang of a camp chair bumping into a table merging with the low, serious voices of the two drail in conversation with each other. Whenever the camp was busy and active, there was a constant whisper of background echoes reverberating down from above, just enough to make the chamber seem less foreboding and empty. But five or ten seconds after they stopped moving or talking, the chamber would fall silent again, and the stillness would seem to shout louder than any noise how strange this place was, how old its flawless gleaming silver walls, how alien and powerful its capabilities. Night or what they pretended was night was the hardest. With the silver walls still gleaming in the unchanging light, they would go to bed the children to their sleeping pads in the shadow of the falcon, Chewbacca to his usual shipboard bunk, the two drawl to fold out beds in Aunt Marcus' hovercar, and Q9 plugged into a charge stand. Then, all would be so quiet that the slightest noise seemed to echo forever. A cough. A whisper, Ebrahini's muttering snore or Anakin crying in his sleep seemed to carry up to heaven and come down again and again. It was not the best way to live, Jason reflected. But in a sense, it was not a way of life at all. It was a way of waiting. All of them, even Anakin, seemed to know things could not last this way forever or even for very long. There was a war being fought out there, and sooner or later, one side or the other would find this place, and after that after that, no one even pretended to know what would happen. Sit up properly, Anakin, said the Duchess Marka, and stop banging your foot against the table leg. The noise is bad enough, but the echoes will drive me to distraction. She shook her head and looked toward her nephew, Ebrahim. Honestly, nephew, I do not understand these human children. What does Anakin gain by slouching over and making such irritating noises? I have not dealt with them long enough to obtain a clear answer, dearest aunt. However, I might add that. It would seem that even human parents do not understand the purpose behind much of what human children do and that in spite of having once been children themselves. Somehow, that docks not surprise me. I suppose our own young ones can be some trouble, but I must say I have no recollection at all of your misbehaving as badly as Anakin does. Don't talk like I'm not here. Anakin shouted indignantly. These draw grown-ups were worse than regular human grown-ups for pushing kids around. I was just thinking about stuff. What kind of stuff? Jaina asked all of them ganging up on him, even the other kids. Just stuff. Anakin said, frowning fiercely. 
Well, Anakin, there is certainly nothing wrong with thinking, said Aunt Marka. I'm sure the universe would be a better place if we all indulged in the practice a bit more. If you could do your thinking without the banging, that would be a great help. All right. All right, Anakin said, still feeling kind of grouchy. But he knew he was lucky they had stopped asking questions when they had. Because of all that Jedi stuff, he would have had to tell the truth if they asked more, or his brother and sister would catch him fibbing, and then he'd be in even more trouble. Sometimes Jason and Jaina acted just like grown-ups. If he had told them he had been thinking about that control panel Q9 had told him to stop fooling with, they all would have yelled at him. He knew he could get it to do something. Something big and important. What, exactly, he wasn't sure. But something. He could feel that. It was like the control panel was calling to him, asking him to hurry back and set the machinery free, let it go out and do the work it was supposed to do. But it didn't matter. They hadn't asked him about it. So he could think about it all he liked. Come, dearest aunt, said Ibrahim to the Duchess. It is late. Everyone else is asleep. We have made great progress, but we can do no more with our researches tonight. The two draw were sitting in the hover car. Wrong is just wrong. Reviewing you their know, notes you for see the it. day. But it's and Ibrahim was right. They could go no further for the moment. Whatever progress we have made is only the barest start toward understanding this place. Wrong is just wrong. The Duchess wrong. replied. We have some idea of how the alien keypads are laid out, and what some of the button markings and color coding seem to mean. But going from there to operating this place, and shutting it down safely a machine that has been operating for at least tens of thousands of years and perhaps much longer? We have no idea how the system draws its power. Suppose we do learn how to turn it off. Where does the power go once it is not coming here? If it is some sort of geologic energy tap, as I suspect, we might set off massive seismic disturbances. I think it most probable that this chamber is but one part of a much larger system. I suspect this is merely the nozzle, if you will, for a propulsion system woven into the very being of this world. We are dealing with a device that can move a planet. A device of that power could also destroy a planet if it was not used properly. I do not see any way of learning all we need to know in any reasonable period of time. Ibrahim smiled faintly and let out a short bark of a laugh. Unless, of course, we simply instruct Anakin to find the main control panel and then set him loose on it. Marka's eyes widened in horror. Do not say such a thing, nephew. Not even in jest. Jokes like that have a way of coming true. Anakin's eyes snapped open so suddenly it startled him. He was, quite abruptly, wide awake and staring up. At the underhull of the Millennium Falcon. He sat up quietly and looked around. Jason and Jaina were still sound asleep. Chewbacca was a deep enough sleeper that Anakin didn't even worry about him. Ibrahim and Aunt Marka were in the hover ear. Anakin turned and looked in that direction. All the car's lights were out. The windows darkened, and the hatch was shut. That left Q9. The droid spent most nights in standby mode, partially powered down, plugged into a portable charging stand between tree hover ear and the falcon, with his back to the larger craft. Anakin also knew that the bulk of the falcon would block nearly Al of the droid sensors. So long as he kept the ship between himself and Q9, he ought to be able to sneak away without any problems. Moving as silently as he could, he pushed back his blanket and rolled over so he was on his hands and knees. He crawled out from under the falcon 
and dot into the endless bright light of the repulsor chamber. Anakin blinked once or twice as he got to his feet. Strange to be sneaking around in light as bright as day. But there was no time to worry about that kind of stuff. Someone might wake up any second and notice he was gone. Padding along in his bare feet, clad only in his underwear, Anakin moved straight out for the perimeter of the huge chamber, glancing over his shoulder now and then to make sure that he was keeping the falcon between himself and q Nying. He reached the perimeter and trotted unhesitatingly into the closest tunnel entrance. The passage he wanted was almost on the other side of the chamber from here, but that did not worry him. The others might get lost in the side passages, but not Anakin. He could feel which way was the right way. He moved unerringly through the complicated maze of passages, taking every turning and passage with absolute confidence. He would feel the panel getting closer. Closer. And there it was, just as he had left it, the initial keypad open and waiting. He stared at it for a minute, then reached out his hand and held it, palm down, over the pad. He closed his eyes, reached out, and felt the interior of the pad, tracing the errors, the logic pads, the potentials and safeties that were inside the machine. It had been asleep for so long, so very long, waiting for someone to wake it up. And now. Now was the time. He knew, knew with absolute certainty, how to make it work. No Q9X2 here to tease him, or make him worry about trapdoors and stuff. He knew. He was sure. Anakin Solo reached out and pressed the center button of the 5x5 five five grid. The green button turned purple. Good. He paused for a moment, and then, stretching his fingers as far as they would go. He pressed all four of the corner buttons at once. They turned orange, not purple. He frowned. That wasn't quite what he had expected, but never mind. Move on. Starting at the top and moving counterclockwise, he pressed the center button of each outer row in turn. These did indeed turn purple. That made him feel a bit better. The keypad made the chiming noise again, but this time it wasn't just once. It kept going, over and over and over. Anakin closed his eyes once, but would it be so much trouble that it wouldn't be worth it? No. He had to do it. There was no turning back now. He pushed in the last orange button. It turned purple, and suddenly the chiming noise was louder and higher pitched. There was a low pitch hum from behind Anakin, and he turned around. A section of the floor was sliding away. For a moment, he wondered if he had been wrong about trapdoors. But then a whole complicated console rose slowly up out of the floor, a strange-looking control panel, all in the same silver stuff as the chamber itself, in front of a stranger-looking little seat that looked as if it were intended for a being that bent in different places from a human. Hopping with excitement, all doubts forgotten, Anakin sat down in the odd little chair and did not even notice that it was adapting itself to his body, reforming itself lifting him up and moving him forward so he would be able to reach the controls more comfortably. He stared at the instruments for a full minute, then extended his arms and spread his fingers out as far as they would go. He shut his eyes and reached out into the intricately, beautifully complicated universe of switches and paths and controls and linkages behind the knobs and levers and dials that covered the control panel. Power ratings, capacitance stowage, Vernier control, targeting subsystems, safety overrides, shielding constraints, thrust balancing. What they all were, what they all meant, how they all worked, and worked together all of it flowed into him, as if the ancient machines were speaking to him, telling him their story. He knew it all. He knew it all now. Anakin put his hands on the control panel and felt it all flow through him. Wake it up. 
He had to wake it up. The whole system had slept for so long. It wanted to come awake, to revive itself, to do its proper work. He moved as if he were asleep, in a dream, moving to what his ability in the forest told him he could do, not to do what needed doing, or what he ought to do. He knew, somehow, the compulsion, the desire to make the system come on, was within himself, that the machinery was nothing more than machinery. But it fell as if it were the machine whispering to him, not his own instincts and abilities urging him on. Pull that long lever to start the initiator process activator. Twist that dial to bring the geogravitic energy transfer system online. Tap in that command sequence at the standard 5 by Fluve keypad to clear the safeties. Somewhere deep below him, the ground shuddered slightly, and a low, powerful hum began to build. The chiming noise grew more and more intense, becoming louder and louder, the chiming coming faster and faster. A flat spot on the control panel twisted and shimmered and then started to swell upward, to form itself into a handle like a spacecraft's joystick. Anakin reached out to it with his left hand, barely aware of what he was doing, not noticing that the handle was lorming itself, reshaping itself, to fit itself to his hand. A graphic display appeared in the air over the handle. A hollow wireframe cube, made up of a grid of smaller cubes five high, five across, and five deep. All the smaller cubes were transparent, but, as Anakin watched, one cube, in the far lower left corner, turned green. Slowly, carefully, he pulled back on the joystick. The solitary green cube turned purple and suddenly the three transparent cubes it touched turned green. The corner cube turned orange, the second layer turned green, and a new layer of cubes turned purple. The colors spread out until the entire 5x5x5 five by five by five grid shifted through green to purple to bright, glowing orange. The ground trembled again, and the hum of power grew deeper, and... Somehow, more emphatic, more solid, the sound of massive energies waiting to be unleashed. Anakin let go of the joystick. At the moment he did, the chiming slopped. The control chamber was suddenly silent as the power hum dropped away into lower and lower frequencies, until it was so deep a tone it was below the threshold of hearing. The joystick melted away, flattened itself back down into the control panel. And there, in the blank space at the center of the panel, a new button created itself, flowing up out of the panel surface, shaping itself into a disc about six centimeters across and a centimeter high. As he watched, the button shifted its color, changed from silver to green, green to purple, purple to orange, plain orange to a throbbing, pulsating orange, pulsing from the color of molten iron to the sile near red of a dusky sunset. The chamber was silent. Anakin stared in open-mouthed fascination at the final button, his eyes wide, the light of the throbbing orange button throwing weird and shifting colors onto his clothes, his face, his eyes. The button. The button was there. It called to him, or else his own compulsion, his compulsion to make machines work, to make machines do, called from deep inside himself. He did not know. He did not care. He reached out his left hand. He held it poised over the button for a moment. And then he pushed it down. Lightning flared out from the apex of the central cone in the great chamber, lancing out toward each of the lower cones, slamming into them with sparks and fire. Thunder, deafeningly loud, the sound of the earth racking open and splitting itself apart, roared out through the great chamber. Blinding light exploded out from the lightning strike to reflect off every silver surface, flooding the chamber with brilliance. The lesser cones answered back, sending their own thunderbolts hacked to strike at the top of the center cone, blasting it into incandescence. Then, as suddenly as it had been there, the lightning was gone, and the cones were as they had been, unaffected by the massive power that had played around them. The sound of the thunder echoed through the chamber reverberating back and forth like the angry war cry of some long-forgotten god. 
The chambers shuddered and shook with the thunder. Chewbacca, aboard the Falcon, was thrown from his bunk as the ship bounced and lurched along with the chamber. He was halfway to the ship's control room before he in fully awake and realized the ship was on the ground. Not just on the ground, but under it, in a sealed chamber, with no hope of escape. Shields The Falcon's shields would provide at least some protection. He had to get everyone aboard, and fast. He turned and headed for the open access ramp. The twins had gotten out from under the ship. They were on their feet and struggling to stay that way as the ground bucked and heaved under their feet. Chewbacca shouted for them to get aboard, but the echoes of the thunder were so loud that even his voice did not carry. He waved his arms, gesturing for them to get aboard. Jason saw him and nodded vigorously. He grabbed his sister's arm and pulled her toward the ramp. The simple effort of trying to move at all was enough to knock them both off their feet. But they kept on moving, crawling toward the access ramp. The shaking of the around seemed to ease off, even as the echoing roar faded away. But Chewaka had no illusions that things would stay quiet for long. He rushed down the ramp even as the twins were crawling up it. The others. He had to get to the others. Moving as if he were on the deck of a storm-tossed ship in the sea, he made his way to the far side of the ship. The hovercar had toppled over on its side. As he moved toward it the side hatch popped open and Kbrihim came crawling out, half carrying, half dragging his Aunt Maria. She seemed to have a bad cut on the left side of her head. She looked half stunned. Somehow, without even knowing how he did it, Chewbacca crossed the distance to the hover car. He reached out and lifted Mariha away from Ebrahim's. Side then tucked her under one arm and lifted Ebrahim down to the ground with the other. He shouted at Ebrahim to get aboard the Falcon and pointed toward the ship. Either Ebrahim could understand what Chewbacca was saying or else he understood the gesture. He nodded and started toward the ship. The ground had all but stopped moving, and Ebrahim was to walk more or less without being knocked over. Chewbacca looked toward the ship himself and saw Q.Y. down and inert, slumped over next to his charging stand. Still carrying Marka, he moved to the charging stand and examined the situation. The droid looked completely dead and motionless. Chewbacca pulled at the cable connecting the droid to the charger but the connection seemed to have gotten jammed somehow. Chewbacca yanked harder, and the cable snapped. He scooped the droid up in his free hand and headed for the Falcon. At that moment the lightning struck again, blasting out from the central cone toward the six smaller cones that surrounded it. Chewbacca looked up involuntarily to see the dazzling bright display, but then realized his mistake and looked away before he could be blinded by the light. The light he could look away from, but the sound, the overwhelming sound there was nothing he could do to shut that out. He hurried toward the ship as the lesser cones answered back to the master, sending their own bolts of fire back toward the central cone. The noise redoubled, louder than ever, and the ground bucked harder, nearly knocking Chewbacca over. The Falcon was bouncing on its landing jacks, riding their shock absorbers. Chewbacca staggered around to the far side of the ship and got to the entry ramp. He had to time his rush up the ramp between the buckings and surgings of the silver surface of the ground. Judging the moment to be. Right, he rushed aboard ship. He hit the switch to raise the ramp, then got to the lounge. He set the Duchess Marka and Q9X2 down on the deck as gently as he could. Ibrahim had already produced a first aid kit from somewhere and knelt down next to his aunt. The two draw, the droid, the twins Chewbacca suddenly realized that Anakin wasn't there. He had half assumed the youngest child would be with the twins. He turned and headed toward the door. Anakin's safe. Jason shouted over the thundering din, clearly reading Chewbacca's thoughts from his action. 
He's in some sheltered side tunnel. I can feel him in the force. He's not hurt, and he's feeling more scared will be mad at him than scared he'll get hurt. I think he set this off. Chewbacca just stood there and stared at Jason for a moment, unsure what to do. He had sworn to protect the children above all else. If Anakin were indeed safe, then he could button up the ship and wait this thing out. But if, if Anakin were in danger, then what could he do? Search all the endless side corridors for him during this massive disturbance? But if he did that, he would be exposing the ship, and those aboard her, to greater danger. He would have to get the shields raised and lowered so he could go in and out and no one besides him knew the ship well enough to keep the shields up. Lo keep the others safe, he would have to stay here. Very well. It was not certain, it was not perfect, but it was the best judgment, the best decision he could make under the circumstances. If he had judged wrong, and harm came to Anakin as a result then, he knew, his own life would be forfeit, and rightly so. It took him but a moment to think it all through. But thought was nothing without action. He rushed for the cockpit and activated the Falcon's shields at full strength. The sound faded away somewhat as the shields engaged. Chewbacca tried to activate the ship's repulsors to raise her up off the heaving deck of the chamber, but they would not engage. He checked the propulsion readouts. Every propulsion system was offline. He had no idea why. But there was no time to worry about that now. He needed to get the ship up off the deck before it was bounced apart. Even without the propulsion systems, there was a way to do that. Chewbacca worked the shield controls, shifting power away from the upper shields to the lower ones, extending the lower shields as far as they would go, and softening them, so they formed a gradual thickening membrane rather than a hard edge if only the trick would work. The falcon hesitated a moment, and then rose up off her landing jacks to rest on a cushion of softened lower side shields. The bouncing and bucking and heaving of the deck was still there to be felt, but the shield smoothed it down and gave the ship a chance to ride it out. He set the shields to self-compensate and maintain their bedding. He could at least hope the shields would protect them against what was happening, but he would not be able to do more than hope until he knew what was going on. All he knew for sure was that it seemed to be happening above them all. He looked up, just as another spectacular cycle of lightning bursts flashed back and forth between the tops of the cones and then another, and another. The cycle was clearly growing faster, and more powerful. There was no way of knowing what sorts of energy and radiation those bolts were putting out. Chewbacca could do little more than hope that the falcon shields would protect those inside against it all. The lightning transfers grew faster and faster, more and more powerful, until all the cone tops were a constant blaze of light joined together by spikes of fire. Then, it seemed, the cone tops drew the fire in, absorbing the energy that flowed around them. The roaring thunder of the lightning faded away as the cone tops flared and flickered with energy, light of every color sparking and shimmering on their surfaces. Just when Chewbacca thought the display had reached its climax, he realized the scintillating colors wiker flowing down the cones, toward the bottom of the chamber toward the Millennium Falcon. Chewbacca tried frantically to activate one of the propulsion systems, any of the propulsion systems but ale of them stayed stubbornly offline. Suddenly the entire ship was bald in lightning, a firestorm of sparks and flares that coursed around the shields, sparking and flaring everywhere. Every circuit breaker and safety cutoff in the ship tripped at once, and Chewbacca made no effort to reset any of them. He had no desire to have any active circuits running with that much power flowing around the ship. As suddenly as it had flowed over the ship, the wave of power swept past it. Chewie craned his neck around to watch the energy wave moving, just in time to see it incinerate the hover car, detonate Q9's charging stand, and set everything else left outside ablaze. The blaze of energy swept on 
swooping up the sides of the chamber's conical interior wall, rushing up toward the apex of the chamber, a ring of seething power that grew brighter, more powerful, more energetic as it moved higher up the cone. The ring of fire merged into a single point of raging power at the apex of the cone and exploded outward in a torrent of light that streamed forth in all directions, blindingly bright. The walls of the cone seemed to shudder, shake, expand as the power burst rippled through them. Another stream of scintillating power coursed down the big central cone and the six lesser ones. Down over the base of the chamber, blanketing the falcon in bolts of blazing glory as it swept past the ship, out and up and in toward the point of the conical chamber, racing toward the pinnacle, blasting out its energy, making the very walls of the cone shimmer and shake with its power. And again. And again. And again. Until the power burst did not meet in a point, but instead reached the top of an open cone, and exploded as a ring of light with the blue skies of daylight visible above. Chewbacca, still stunned and amazed, began to realize what was happening. The conical chamber of the planetary repulsor was transforming itself, opening itself out opening out its apex point to give itself a clear shot at the sky. Another power burst swept over the ship. Another. Another, 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 Ia burst riding up to the top of the now-open cone and forcing it open wider and wider and wider. Chubi checked the shield displays and saw that, for a miracle, they were holding. That was, no doubt, less a testimony to the strength of the shields than it was to the characteristics of the energy sweeping past the ship. The power bursts were flowing over the shields, not attempting to penetrate them. But Chewbacca was past worrying about such things. Whether or not they survived, or were burned to a cinder, was out of his hands, of anyone's hands. This titanic machine would do whatever Anakin had ordered it to do, and nothing could stand in its way. Chewbacca thought of the endless megatons of rock and stone and dirt the chamber had to be slamming out of the way, the massive shock waves that had to be reverberating throughout the whole vicinity. There had been a whole series of underground tunnels leading to the hidden entrance to this place. Surely all of them had collapsed, along with the Dralist building that sat atop them. The Dralist had been searching for the planetary repulsor. By now, beyond doubt, the planetary repulsor had found them, destroyed them as they had attempted to destroy the new republic's government. Chewbacca found a rough justice in that thought, and smiled to himself. Jason came into the cockpit and slipped into the pilot's seat, his father's seat, straining to see what was happening. The boy seemed very small, and very frightened and yet controlled, adult, serious. There was no time now to feel the terror of the moment. That could come later. That was what nightmares were for. The boy looked up and saw what was happening, saw the job that the roiling, seething energies were doing. It's opening slash Jason said, his voice full of wonder. And it's getting higher. Chubby looked up. He hadn't noticed that, but Jason was right. The walls of the cone were getting taller, even as they spread wider. Perhaps that was to ensure the stone and earth that shoved out of the way did not tumble down into the cavern. Perhaps it was for some other reason altogether. Who could know what the makers of this stupendous device had intended? Chewbacca turned toward Jason and pointed toward the outside of the ship, then held his hand out, palm down, at the height of a smally child's head as he let out a worried growl. Anakin still lay. All right said Jason. I can feel him. He's out there. Jason pointed toward one specific point in the perimeter of the chamber wall dash. And he's scared maybe even more scared than we are I mean more scared than Jaina and me but he's all right. In the midst of his own fear, Chuby managed to find a little bit of a laugh. A clever recovery on Jason's part. The child knew that Wookiees did not like admitting to fear, and had found a way to avoid offending a Wookiee who was downright terrified. 
Any rational being would be terrified by all this. Chubi pointed to the back of the falcon and made another interrogatory sounding noise. They're all okay back there, said Jason. And Marco woke up, and I think she'll be okay. Except Q9. He's still dead or off, or shorted out, or whatever. He's not moving anyway. Chewbacca nodded. They were lucky any of them were alive. If Q9 could be repaired, Chkwai would attend to it later. If not well, one casualty seemed a very low price indeed for riding out this storm. Another pulse of energy swept over the Falcon, a bit rougher ride than the last one. The ship bounced once or twice and spun about a few degrees to starboard. Chewbacca growled thoughtfully. A reminder that was. A reminder that they were nowhere near close enough to the end of this to talk about living through it. Chapter 5 Down the Hatch Thrak and Sal Solo, self-proclaimed diktat of the Corellian Sector, leader of the Human League, stared at the bottle in front of him and gave serious thought to the idea of getting himself good and drunk. There seemed precious little else he could do. Besides wait. Threken had never been much good at waiting, which was ironic, for he had spent much of his adult life waiting. Waiting for a superior to resign or retire or be arrested. Waiting for a plot to mature, waiting for the time to be right, waiting for the long-awaited offer of the succession from Dupa Thomri, dictat of Corellia waiting until the day Thomri died, and that fool Galambi had taken his place instead. Waiting for the Empire to wake up and understand the danger represented by the damnable rebels. Waiting for the Emperor to strike back from the hammer blows the rebellion gave the Empire. Waiting for Thrawn's contour strike to succeed. Waiting, all of it, in vain. Waiting for things that had never happened. Waiting for sweet victories that had melted away into bitter, humiliating defeat. Three can grab the bottle by the neck, like an enemy he was trying to strangle. He stood up and walked around his desk, out of his office, and out into the corridor of the DIG headquarters. The DIG HQ was not as large or as comfortable a place as the old headquarters, but at least it was secure. Thraken would have preferred to keep his headquarters in the underground bunker in the countryside on the far side of the city, but the Human League had been forced to abandon that supposedly secret location. The blasted Salonians had yanked their compatriot, Drachmus, out of there, along with Thraken's traitor cousin, Han Solo. It hadn't taken much imagination to realize that a group that could take two prisoners out of an underground bunker could just as easily put one bomb in. So Thraken had been forced to withdraw from there, and they were minus one headquarters. Call it another debt on the account Thraken was drawing up against Han Solo. Sooner or later, Han Solo would pay for all of it. Thraken walked out of the building and out into the fading light of twilight. He watched the second shift men coming on duty, headed for their work underground. A number of them saw him and cheered. Thraken forced a smile onto his face, put his hand to his forehead, and gave the boys a small, informal sort of salute. He made no effort to hide his bottle. That was one nice thing about his boys. He didn't have to pretend he wasn't human, that he didn't like a drink now and again. Or even a drink more often than that. Now if only his boys were good at finding things. They were still searching for the Corellian planetary repulsor. It had to be hidden in the tunnels somewhere beneath them. It had to be. Or things were going to get very sticky indeed. Except things were already sticky. Solo had escaped. Leia Organa Solo had escaped. The Bakurans had busted through the interdiction field somehow. They were loose in the system and might have already seized control of center point. Things were not going according to plan. At least he had managed to accomplish a little bit of revenge already. Lysia Organa Solo might have escaped but others never would. With any luck at all, 
history would record that Governor General Mike Camberlecto had died of injuries he suffered during the initial attack. But even if the true story of the Frosian's demise came out, Thraken wouldn't much mind. Terror could be a very useful tool. But killing the Governor General was incidental. The stakes were much higher than that and Thraken knew just how dangerous a game he was playing. He knew more of the real story than anyone else in this star system. He knew how much of a bluff it all was. He knew how many dangers surrounded him from all sides. He had claimed to control the Starbuster plot. For the moment, at least, it suited the purposes of the Starbuster's real masters to let him go on claiming it. It provided them with additional cover, an extra level of protective deception. Not that they could do anything about it at the moment, but more than likely they believed Thraken would keep to his side of the bargain, and back off his claim when the proper moment came for them to reveal themselves. They could believe what they wanted. Thraken had no intention of doing any such thing. The Starbusters' masters also believed that Thraken would turn over the planetary repulsa on this world as soon as he found it, in return for granting Thraken a free hand on the planet Corklea. They could go on believing that, too, if they wished. Thraken had other plans. The masters of the Starbuster had told all the rebel leaders that the planetary repulsas were superb defensive weapons, nothing more. Thraken knew better. Thraken knew it would suit the Starbusters controllers just fine if no one ever got the things working, so long as the controllers sat on top of them and kept anyone else from getting near them. But Thraken knew the repulses were weapons of denial, blackmail weapons, weapons of threat that worked best if they were aimed, but never fired. Let the other rebel leaders, the dirt-grubbing Selonian Overden or those bumbling fools, the Dralis, think what they might. Let the scramble brains on Talus and trains believe what they were told about the repulses. Thraken knew better. He knew the masters of the Starbuster plot had double-crossed them all. And Thraken also knew that a double-cross was nothing more than the necessary first step toward a successful triple-cross. But none of it would do any good unless his people could find the repulsor and get it operational. If the dirt-digging Salonians could do it, Surely humans could do at least as well. Dictat Salsolo. Dictat. Thraken turned around to see General Bremon Yerr, the man in charge of the dig, jogging toward him. What is it, General? News, sir. Maybe big news. The Drawl Planetary Repulsor just came alive. What? Just now, sir. The jamming is still in place, of course, so we can't get any more information. But our sensors just picked up a huge jolt of repulsa activity coming from Drawl. Unfocused, uncontrolled, but it's there. The Dralists have got the thing working. I don't believe it, Thraken said. I can't believe it. The Salonians, maybe. They're good at underground work. The Overden has some good technicians. But the Dral HSDS? They were never anything. In moments of honesty, Thraken knew his own human league forces were not exactly the cream of society. Thugs, most of them. Even with Ail the help he got from the Starbusters' masters, he had not been able to recruit many high-quality people. He had learned to accept that, and view his troops as the best tools he could lay hands on if not the best tools for the job. But thugs or not, compared to the Dralists, they were perfect gentlemen and leading scientists, every one of them. Thraken had at least been able to buy himself a few disgruntled technicians, some ex-imperial soldiers and administrators. Not the Dralists. Whatever else you could say against the Dralish species, the pompous little fools were relentlessly honest, upright, cautious people. There had actually been some sort of discontent on Corellia, and probably on Salonia and Talus and Trellis, around which to build a revolt. On Drawl, the rebellion had been, out of necessity, completely artificial. 
Even the Human League wouldn't have taken on humans as lowdown as the Dralis San Dralis technical capability was no better than Dralisal behavior. The idea that they had been able to get a planetary repulsor up and running was simply incredible. Wait a moment. Wait just a moment. Maybe the Dralis hadn't gotten it running. Maybe someone else had managed that little trick. Suddenly Thraken had a shrewd idea who that might be and if he was right, he might just pick up a nice little bonus from all this. Because no matter who had gotten the repulsor running, Thraken Salsolo was willing to bet they would not keep it long. He turned toward Yerer. Get the best of the repulsor tech crews together, along with the strike platoon. He lifted the bottle to his lips and took a big swallow. A warm glow started to flow through his insides. We're going to pay a little call on the Dralists. Luke watched the blinking light over the huge airlock chamber and wondered who was on the other side, asking them in. Or more accurately, wondered if it would be wise to head on in. He and Lando had been debating the point for five minutes now. Luke decided to turn the debate on its head. Okay, just for the sake of argument, he said, suppose we don't go in that airlock. What's the alternative? I don't know, Lando replied. If we landed on the other side of the sphere, or went in on the end of the farther cylinder, we might be able to explore F, weeks, before anyone caught up with us. And that might be a goo idea. How so? Luke asked. You know me, Luke. I think big. That's for sure. Lando had made something like a career out of building huge projects of one sort or another. Of course, the projects had a bad habit of going bust for reasons that were no fault of Lando's, but that was either here nor there. So this place is big. What do you think about it? I think something is wrong. I thought so the first time I saw this place, and the closer you get, the surer I am. I think big, but I also. Ink can function. Big makes sense for some jobs, but this is too yuk. That station has a hundred, a thousand times the volume it should for any job I can think of that it might do, and the underlying design is all wrong. The eels don't see that something's wrong because the station has been here so long. They take I.O. for granted, think of it as a natural object. But trust me, something about that station feels wrong. Feels wrong. Lando had no talent in the Force. Luke was sure of that. But that didn't mean his intuitions couldn't be right. Luke shut his eyes and reached out probing with his force ability, searching for the fee of the station, of the beings aboard it. He could detect exactly one sentient mind, a human. Only one? Perhaps there were others, their minds shielded from him in some manner. He reached out and touched the one mind he could sense, touched as gently as he would. He discovered no sense of evil or bad intent. What he did find was a powerful sense of fear and uncertainty. He probed toward the blinking light and the airlock door that was still opening and shutting. There was one mind there, a human one, a young woman. And that mind still seemed worried and afraid but friendly enough for all of that. I say we accept the invitation, Luke said. You're right we could spend weeks exploring on our own. But Jay don't think we have weeks to spare. And I think the natives are friendly. At least, there's one friendly one. There was a dead silence on the line that lasted long enough for Luke to start wondering if the laser comm system had given out altogether. But then Lando finally spoke. When you're right, you're right, he said. We have to take, he chants. All right, said Luke. He brought his throttle forward just a fraction and flew toward the airlock, the Lady Luck right behind him. As they drew closer, the light stopped flashing and the airlock door swung open wide and stopped there. 
Luke had to do some tricky flying to line his fighter up with the airlock and match lateral velocity as it rotated. Doing so while flying inverted made it only slightly more difficult. Luke was used to flying in all sorts of attitudes relative to his target, and with the station spinning to simulate gravity, he had to make sure the X-Wing's landing pads were pointed straight out at the sky as he made his way into the airlock. The closer Luke got to the airlock entrance, the bigger he realized it was. From a distance, it had appeared of ordinary proportion, but in reality, the thing could have handled the Imruder, the Defender, and the Sentinel flying side by side. Luke's X-Wing HEW and with as much room to spare as an insect flying into Jabba the Hutt's wide gaping mouth. Lando followed right behind in the Lady Luck. Admiral Hort Colossalage was less than happy when the intruder's detectors picked up the massive, off Aichi scale repulsive burst from Drawl. Surprises were rarely welcome in a military operation, but doubly so when one was this far behind enemy lines and dealing with forces of such power. Lando Calrissian had warned him that his tactics of audacious advance might get him in. Over his head. Well, so be it. There was no real going back. Caution would gain him nothing. He would have to investigate that repulsor burst. It was almost certainly another planetary repulsor. But the burst seemed to have fired at nothing at all almost like a flare shot straight up in the air for no better purpose than to attract attention. Oscillage frowned to himself as he stared at the detector screen. Perhaps perhaps that was exactly what it was. With all conventional communication shut down, how else to announce one had captured a repulsor? A signal flare. But the enemy, the opposition, had kept their repulsor at Salonia secret. That suggested the people holding this repulsor were on the other side. Perhaps warning the other side that they were not the only ones with such a mighty weapon. Not just a signal flare, but a warning shot, perhaps. Clearly, Oscillage had no choice but to investigate. But the timing could not have been worse. His ships had just taken up their positions around Kenterpunt Station. Gariel Captison and her party were now inside the station, completely cut off from any communication with the Bakuran forces. He could not abandon his position at center point or leave his people behind. He would have no choice but to divide his forces. For the briefest of moments, he considered sending nothing more than a flight of fighters or an assault boat loaded with troops. But no. The opposition was likely to move on the draw repulsor as well. The Bakuran forces would have to go in ready to fight, not just investigate. Asilic smiled, his lips forming into a thin line. Kalrishan had, indeed, warned him against audacious action. But Ocelage had been extremely cautious as he moved in towards Centerpoint Station, and he had discovered something about caution. He did not like it. Ocelage turned toward the ensign standing next to him. My compliments to Captain Semak, he said to her, and relay my order to set course for Drawl. The Igniter is going to investigate that repulsion burst. Sentinel and Defender will remain at Centerpoint. Ocelage looked back toward the detector screen. Someone has sent us an invitation. I think it is the only common politeness that we accept. Luke's X-Wing and the Lady Luck floated 15 meters off the deck, moving slowly forward into the airlock, their shields up and in formation so as to give each other cover. What good such precautions might be up against a space station the size of a small planet, either of them asked. Luke brought the X-Wing into a hover over the center of the lock and swung the fighter around to cover the Lady Luck as she came in. The Lady moved forward slowly, easing her way into the interior. The airlock chamber was cavernously huge and profoundly dark. The Lady Luck's landing lights came on and swiveled about, throwing a shifting spot of brightness on the interior wall of the lock, but Luke was not able to make much of what the spot revealed. The huge exterior airlock door lumbered shut, sealing them inside. Now they were trapped, 
if they wanted to think of it that way. Then the lock's own interior lights bloomed into life, coming up slowly enough that Luke's eyes were not dazzled. The interior of the lock was a half-cylinder on its side, with the flat wall of the half-cylinder forming the deck. The deck was littered with debris odds and ends of all sorts. Bits of clothing, broken pieces of luggage, freight containers, abandoned machinery, even a small spacecraft with all its access ports open and its nose assembly removed. Obviously it had been cannibalized for parts. Okay, psychome folks got out of here in a yuri, Lando said. Looks like, Luke said. What, exactly, had they been in such a hurry to get away from? And had they made a run for it last week, or a hundred years before? He didn't feel easy in his mind. Listen, Lando, normally I'd say land the ship with the passengers first and let the fighter fly cover. But with that airlock door, Shui, there doesn't seem much point to it. I'll land first. Maybe if it's a trap, they'll spring it on me first and then dash. Then what? I don't know, Luke said. But don't land until you're sure it's safe. If I wait that long, we're going to be sitting here in hover mode for a long time, Lando replied. There didn't seem to be any good answer for that, so Luke didn't try to offer one. I'm headed down, he said. Luke eased back on the repulsors and brought the X-wings slowly down onto the deck. He made a nice smooth landing and was getting ready to undo his canopy and get out when Arta beeped furiously at him. What? Oh. Arta was right the airlock chamber hadn't been pressurized. That could be a problem. Luke hadn't worn a scalable flight suit, and he was not entirely clear on whether there were pressure suits for all aboard the Lady Luck. But what was the point of bringing them in here if they couldn't get out of their ships? Luke looked around the airlock chamber again and noticed that the debris was all inside a fairly well-prescribed perimeter. Why had everyone crowded together like that in the midst of what seemed to have been a panic departure? A burst of light suddenly flared to life in the center of the airlock chamber's roof. Four streaks of light split off from the center and slid down to the four corners of the chamber. The streaks faded to darkness, and then the light burst came to life again, before splitting up and sliding down. To the corners, and then the pattern repealed. It was as clear a signal as the airlock door opening and shutting. Go down, go down, go down. Now Luke understood. Lando, he said, bring her down. They're using a force bubble pressurization system in here. I don't think they want to activate the force field until you've landed. By using a force field system, they could avoid constantly pressurizing and depressurizing the chamber no small issue in a chamber this size. But then we'd both be trapped in C the force field. Lando objected. What's the difference? We're already trapped inside the airlock. There's a difference between being in a cage with a banda and climbing into the bantha's gullet. Lando muttered. But all right, here we come. The Lady Luck eased down on her repulsors and set down ten meters in front of Luke's X-wing. The moment she landed, there was a shimmering in the space over their heads. After a moment I all settled down into a thin blue hazy blur that surrounded the two ships, forming a hemisphere over them. A tunnel formed of the same blue haze came into being just behind the Lady Luck. Peering down it, Luke could see that it led to a more conventional-sized inner airlock hatch. Leading us here every step of the way, Luke muttered to himself. He heard a far-off, high-pitched hissing noise and the body of the X-wing creaked and groaned once or twice as two adjusted to the change in pressure. The hissing dropped and pitched down to a low roar of noise, and the incoming air was whipping up some of the smaller bits of debris and throwing them around, until the inside of the force field bubble was swirling with bits of paper and dust and torn up packing material. The X-wing rocked back on its shock absorbers as the rush of air pushed at IL. 
Luke watched his exterior gauges as the roaring subsided. At least as far as his instruments were concerned, it was perfectly normal air at perfectly normal pressure. Of course, it could contain some deadly nerve gas the X-Wings detectors couldn't sense. But if whoever was running the show here had wanted to kill them, they could have done the job about a dozen times already. Never mind. Time to get on with it. Luke popped the canopy of the X-Wing and let it swing up out of the way. He pulled his flight helmet off and stashed it, then climbed up out of the pilot's compartment. He slid down the side of the fuselage and dropped lightly to the ground. Relatively light gravity here, he noticed. Of course, they were fairly close to the spin axis here. The apparent force of gravity would be a lot stronger close to the equator line of the sphere. The hatches of the Lady Luck swung open, the egress ramp came down, and Lando, Gario, and Kalenda walked down it, closely followed by a rather agitated-looking Thrupio. I don't like this place, the protocol droid announced. Not one little bit. I'm sure we are all in the most terrible danger here. Yeah, whatever. Lando muttered. Besides, what was the last place you did like? 3PO hesitated a moment and cocked his head to one side. A most interesting question, he said. I can't recall one offhand. I shall have to consult my onboard archives. Do it later, 3PO, said Luke. We might need you for other things. Certainly, Master Luke. Gariel and Kalenda looked around the airlock chamber, and it was easy to tell the diplomat from the intelligence officer. Kalenda knelt down to examine some of the broken-up debris and snatched at a few of the bits of paper that were fluttering, no doubt in hopes of reading some important clue. Gariel made S.Vipio, the protocol and translation droid, was close, and directed her attention to IHE Force Field Tunnel and the hatch that would lead them to their host. Luke heard a beeping and a blooping from the top side of his X-Wing. Don't worry, R2, I haven't forgotten you. Back at a base, the normal thing was to use a winch to get R2 in and out of his socket in the stern of the X-Wing. In the field, it was possible for R2 to get himself out, but the process was not very graceful and had ended with R2 toppling over and landing with a crash on more than one occasion. But when the pilot of the X-Wing was a Jedi Master, such awkwardness was not necessary. Luke reached out with his ability in the Force and lifted R2 gently into the air. Do be careful, Master Luke, said 3PO. It makes me nervous just to see you do that. R2 let out a long, low moan that echoed his agreement with 3PO. Relax, both of you, said Luke. I could do this standing on my head. R2 moaned again. Sorry, said Luke. It's not nice to lease. Luke moved R2 clear of the X-Wing and was just about to start bringing him down to the deck when the hatch at the end of the force field tunnel began to lumber open. Everyone stopped what they were doing and turned to look. Luke felt his hand move toward his lightsaber, but then he pulled it away. No. All he knew for sure was that he had touched the mind of a human who seemed to bear them no ill will. Whoever was about to come through that door had not summoned them all here to engage in single combat. They would be dead many times over by now, if that was her intent. He saw Lando and Kalenda make the same reflex reach for their own sidearms, and then pull their hands back. The doors rumbled open, and a tall, thin, nervous-looking, pale-skinned woman came in. She hesitated at the entrance for a moment, and then shrugged and walked toward them at a brisk clip that seemed to say less about her eagerness to get low the end of the tunnel and more about her rather agitated state. Luke watched her as she came closer. She was an attractive-looking woman with a long, thin face, thick black curly hair that reached to her shoulders, and prominent, expressive eyebrows. She looked worried as she came toward them, her eyes moving from one member of the party to the next. 
But then the worried look faded away to be replaced by one of pure bafflement as she looked upward. How are you doing that? She asked. And why? Huh? Luke asked and looked up himself. Oh. He had nearly forgotten that Arta was still hanging in midair. If he had lost any more concentration, Arta would have crashed to the deck. Distracted by the sight of their hostess's arrival, it would seem that Arta had forgotten it himself. Luke willed Arta to move down and landed him gently on the deck. It's sort of a long story, he said. I'll be, the young woman said, giving Luke a long, hard, quizzical look. Well, anyway. I'm Jenica Sunson, C.C.O. Adop. What? Luke asked. Sunson sighed. Sorry. Force of habit. Center Point Chief Operations Officer, Administration and Operations. Basically, I run the place these days. The C.C. declared a bug out right after the first major flare incident and the whole exec SEC evac'd along with practically all the C-point civpop. I wish Slash could get out of here, but I was OOD when the bug was called, so Reg said I would stay behind. Luke was about to ask her what that meant when 3PO stepped forward. Perhaps I might be of help, Master Skywalker, said the droid. She is using many terms that are similar to the bureaucratic, Argo of Coruscant. I believe that what Administrative Officer Sunson means is that Centerpunt's chief executive ordered a full evacuation after the first flare disaster, and the entire executive secretariat left along with most of the civilian populace. Although she wished to leave with everyone else. Administrative Officer Sunson happened low B, he officer on duty at the moment when the evacuation was declared and under those circumstances, she was automatically designated the officer low stay behind and serve as a caretaker. She didn't say anything about a disaster, Lando said suspiciously. I beg your pardon, 3PO said, but she did refer to a major incident. That is a common bureaucratic euphemism for a major catastrophe. Hold it, Sunson said. The tin box got it all correct, but I am right here. You could ask me what I meant. Only if you promise to speak basic like everyone else, Lando said. Luke had low smile. Lando never had had much use for bureaucratic double talk. For a moment it looked as if Sunson were a bull to bite Lando's head off, bull then back down. Maybe you've got a point. But I have to know all you're doing here. Your ships blew out of nowhere and then those fighters bugged out too. Were they your fighters? Kalenda asked. And what government do you represent? The fighters you were shooting at? They weren't Fed Dub. Fed Dub? Sorry. The Federation of the Double Worlds. Kalenda nodded and looked to Luke, her gaze seemingly somewhere over his left shoulder. The Federation is the duly elected government of Talus and Trellis. You people still haven't told me who you are and what you're doing here, Sunson said. Our apologies, Gariel said, speaking for the first time. I am Gary. Captus, plenipotentiary of the planet Bakura. This is Captain Lando Calrissian, Jedi Master Luke Skywalker, and Lieutenant Belindi Kalenda, all of the planet Coruscant. We represent the New Republic and the planet Bakura. She went on in a tone of voice that suggested she was expecting argument, but wasn't going to put up with it. We are, she said, taking possession of Centerpoint Station in the name of the New Republic. Well, good, said Sunson. It's about Lime somebody did. Come this way and I'll show you where everything is. She turned around abruptly and started walking down the tunnel toward the inner hatch. Gariel looked at Luke, clearly taken aback. She's not what we expected, she said. Most things aren't around Luke, Lando said. But if she's going to hand over the keys to us, I think we'd better not let her get too far ahead. 
the four humans and two droids found Sunson waiting for them on the other side of the inner hatch. There you all are, she said. Shall we start the tour? Her tone was utterly matter-of-fact, as if handing over space stations to more or less allied forces was all part of the daily routine. I can't show you all of the station, of course, unless you all want to die of old age before we're half done, but I can show you the basics. This way. She ushered them all into a waiting turbivator car on the opposite side of the lock chamber. They followed her in. Luke entered the car after everyone else, feeling quite bewildered. The turbivator car was huge and scruffy looking. All the walls were covered with dings and scratches, as if the car had seen a lot of heavy-use moving cargo. There was a meter-wide porthole in the back wall of the car, likewise a bit dinged up, and another like it in the ceiling. However, there seemed to be nothing but blackness to see. Hang on just a second, she said. We have to move the car through an airlock. Pressure difference. And... Ah oh well, something happened to the air where we're going. She worked the controls, and the car lurched forward a few meters. They heard a hatch seal behind them. There was the whir of air pumps and then, through the viewport, they saw another hatch open before them. Sunson pushed another button and the car started to move, not up or down, but sideways. Lights on the exterior of the car came on, showing the way forward. The tunnel they were in was circular in cross-section, and dark pink in color. The tunnel ahead trailed off into what seemed an infinity of darkness. Luke felt as if they had been swallowed by some huge creature and were rushing down its gullet, toward an appointment with the digestive system. We might as well start out with Hollowtown, Sunson said. It's what everyone always wants to see first. Hollowtown? Lando asked. There was a second's awkward pause before Sunson spoke. You're not all tie well briefed, are you? She asked. Things have happened kind of fast, Luke said. There hasn't been a lot of time. I guess not. Well, let me start from scratch. Hollowtown is the open space in the exact center of the central sphere. It's a spherical hollow about 60 kilometers across. Where you docked was just about at the join between the North Pole that's what the locals call the cylinders, the North and South Poles and the Central Sphere. We're now moving parallel to the axis of rotation, sideways, in toward Hollowtown. We have to pass through about 20 kilometers of decks and shells first. A shell is what we call real high signage deck anything over about 20 meters or so. There are about 2,000 levels all told. We're accelerating pretty fast right now. Faster than you think. We'll come up in Hollowtown in about five minutes, and then start moving down Slopk, toward the heavy gravity areas. Farther out from the axis you go, the more of a spin, and the higher effective gravity, of course. The spin must get to be an awful nuisance, Kalenda said. Why haven't you shifted over to standard artificial gravity? We've thought about it. Cap Con Opsari, the Capital Construction Operations Office, has done about a dozen studies on despinning the station and using standard artograph. Luke managed low translate that last as artificial gravity and tried to nod encouragingly. So what do the studies come up with? Too expensive, too complicated, too disruptive, and too many unknowns. The station structure might or might not respond well to the shifted stresses. But it's your problem now. You can despin it all you want as far as I'm concerned. I take it you want out, Luke said. Do I ever. I was into real short time when the first flare went wump. I was almost down to counting the days on one hand and then, well, you know the rest. Lousy briefing, remember? Lando said. Wait a second. 
You people don't know about the Fter's tea. First we've heard of them, Luke said. We just broke through the interdiction field into the system a few days ago. Sunson let out a low whistle. Broke through the interdiction field? That's something, all right. I'll bet whoever is creating that field isn't real happy with you just now. Kalenda frowned. Hold it. You're generating the field. What? What are you talking about? The field. The interdiction field is centered on this station. Center print station is generating the interdiction field. And? The communications jamming, for that matter. Burning stars. It is? You didn't know that, Lando said. It was not a question. Nope. None of us here did. Looks like my briefing wasn't so good either. Luke was getting more confused by the minute. How could the people running the station not know the station was creating the field? And what were these flares Sunson was talking about? It was becoming plainer and plainer that things were not as they appeared. But it was also becoming progressively less clear how they appeared in the first place. I think we have a few things to talk about, said Luke. The turboviewer moved smoothly toward Holotown. Chapter 6 The View from Inside What you've got to understand about this place is that no one understands it, Sunson said. We just live here. It's here, so are we, and that's about it. No one thought much about why things were the way they were. We didn't know why Centerpoint did most of the things it did, but we knew what most of them were. At least we thought we knew, up until a while ago. Up until the terrorists started showing us a few tricks. We just got here, Lando said. What terrorists? Sunson shook her head. I'd love to know the answer to that one. There have been attacks nasty ones. But no one has claimed responsibility or made demands. Not so much as an anonymous tip. We have suspects the Trotelabirs, the two Worldkers, and so on, but they all denied having anything to do with it. Besides, if they could pull off the stuff that's happened here, they wouldn't waste time making threats. They just move in and take over. Of course, the station's been cut off from everybody since the jamming started up. The investigators on the ground could have wrapped up the case, solved it completely, and we wouldn't know about it. Luke made a guess that Tratalibius meant the Tralus and Layla's Liberation Party, or some such. Two worlders probably meant some crowd that wanted separate governments for each planet. Guesses were good enough. He had an idea what Sunson meant, and he had a hunch the groups in question were not worth worrying about. Tell us about the Altax themselves. Sunson went to the Turbovator car's viewport. You'll be able to see for yourself in a minute or two. Hollowtown used to be quite a place. It grew enough food for the whole station, with a surplus. It had parks, and nice homes, and lakes and streams. Green and blue, coo. And lovely. Then someone started messing with the glow point. The glow point being a sort of artificial sun. Luke asked. Ty's right, said Sunson. And someone made it go crazy. Who normally controls the glow point? Lando asked. No one. Of course, Sunson replied. As if Lando had just asked where she kept the on-off switch for the galaxy's spin. As I said, it's just there, the way the whole station is. We didn't build it. I guess it was here when we got here whenever that was. The glow point is just there. Lando repeated. Anyone know how it works? How it gives off Lyle? There are theories of one sort or another. One idea is that the glow point draws its power directly from the gravitational interlux between talus and trains. 
But no one has been able to come up with an instrument to test the idea. There's nothing conclusive. You don't know how the power source for half your food production works? Gary asked. No, said Sunson. Do you know how the hyperdrive motors that got you here work? Luke had to smile to himself. Jenica Sunson had a point. There was scarcely a human being alive who completely understood every bit of technology he or she used. The center pointers, it seemed, were just a bit more obvious about it. Anyway, we're coming up on Hollowtown, if you want to get a look at it. The other humans joined her at the viewport, leaving the two droids off by themselves in the back of the ear. A spot of light began to gleam through the end of the tunnel up ahead. That's the glow point, Sunson said. It's back to normal, at least for the moment. That's what it used to be like all the time. The turbivator car moved closer and closer to the tunnel, giving the illusion that it was moving faster and faster as it got closer to the light. The humans in the group shielded their eyes against tree sudden brightness. In a moment that seemed to take forever to arrive and then to happen all at once, the turbivator car burst out of the end of the tunnel and, with a stomach-dropping lurch, began to move straight downward. But no one in the car paid much notice to the violent change of direction. They were too busy looking at Hollowtown. Or what was left of it. The glow point was just that, a glowing point of light suspended in midair in the precise center of the huge spherical chamber. It looked like a miniature sun, warm, bright, comfortable, inviting. But there was nothing comfortable about the landscape below. Hollowtown had been burnt to a crisp, charred down to a blackened land of ashes. Hazy clouds of dust floated everywhere. Luke could see the skeletal remains of burned-out buildings, what had once been neatly planted orchards that were now nothing but rows of incinerated tree stumps. A lake had boiled dry, and the lake bottom was exposed, the remains of ruined pleasure boats, lying there like children's toys left behind when the water was drained from the tub. It was a terrible place, a nightmare place, made all the worse because it had so plainly been lovely, well, tended not so very long before. Normally I'd stop the car at one of the intermediate stops and let you get out and look around, Sunson said. But there's just about no free oxygen left in there. All of it got consumed in the fires. I don't know how we'll ever get breathable air in there again. For that matter, it took some doing to get breathable air in this turbivator car. It didn't use to have its own air source, just a compressor that pulled air in from the outside. The air in the tunnel and near the spin axis was always too thin to breathe. After the first flare, the techs installed a full air system so I could still use the car. It's the fastest, easiest way from the equator to the docking zone and the tech sec. Where I met you. The engineers yanked the compressor and hooked up some air tanks and a carbon dioxide scrubber. What happened exactly? Lando asked. The first flare was about 30 or 40 standard days ago, Sunson said, her voice suddenly sad and tired. Up until then, everything you see here now was parkland, or farmland, or luxury estates. It was beautiful to see. The glow point would shine down constantly. The farmers would use shadow shields to block the light and simulate seasons. From the inside of the shields, it could be as light or as dark as you liked, just by twisting a dial. From the outside, the shield could look like shadows, or like silver bubbles, or squares of gold however you wanted to set them. People decorated their shields all sorts of ways. There was a special feeling, knowing it was always day here but that under every spot of gold was a secret little patch of night. All of it gone now gone. Gone when the flare hit. That was before the jamming started. I came into the system about that time. Kalenda objected. I never heard anything about this. 
It should have been big news. The biggest. We tried to keep it as quiet as we could, Sonson said. The Fed dubbed government was weak enough as it was. And what terrorists want most is publicity. The Feds were afraid that if this got out, it could spark a panic or even a rebellion here. And I guess they were right. We could keep news of this. She gestured toward the devastation out the window dash. From getting to the other worlds, but the refugees all had to go to Talus and Trellis. The word spread, and we got our rebellions all right. One on Talus, two on Trellis. One group or the other I don't even know which landed a bunch of fighters somewhere on the South Pole a while back, claimed the station for themselves. Sunson shrugged. What was I going to do? Fight them off by myself? I left them alone, and they did the same to me until you chased them off. What do you mean by yourself? Gariel asked. Are you the only one still on the station? Sunson shook her head. Probably not. It's a big place. We tried to evac everyone, but my guess is someone got left behind. I haven't seen anybody, but that doesn't mean anything. You keep talking about the first flare. Lando asked. How many more were there? Just one more. Two in all. The second happened just about a day or so before the interdiction field and the communications jamming Karnan. And don't ask me what the point of a terrorist attack is when there's no one left to terrorize, and there's nothing left to burn. Uh-huh, Lando said, a bit distractedly. This station is exactly at the center point, the bare center between Talus and Trellis, right? Right. Sunson said, giving Lando another strange look. Were you people briefed at all? I knew that much, Lando said. I just wanted to confirm it. The glow point. It's at the exact center of Holyotown? And Hollowtown is at the exact center of the station? It might be off by a centimeter or two. Feel free to get a measuring stick and cheek if you want. Lando ignored Sanson's sarcasm. He pointed out across the huge spherical space, toward the far side of the rotation axis, and then tilted his head back to look through the overhead viewport. Those conical structures coming up out of the north and south poles, right on the rotation axis. What can you tell me about them? Luke looked through the overhead viewport, and then through the forward view. Up until just a moment ago, they had been too close to one cluster of cones to see it clearly, and the other had been lost in the glare of the glow point. But Lando seemed to have spotted them in the moment they became visible. Almost as if he had expected to see them. The two clusters seemed to be identical, a larger central cone surrounded by what looked to be six smaller cones, all with similar proportions of height to width. Sunson shrugged, a bit theatrically. I can tell you that one set is called the South Conical Mountains, and the other is called the North Conicals. I'll let you figure out which is which. People tried to climb them once in a while, but even in the near-zero-G zone at the spin axis, it isn't easy. Anything else of vital interest you need to know? Like the names of the boats in the bottom of the lake bed? No said Lando, his mind clearly somewhere else. I think that's all I need to know. Great, said Sunson. Sometime I'll have to spend five minutes learning everything important about your homeworld. Hmm? What? No, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. I mean, I think I know enough to understand what's going on. After five minutes? No offense, but our ITA people have been trying for just a bit longer, and we haven't worked it out yet. Ida? Luke asked. I believe in this context, 
The references to intelligence and technical assessment. 3PO said in a helpful tone of voice. I'm sure you've got good people, Lando said, and I didn't mean to sound rude or condescending. It's just a question of viewpoint. You've been seeing this thing from the inside out your whole life. I happen to be in a position to see it from the outside and dash. Just at that moment, are to let off a low, unsettled-sounding whistle. His view lens swiveled up to take in an overhead view, and then he turned to 3PO and let off a series of beeps and whistles that were too fast for Luke to follow. Very well, R2, I will inquire. I huck it is very rude of you to interrupt. 3PO turned toward Gen ICA Sunson. Pardon the intrusion, Administrator Sunson, but my counterpart wishes to know, rather urgently, if the two previous glow point flare events started suddenly, or if there was a gradual increase in the sight source's brightness. It was plain that Sunson was less and less sure of this crowd of visitors with every moment that passed. Interesting droids you've got. She said to no one in particular. As best we're able to tell, the brightness came up gradually, over the course of about half an hour. We don't know for sure because no one who was in here to see it got out alive and of course all the recording instruments were destroyed as well. Artur rocked back and forth on his roller legs and whistled urgently, his head whirling back and forth. Oh dear, 3PO said. I quite agree. We must depart at once. What? Lando asked. Why? What's going on? 3PO turned stiffly toward Luke and stared at him in surprise. You have not noticed? Oh. Of course. My apologies. Your eyes compensate so automatically that you are unaware of the change in interesting demonstration of the difference in our perceptions. Lando glared at the protocol droid. 3PO, he said in an artificially calm voice, if the next words from you are not an explanation of the problem, I am going to power you down right now and permanently disable your speech center. What is the problem? 3PO seemed about to protest, then thought better of it. It is, quite simply, Captain Kalrishan, that the visible light output from the glow point has increased 6% in the last five minutes. Anakin. Jason could fed his little brother nearby, and he knew perfectly well that Anakin could sense Jason's presence. But all the knowing back and forth in the world, all the ability to zero in on each other's location, did not do much good in the current situation. For Jason could also sense that Anakin was scared and feeling guilty, feeling sorry for what he had done. It was a wonderful paradox, in a sense. If there was ever a kid in the history of the galaxy who deceived to be in trouble, it was Anakin Solo, now, today. After all, they had been trying to keep this place hidden. Anakin couldn't have made it more visible if he had tried. But the sheer magnitude of what he had done made it all but impossible to hold him responsible. Anakin couldn't possibly have understood what he was doing, or he never would have done it. He was just a little boy who liked to play with machines. Jason thought back to a few incidents in his own life when his parents had let him off easier than they might have. Nothing this big, of course, but the point was the same. Jason had always thought those had been times he had gotten off easy, gotten lucky. Now he was not so sure. Maybe it hadn't been him being lucky, but his parents being understanding. Anakin. It's all right. Nobody's mad at you. Well, Chewbacca wasn't exactly thrilled with him, and Aunt Marco wasn't all that pleased with him for getting her. Hovercar vaporized or getting her head cut open. If and when they ever got Q9X2 working again, he was not likely to express his gratitude for what Anakin had done. But no one was mad. Not exactly. Come on out. 
Jason knew perfectly well it was no good chasing Anakin or going in after him. He would just run away. Hide again. Jason would have to get him to come out on his own. I want to stay here. Anakin called out. That was, strangely enough, a good first step. Jason knew his brother well enough to know he was asking to be talked out of what he had just said. Come on, Anakin, Jason said. You can't stay there forever, Slash. Can so? But it's getting dark. For reasons best known to the beings who had built this place, the steady, perfect illumination the chamber had produced from out of nowhere when it was cone-shaped wasn't there anymore now that it was open to the sky. And night was coming on. What about food? Jason went on. Aren't you hungry? Well, maybe a little. Maybe a lot, Jason said. Tell you what. Why don't you come get something to eat, and then if you want to go back to hiding, you can. The suggestion made no sense at all, of course, but that was all right. It gave Anakin a way to save face, a way to back down. There was a long silence and that was a good sign too. Anakin was thinking about it. Jason waited for a minute and then gave it another try. Anakin? Come on back to the camp to the ship and have some food. He couldn't really invite him to the camp. There wasn't much of a camp left. Everything that hadn't been inside the Falcon had been burned to a crisp. Can I really come back and hide later if I want to? Anakin asked. All you want, Jason promised, knowing how easy it would be to keep that promise. After all, Anakin hadn't needed permission to run away and hide the first slime. He wouldn't need it the next time, Sither, assuming they didn't pull a round-the-clock guard on him, or lock him up and weld the hatch shut and Jason wouldn't put it past Anakin to manage an escape even with a guard and a locked door. Well, all right. Wait a second. After a moment Anakin appeared at the entrance to the corridor. He paused there and looked toward his big brother. It's all right, Anakin, really. Of course, though it was very little that was all right, but Anakin knew what Jason meant. Anakin came forward, slowly at first, then suddenly he was running as fast as he could. He threw his arms around Jason, and Jason hugged him back. I'm sorry. Jason. I didn't mean to do anything bad. Honest. I know, I know. But what you mean to do really doesn't count so much, sometimes. It's what happens that matters. Jason could almost hear his father telling him the same thing. Suddenly he found himself thinking not of what his father or mother would do but about them. They were probably in trouble too, out there somewhere. The last any of them knew about their parents was that they had remained behind, trapped in Corona House, when Chewbacca had gotten the three children, Q9, and Ebrahim out. Were they still there? Or had Dad's cousin Thracken locked them up someplace else? Or had they gotten away? Somehow Dadai Jason suddenly felt a wave of guilt pass over him. Why hadn't he worried about them more, thought about them more? I miss mom and dad, Anakin announced, with his face mashed up against Jason's shoulder, his voice a little muffled and a little snuffly. Jason was surprised to hear his brother say that just then. It would seem Anakin's mind worked a bit more. Like Jason's than Jason had thought. So do I. Jack said. So do I. Come on. Let's go back to the others. I. The two boys walked hand in hand toward the center of the massive chamber. Anakin slowly settled down enough to take an interest in his surroundings. He looked up toward where the top of the conical chamber had been, toward where the sky was now. Boy, he said. Things have really changed. Yeah, agreed Jason. They sure have. He looked up himself and was astonished all over again by the sight. The sky was getting dark, and so was the interior of the chamber, 
but the silvery surface did a good job of reflecting what light there was. It was probably just about sunset, but there was no real way to know. All they could see was a perfectly circular patch of dark sky, exactly overhead, right at the zenith, with the gleaming shadows of the seven silver cones stabbing into the edge of that perfect circle of night. Jason could see stars starting to peek through, here and there. They walked on, toward the falcon, moving a bit more carefully as they picked their way through the heaps of burnt-up belongings. Everything that had been outside the ship was reduced to melted puddles and to ashes. Jason and Anakin paused again to get a look at the falcon. The ship's broken again, Anakin said. It was not a question. Uh-huh. It looks like all the propulsion systems blew out before Chewbacca could get the shields up. Anakin nodded slowly. That isn't good, he said. Jason looked straight up, at the top of the cylinder, something like a kilometer or two over their heads. Unless Chewbacca could get the ship running, or unless someone could figure a way to walk straight up the side of the smooth, slick, sheer, impenetrable walls. They were stuck down here. It sure isn't. Jack agreed. Come on, he said. He almost told Anakin they were all wailing for him. But then it occurred to him that would not exactly encourage his brother to step lively. Let's go in. The Duchess Marka of Mastigafra sal in the lounge of the Millennium Falcon, feeling downright gloomy. The company was not enlivening. Her nephew, Ebrahim, was playing a dispirited game of sabak with Jaina. The fact Ty Jaina had lost several hands showed just how low her spirals were. Q9, or wall was left of him, was propped up against the Aichi far bulkhead of the compartment. He reminded Marka all too closely O.T. a mummified corpse no one had golden around low burying. She herself had a pounding headache, though she knew that she could count herself lucky to have no more serious complainals than that. It was a miracle that none of them had been killed. Well, maybe Q9 had been killed. At least Chewbacca had not been able to revive him. Of course, it might not matter that much who was alive and who was dead right now. They were trapped here, and most of their rations had been outside the Falcon, either stored on the hover car or else in storage crates that had been stacked outside IHC spacecraft to make room. The Falcon? Emergency stores would lazzle for a while, but not forever. Marcus Bessel guess, which she had not shared with anyone, was that they had perhaps enough water for six days and enough food for ten. And they might well be lucky if they were alive long enough to worry about such things. She agreed with Chewbacca that it was all bull certain that the Repulsor's violent awakening had wiped out the Dralists, and good riddance, but there was bound to be someone who had been far enough away to survive the disturbance and had noticed it. She saw two possibilities. Perhaps draw scientists would notice the seismic convulsions, or the electrical disturbances or whatever, and come take a look. However, Ty seemed a trifle improbable, as there was, after all, a war on, most public institutions had been shut down, and there were massive travel restrictions in effect. Unpleasant as it might be to concede the point, it seemed far more likely that a military group of some sort, equipped to detect repulsion activity, would have seen a burst of repulsive power bright enough to blow out their detector screens and corn to investigate. It seemed most unlikely that it would be anyone pleasant who arrived under those circumstances. And leaving behind the trifling problem of the sort of thing most of the military groups in the system were likely to do to captured enemy civilians, there was the question of what they could do with the planetary repulsor, once it was in their possession. Lots of unsavory people had been looking for the things for a long time. Marka did not know what they hoped to do with the repulsor, but she doubted it would be anything good. Age she knew was that the enemy regarded the repulsors as vitally, urgently important. It was not beyond the realm of possibility that by handing this one over to the enemy, Anakin had lost the entire war, single-handed. 
But these opinions, too, she kept to herself. Things were bad enough already, and there was no sense making them worse right now, when they would no doubt deteriorate on their own in due course. Their one hope seemed to be that Chewbacca Cout get the Falcon's propulsion systems working again. The Wookiee was working on the problem now, rooting around in all the access panels, knee-deep in cables and burned-out parts. She could hear him from here, banging and thudding about. He was doing his best, no doubt, but Marka had strong doubts that he would succeed. It seemed likely that what had knocked them out was the initial massive burst of repulsive power so strong that it had managed to jump across open circuits. In all likelihood, a similar electromagnetic pulse had blown out Q9. No, the situation was not good. Not one little bit good. And it seemed unlikely to do anything but get. Worse. She heard the sound of footsteps coming up the Falcon's entry ramp and looked up in time to see Jason and Anakin come into the lounge. Ibrahim and Jaina looked up as well. It would seem that Chewbacca heard them also, as he appeared in the door and stood there a moment or two after the two boys came in. Hi everyone, Anakin said. I'm back. I'm I am real sorry for what I did. I didn't mean to hurt anything but I did. I'm sorry. A miracle of understatement. That way the child had done might well have condemned millions to a life under tyranny. Marka could even at least imagine a scenario where loss of the repulsor meant loss of the war for the New Republic, so damaging the New Republic's prestige that it collapsed altogether. Quite a lot to put on one small child's shoulders. It'll be all right, Anakin. Jaina said. We'll find a way to fix it all. Don't you worry. Marka exchanged a glance with her nephew, and then with the Wookiee. Clearly either of them was in any more of a mood for empty platitudes than she was. But sometimes platitudes were all one had left. And there were times when a completely unreasoned, and unreasonable, expression of optimism was absolutely necessary. Of course it will be all right. She heard herself saying as she stood up and moved a step or two toward him. Corn here, Anakin. Suddenly the child burst into tears, rushed over to her, and flung his arms around her. There, there. Carrot, she said, putting her arms around him. There, there. If she had known, exactly, what she meant by the comforting words, she might have found them comforting herself. Chapter 7 Seeing the Light I suppose I won't make the answer if I ask you if this thing can go any faster, said Lando. The Turbo Vader car continued its stately descent down to the equator line of Holyotown and the nearest way out. The glow point had started brightening when they were just about at the midpoint of their descent. Jenica Sorison shook her head. No, you wouldn't like the answer. She said. I had a feeling you'd say that. Lando looked up through the Turbovator car's overhead viewport. The glow point was dazzlingly bright, but the question was, how much brighter and how fast was it brightening? Could he judge it any better by looking at the ground, at the reflected light, rather than at the source? He peered intimately at the ground for a moment, then gave it up. 3PO, annoyingly enough, had been right for once. The human eye was just too good at adjusting for changes in brightness. There was no way he could make an eyeball estimate of how fast it was getting worse. He could ask 3PO, of course, but even in the midst of this crisis, there was a part of him that didn't want to give the droid the satisfaction. Besides, Golden Boy would probably just start giving a running report of brightness levels and drive them all crazy. I'd say we're up to a 20% brightness increase. Luke announced. Of course. With his Jedi. Control over his senses, he would be able to make that sort of estimate. But the brightness isn't all of it. As we go lower, we're going to get into thicker air that can hold a lot of heat. Luke turned to Sunson. How high a temperature can this car take? He asked. 
Sunson shrugged. How should I know? I doubt if anyone ever bothered to figure it out. It's a glorified elevator, not a spacecraft. But it's definitely getting hot in here. There is indeed a significant temperature rise already, said 3PO. If you wish, I could gladly provide you with a running account of Dash. No, we would not wish, Lando said. There's nothing we can do about it anyway. He held the palm of his hand flat over the interior wall of the elevator car, and then, very gingerly, touched it with just the tip of his index finger. The skin of this thing is getting warmer though, and the heat is percolating through. No doubt about it. How long until we're out of here? Kalenda asked. Another five minutes or so, Sunson said. But there's a flaw. What flaw? Lando asked. This place was clearly bad news. There's a pressure differential between the equatorial region of Hollowtown and Shell One on the other side of the lock. No big deal, maybe an 8% differential, but it's enough that you have to use an airlock. The main Turhavator airlock jammed up during the second flare. It was never meant to do more than match the slight pressure differential between Hollowtown and Shell One. I managed to get it working again after the flare, but it wasn't easy, and I'm not so sure my repair is going to hold up. So we're stuck, Lando said. Heavens! We'll all be roasted alive, 3PO said. You speak when you're spoken to, Sunson said, obviously starting to share Lando's opinion of the protocol droid. We're not stuck, she said to the others. There's a personnel lock right next to the Turhavator airlock. It's smaller and simpler, and it got a lot more use, so it's a real heavy-duty job. I'm sure it'll still be working. If we can't get the Turbovator lock running, we'll have to make a run for the personnel lock. But you did happen to Manlion there's no oxygen left out there. Luke said. Even if there were any oxygen left, it would probably kill you to breathe out there. Very high COA levels, plus all sorts of toxic burn products. Can we all make it into the lock at once? Luke asked. Well, the lock is big enough, said Sunson. I don't think we should try all of us at once. The lock is normally say with the side closed. There's a control panel on the side of the lock and it has to be operated by hand. I'll have to open the Lerbovaler door, run for the lock, and get it open. I don't think it would be so smart to have everyone waiting on me getting the door open. We should do it in two passes. This is going to be interesting, Lando said. Sunson smiled humorlessly. So it will. But we might get lucky. Maybe the Turbovator airlock will work. Maybe it will. But if it doesn't, and you have to run for the other airlock, I'll go with you. I used to run a place called Cloud City. I had to go in and out of toxic atmosphere a lot. If you run into trouble, it might be smart to have some help along. Lando, if anyone should go with her, it should be me. Luke said. No, Lando said. Your Jedi powers give you the best endurance. We might all need your help. You'll have to watch everybody. All I want to have to worry about is Sunson and that airlock. Luke seemed about to protest, but then nodded reluctantly. Maybe you're right, he said. And the bad air won't bother the droids. That'll be some help. It's not as if Kalenda and I are helpless or anything, Gariel said. No, ma'am, and I didn't mean to imply that you were, Lando said. But we don't have time to do this politely. The fact of the matter is Sunson has to go because she knows the lock. Someone should go with her. I'm no hero, but someone who's had toxic air training is the best choice to go with her. That makes it me. And for what it is worth, next to Luke, we're all helpless. 
and I might add that Lieutenant Calcutta doesn't seem to be protesting the arrangement. Gary O'Captison looked from Lando to Kalenda's expressionless face. All right, she said. I was in politics long enough to know when it's time to back off. We're getting lower, Luke said. And the heating is starting to move some serious air. Lando looked out the window. Luke was right. The lower, thicker layers of air were heating at a different rate than the upper, thinner layers. Hot and cold air at different air pressures was a recipe for weather in any circumstance, but especially in a spinning, inside-out world with a gravity gradient. Dust devils were spinning up everywhere, miniature tornadoes, funnel clouds spewing just and debris up into the air. The wind began to howl as the car moved lower and lower, into the nightmare dust storms popping up everywhere. A wall of gritty dust enveloped the car, cutting off the view as the wind peppered the car with thousands of small impacts that clicked and clattered on its exterior. It seemed as if the winds abruptly reversed direction, and the outside world reappeared as suddenly as it had vanished. They seemed to have crossed under some sort of cloud deck. The car was moving along the inner wall of the spinning sphere, from the spin axis toward the equatorial regions in a long, swooping curve. By now the car was moving forward as much as it was down, and the increase in apparent weight was more and more noticeable with every moment. Lando realized his eyes had made a subconscious adjustment, deciding Ty the car was no longer proceeding down the side of a cliff, but down a long hill that was getting less and less sleep while every moment. Some son of Tiltal mechanism kept the Leor even as the car moved down, he track. Close now, Sunson said. We should start slowing in a minute. As it on cue. Tree car began I zero decelerate smoothly. Lando reached out a hand Io steady himself against the wall of the car, but he thought better of it at the last moment. Tick held his hand a centimeter or two back from the wall and tell plenty of heat that way. The car slowed even further, until it was barely moving, maybe 25 centimeters a second. The swirling clouds cleared again for a moment, and revealed a large two-story building directly ahead. That's my main entrance complex for Ihe's seizure, said Sunson. The turbovator's track led to a large cell of pressure doors, the sort lat split down the middle, will the two have sliding apart to either side. So let's see what happens, she said. To let the automatics try it first. The car eased to a complete halt a meter or two in front of the doors, and then nothing happened, or a moment. Is it broken? Gary asked. It just lakes a little lime for the pump's I zero match pressure. Here we go. The pressure doors started to move apart smoothly enough but then jammed up when they were only about a meter apart. Blast it, Sunson said. Exactly what they did before. Let me try cycling them on manual and see if I get lucky. She went to the panel by the car's door and twisted a dial that was pointing to a Lero over to manual OVR ride. She pressed another button marked open hollow town side airlock doors. The doors strained a bit, but didn't move any farther apart. She pushed the closed doors button and the doors moved all of three centimeters back toward each other before grinding to. A halt. Sansk ran through the whole procedure again, but the doors refused to move more than that three centimeters back and forth. Ties that, she said. They won't open far enough to get the car in. And they won't shut at all. The inner doors won't open at all unless the outers are shut. No emergency override on that? Lando asked. No way to force inner doors open if the outer ones are jammed? Nope, Sunson said. Why bother, when there was supposed to be breathable air on both sides of the lock, and there's another airlock ten meters away? I keep telling you people. This is a fancy elevator, not a spacecraft system. All right then, said Lando. Looks like we get out and walk. 
time to do a little getting ready. He pulled his blouse off, pulled out his vibro shiv, and started slicing the blouse into ribbons. He saved one larger wad of cloth and stuffed it in his pocket, along with the knife. Wrap one of, he's around your mouth and nose, he said. If you pass out, or your breathing reflex gets the better of you, a little cloth might lilt out the worst of it. And if you have to breathe, if you can't stop yourself, do it through your nose. It does a much better job of cooling and filtering than your mouth. Let's hope the personnel airlock opens so fast that you've lost your shirt torn nothing, Sunson said. Lando grinned. It breaks my heart to mess up our NY wardrobe when I don't need to, he said. But I think... Could deal with it just this once. Lando wrapped a strip of cloth around his own mouth. Where's the other airlock? Lando asked, his voice a bit muffled by the cloth. You can't quite see it from here, Sunson said. The window is too small. But it's about ten meters to the left of the main airlock. It should be matched to pressure on the other side, but it shouldn't take long at all to match dash. Sunson stopped talking and looked up at the ceiling of the car, where the air tanks were hanging. Match pressure, she said. Wail a second. I just got an idea. We've got air tanks up there. If we dump the air into the car here, we could get air pressure higher than the outside. Then when we open the door, our air would push out, in lead of the bad air pushing in. And we'd have a pressure curtain, said Lando. Good idea. Then the second group could close the doors after we go, and maybe still have some air to breathe. Boost me up there, Sanskin said. Luke knelt down and made a slurp out of his hands. Sanskin put her hands on his shoulders to balance herself and stepped into his hands. Okay, she said, up. Luke stood up as easily as if there was no weight on him at all. Whoa, Sunson said. Captain Kirishin, your friend and strong. Sleddy now. A little to the right, no, my right, your left. Back a bit. Okay, good. Sunson reached for the pressure regulator and touched it gingerly. Definitely getting hot, she said, but not quite hot enough to burn. Not yet. I would suggest hurrying, 3PO said. The glopinol has now increased its brightness by 35%. How about we leave that droid behind when we go? Sunson said as she cranked the regulator up as high as it would go. A loud hissing started almost at once. Lando worked his jaw and felt his ears pop. You've got my vote, he said. I've Lien trying to leave him behind for years. Forget it, both of you, Luke said. I've been through a lot with 3PO. All right, said Sunson. That should do it. Lay me down. Luke lowered her to the ground. Okay, said Lando. Administrator Sanson Jen, I see what's the plan, exactly? I'm going to open the door here, she said. When I do, we should let a good-sized blast of our air out, and that'll at least slow down the bad air coming in. Lando and I will get out as fast as we can and run to Aichi other lock. You, she pointed at Gary Dash. As soon as we are out the door, close it again, by pressing this button here. Okay? Okay. Once the door is shut, the regulator will come back on and pump and clean canned air, but there is still going to bow a lot of that junk out there in the mix. But no matter how bad the air gets in here, breathe it. It's only going to be worse outside. So breathe as best you can once that door is shut. Give us three minutes no more, no less and then pop the door again I'd come running. That will give us time to get through the lock ourselves, get to the other side, and then cycle the lock so the outer door is open. Get into the backslash ockfast. 
If the droids can get there with you without slowing you up, great. If not, leave them on this side, and we'll cycle the lock again for them once you're through. They don't have to worry about breathing. Got I.O.? Got it, Luke said. We'll be left behind for sure. Threkbio said in his most theatrical tones, and even Arto let out a sort of low moan. Lando paid them no mind. Not when this whole Hollowtown place was about to get burned to another crisp. If only that were the worst of it. If the glow points flaring again meant what he thought it did, a little thing like five people and two droids being roasted alive wasn't going to matter much at all. Okay, Lando said. Tie your aloths over your mouth and nose, and then let's do one more thing that might help us get through this in one piece. We need to get as much oxygen into the bloodstream and lungs as possible before we go out there. The high pressure will help, but we need to do more. Everybody, start breathing in rapid, shallow breaths. I'll help you hold your breath a little bien longer when the line comes. Lando followed his own advice and started to breathe in fast, shallow, panting breaths. Not the healthiest thing to do for long, bullet would help get him through the next few minutes. He looked out IHC viewport at the swirling clouds of murky ash, and Sudami shook his head. Don't breathe this stuff at all, he said around his panting breaths. If Nifiel had all IHE oxygen you needed, that crud would probably burn a hole in your lungs. Lando started to follow and kept up his rapid, shallow breathing until he started to feel just this side of lightheaded. He only hoped he was remembering all Aichi procedures properly. All right, he said, R2, you time it. Come after us in three minutes. Let's do it. Sunson tied her own cloth over her mouth and nose, looked around to make sure everyone else had done the same, and then hit the door open button. The air blew out of the turbovator car with terrifying speed, and then a blast furnace wall of air rushed in pulling a stream of noxious deucey and smoke and soot with it. Sunson dove Eero the Dewey. And Lando followed a fire, already half-blinded by the slinging. Burning fumes tie war everywhere. There had been nothing they could do about eye protection. Where the devil was Sunson? Had he lost her already I? The air if you could call it air screamed past an Aichi howling wind and cleared the view for just a moment. He spotted her, through watering eyes, heading toward the building. The heel was nearly as bad as the poisoned air and the dust. Already the sweat was streaming out of his body, dripping down his brow, getting into his eyes, making it that much harder to see. He resisted the urge to wipe his brow and the urge to breathe. Amazing how fast you wanted to start again once you stopped. Never mind. Sansk Jenica was at the airlock, trying to work the very old-fashioned looking controls but the metal buttons and knobs were already too hot to touch. Lando pulled the torn-up piece of cloth out of his pocket being careful to keep his vibroshiv from falling out and handed it to her. She nodded gratefully, now wasting breath on words, and wrapped the cloth around her hand. She threw back the spill lever, equalizing pressure between the interior of the lock and the outside. It would seem the pressure was higher on the outside, judging by the column of smoke and soot that got sucked into the lock. Jenica threw back a big lever and the door swung out and open. She waved her arm vigorously, urging Lando in and he needed no urging. It was a big lock compartment, capable of handling 20 or 30 people at once. That wasn't good. The bigger the lock, the more air there would be to move and the longer it would take. The dust and smoke swirled around in the wretched air as Lando stumbled into the oven-hot interior of the lock and suddenly realized that Jenica was not with him. He turned around to find her slumped over by the lock entrance, face down on the ground, coughing and retching. His own lungs feeling as if they were about to burst, Lando forced himself to go back outside after her. He grabbed her under the arms and dragged her in 
wishing mightily for enough breath to curse the too high gravity here in the equatorial regions of Centerpoint Station. Half blinded by the caustic chemicals burning his eyes, Lando hauled Jenica Sunson into the lock. He was about to let her slump down onto the deck when he realized just how hot that metal deck had to be by now. He threw her left arm over his shoulder and held her up as he searched frantically for the inside lock. Controls She managed to take a bit of her weight on her own feet. Coughing horribly, she pointed an unsteady finger over to one corner of the lock. Lando looked in the direction she was pointing. There. He dragged himself over, Jenica still draped over him, and pulled the closed lock lever, burning his hand in the process. The metal was hot and getting hotter. It seemed to take forever for the door to swing back shut. He had his finger jammed down on the air pump button almost before the door latches had closed, but the automatics cut in at once anyway now pumping in good air. But dumping the bad stuff out into the other side of the lock. Show one, Junia had called it. The air pumps whirred busily, stirring the ashes and stood up into a new blinding cloud of dust. Lando's lungs were screaming for air, demanding that he breathe immediately. He felt as if he were about to pass O.M. But he knew he did not dare. If he tainted, his reflexes would start him breathing again and that would probably kill him. The pressure equality slash dot CD. And the far lock door opened. The air outside was far colder than the stuff in the lock, and the temperature difference was enough to make up a sharp little gust of wind as the hot bad air expanded out into shell one and good cool air swept into the lock chamber. Lando let go of El Jenica and dropped to his knees. He barely noticed Aichi burning heat oil the deck as he gasped for, year. Coughing, gagging, in's lungs heaving. He pulled the cloth away from his mouth and coughed harder, spitting out Aichi horrid slime that seemed to have gotten into his mouth, even if he hadn't been breathing time mess. Out, he said, his voice little more than a weak creaking noise. We need get out set lock lore others. Jenica had collapsed next to him. She nodded, unable to speak even that much. They helped each other to their feet and staggered out of the locked chamber. The air here was a swirling mass of dreadful, sulfurous smoke but there was air there too, good air. They could not breathe easily just yet, not until the dust and smoke dispersed. But at least they could breathe. Jenica went to the shell one side control panel and pulled the old-fashioned lever to swing the interior door shut. Hold it! Lando shouted. He had spotted something. There was a rack of emergency equipment by the locked door including two smally tanks of oxygen with breathing masks. Lando grabbed one, twisted the valve to starry the oxygen flowing, and threw it into the lock. Most or maybe all of the oxygen would go to waste, of course but it didn't matter. Even at full flow, a bottle that size would last 10 or 15 minutes before it went empty. But maybe just enough oxy would blow around to do some good. Or maybe if they were all blinded by the fumes, someone would still hear the hissing noise, and someone would find the mask and put it to his or her face. The door swung to, Jenica pulled the lever to open the hollow town side door, and that was that. She turned around and slumped down on the floor with her back to the wall. Lando grabbed the other oxy tank and sat down on the floor facing her. He opened the flow valve and handed her the tank. Jenica put the breather mask to her face and breathed in deeply and was subdued by another wave of racking coughs. She tried it again, with better success. Yup, she said. I didn't mean to breathe any of that stuff but something must have gotten in. She handed the tank to Lando. He put the mask to his face and breathed in deeply. The cool, alien oxygen felt wonderfully pure and sweet. Is there anything else we can do to help them in? He asked. She shook her head. Not really. 
There's a viewport in the airlock here. The safeties won't let me open both doors at once, but I might be able to set things to pop open the hatch on this side before the chamber repressurizes. That might get Em in here a little faster. Ties about all. It had taken all of 90 seconds to get them in here. Ama slash ing how much longer than that it felt. But if there was company coming, they had best get ready. Lando took another deep breath off the oxy tank and handed it back to Jenica. Come on, he said. Let's get the lock set so you can pop the inner door early. Yeah. We better. I have a nasty feeling your tryons might have it a little rougher than we did. Jenica stood up and rubbed her face. Her hand eam away even dirtier than it had been. Burning stars, but I must be a mess. You did look belter before, Lando said with a smile. Your face has about a centimeter of dust on it. Oh, a little soap and water will fix that, she said. But I don't even want to think what this has done to MV Hare. Luke Skywalker watched R2 intently, waiting for the three minutes low be up. Me forced himself to calmness, to clarity, dot Letty were now impatient. Except sometimes. This situation was gelling out of hand. The temperature in the car had jumped dramatically when the outside air had come in. All of them were sweating profusely. And all of them, even Aichi Griel Jedi Master himself, were having trouble breathing. Kalenda coughed again and swore under her brow what little breath she had. How much longer? She asked. Either the smoke or the cloth over her mouth made her voice seem a bit murky, a bit throaty. About an all her thirty seconds. I think, Luke said. Let's get ready. Both of you out before me so I can keep an eye on you, he said. Gariel seemed about to protest, but Luke called her off. It's no time to be modest, he said. My Jedi powers give me an edge you two won't have. If they didn't, I've wasted my time with all that training for all these years. R2, 3PO, you come after me. You watch me. Watch all of us. We might need your help, but maybe we can move faster than you two can. If we get there first, we're going to have to leave you on this side of the lock, but we'll cycle the lock again as soon as we're through. All right. R2 whistled and beeped and swung his head back and forth. I quite agree with R2, 3PO said. We might be immune to the poisonous atmosphere. Hut the corrosive airborne chemicals and the rising temperatures could easily do us harm. Please do not delay in getting us. I won't, Luke said. I promise. 3PO nodded happily. I am glad to hear it, he said. Apparently the word of a Jedi Master was good enough even for a protocol droid. Kalenda Gariel, are you ready? I. No, not really said Gakrikal, coughing just a bit. But I doubt I ever will be ready for, his sort of thing. Let's go. Kalenda nodded and let it go at that. Here we go, Luke said and hit the button. A new blast of burning hot air struck at them as the door opened. The winds were blowing more and more fiercely as the glow point dumped more and more energy into the system. Gariel stepped out into the storm and was nearly blown off her feet before Kalenda could grab at her. Luke stepped out into it and was nearly bowled over himself. The heat was incredible, and the noxious gases seemed to eat into his skin, his eyes. For a Jedi there is no pain, Luke lulled himself. There is awareness. There is calm. The three humans stepped around the side of the turbovator car and discovered they had been in the lee of the wind. The full force of the corrosive gale blasted straight into their faces, utterly blinding them, forcing them to jam their eyes shut. The wind carried fine-grained sand, and that slammed into them as well. 
Luke got one fleeting moment of good visibility before IHE roaring wall of dust and cinders enveloped them. One moment, when he saw where the airlock hatch was and saw that it was swinging open for them. That one moment would have to be enough it would be worse than useless to open his eyes in this storm. Not only would he he unable low see his eyes would be destroyed. He would have to do it by dead reckoning and drag the others with him. He reached out with the force and found Kalenda and Gariel hand in hand, just a meter or two ahead of him. They were headed in the wrong direction. They must have been turned around by the wind already. Luke lunged forward into the wind and, using the force to guide him, grabbed Kalenda by the hand and yanked hard in the proper direction. Kalenda came willingly enough, and Luke could feel Gariel in the force, feel her hesitate a moment, and then follow along as well. Luke became aware of a burning sense in his chest. Air. He needed air. And if he felt the urgent need to breathe, the others must be in an agony to do so. Closer. Closer. In his mind's eye, he could see the hatch. He knew, with all the power and precision of his Jedi senses, exactly where it was. But Tide did not get him there any faster did not give him the power to move effortlessly against this deadly wind. There. They were there. He still did not dare open his eyes, but he knew they were at the entrance to the lock. He pulled Kalenda forward, pushed her in ahead of him, and shoved Gakrikal in as well before stepping in himself and running smack into something metal, something hard and angular and tall. He suddenly realized it was Thripio. It would seem Arthur and I got here before you after all. Master Luke. Three PO shouted over the howl of the sandstorm. A droid could speak in this mess without wasting air or getting sand. Three his mouth. Luke couldn't, and he settled for a nod instead. Luke nodded and moved farther forward into the lock, out of the stinging wind. He wiped the worst of the dust from his eyes and risked opening them just in time to see the lock swinging shut. There was a sudden mark of orange from behind him. He turned around. Gariel and Kalenda were standing, eyes still shut, in about the midpoint of the lock chamber, holding to each other, coughing miserably. And Garisai's long flowing W, height dress was on fire, and Gariel did not know it yet. Luke lunged for her and threw his body on the blossoming flames trying to smother them. His tight suit was insulated and fireproof. He felt a brief bloom of heat on his chest, and that was all. The fire died. He stood back up and helped Gariel to her feet. A red-hot hit of debris, blown from someplace where things were hotter still, must have gotten itself lodged in the fabric of Gariel's dress. Are you all how could it burn, with no available oxygen? Luke heard a hissing noise from behind him and looked around. An oxygen mask? Lando and Kalenda had thrown an oxygen mask into the lock chamber, and Gariel had been standing right on top of it. Her dress must have trapped the oxygen. A million to one shot, but one that had almost killed Gariel. All of that flashed through his mind even as he was grabbing for the mask. He tore the cloth strip off her mouth, and put the oxy mask over her mouth and nose. Still half blinded, and probably still unaware of why Luke had knocked her over, she jerked away from the mask at first, until she realized what it was. Then she grabbed for it greedily, opened her mouth, and took in a deep, urgent breath. She started coughing almost instantly. Luke handed the mask to Kalenda, who took two deep breaths herself before handing it back to Luke. Luke pulled down his dust cloth, exhaled the last breath he had breathed in back in the turbovator car, and sucked in as much air as the mask had to give. He realized that he had been seeing spots before his eyes, there toward the end. Even Jedi Masters have to breathe, he told himself. He was just handing the mask on to Gariel when the inner door swung violently open, and the air in the lock blasted out into the chamber beyond in a lacy choking 
blinding but now harmless cloud of dust. They had made it. I was on fire. Gariel asked, looking down at the remains of her dress. Jinia had led them all to a small infirmary near the shell one side of the airlock. Everyone had cuts and bruises and scrapes and minor burns that needed attention of one sort or another. They all needed baths and clean clothes as well, but those could wait just a bit. I was on fire and I didn't know about it. A claim not many can make, Luke said laughing. I apologize for knocking you over. And Slash apologized for throwing that oxy mask in there, said Lando. Don't either of you apology, Slashy, Gariel said a bit tartly. She went over to the sink and started scrubbing her hands. The mask probably saved all our lives in there. I was near passing out, and if I had fainted and breathed in much more of that stuff than I did by accident well, at best I'd have been in here whitey something a lol worse than a sore throat. And I'd much rather have a bruised dignity than third-degree burns. I think we were all pretty lucky in there. Kalenda said in more serious tones as she sprayed some quick heel salve on Jenica's burned hand. The way the temperatures were rising, I don't think we'd have gotten out another live minutes later. What's it like in there now, Artu? Luke asked as Lando sprayed antiseptic solution into the sand burns on his feet. Ow. Oh. That stuff stings. Hold still, Lando said, dabbing ointment onto the worst of the burns. Almost done. Arta, who had plugged himself into a data port in the infirmary wall, squeaked and whistled and buzzed and beeped in an agitated fashion. Dear me, said Tripio. Things are rapidly getting worse in there. What did that in the thing say? For those of us who don't speak bird whistle. Jenica asked. Temperatures where we were ten minutes ago are up over the boiling point of water and headed higher. Said 3PO. The surviving detectors show hot spots closer to the glow point well over 500 degrees and there are probably temperatures much higher than that. Except the detectors are not there anymore to tell us. Not good. Said Lando. Not good at all. Jenica Sunson nodded her head. And it's also no terrorist attack. She said. Even twice didn't make a great deal of sense but three times? I think you're very wrong there. Lando said. Very wrong indeed. But I'm afraid your people here weren't the intended victims. I think you were more like innocent bystanders who got in the way. Jinia turned and looked sharply at Lando as she flexed the hand with the burn salve on it. Captain Kalrish and Lando, you said a few things earlier that made it sound like you had an idea what this was all about. Maybe now would be the right time to explain yourself. Lando let out a deep sigh. I think maybe you're right, he said. But no one's going to like it much. You might even be wrong, but on the other hand, it's all staring us in the face. What is? Luke asked. Centerpin, Lando said. Centerpoint is right in the middle of it all. Think about it. There are three big, impressive, inexplicable technologies at the middle of this crisis. The first, and the easiest to explain, is the system-wide jamming. Impressive. We all you really need for that is a whole lot of power. And where does the jamming come from? Centerpin, Jenica said. Without FedDub even knowing about it and we ran the place. Or at least you thought you did, Lando said. Second up is the interdiction field. Nothing incredible about it, beyond ILS size. But if you had a powerful enough gravitic generator you could do it. Where does it come from? Centerpin, Jenica said again. And from what you were asking about earlier, you thought it had something to do with the way we're right at the balance point of gravillic potential. Right. I have no idea how. But it seems to me that Centerpoint taps into the gravitic output of the double worlds. 
Now it seems someone has found a way to convert that power into an interdiction field. And the third unexplained technology? Luke asked. Lando looked straight at him. The Nova Maker, of course. The Star Bustler. We all wondered how it was done. We all wondered where the Star Buster was. I'm just about positive we're sealing in it right now. I think the glow point flare means it's Jussel about to go off again. Chapter 8 Meeting in Progress It was a lovely morning. The star corral was rising in the east. The lovely rolling hills and clean blue sky of Salonia were laid out before them. The Hunchuzik Den had put them up in a splendid hilltop villa, clearly purpose-built for the use of visiting human dignitaries. They had been comfortable and well cared for from the moment Mara Jade had set the Jade's fire down. I am tired of waiting. Drachmas, Han said. Patience, honored Solo. Waiting is not yet tired of you. Whatever that means slash Han growled. Have you ever given a straight answer in your life? What, exactly? Are you meaning by straight answer? Han Solo turned to his wife, who was sitting placidly at the breakfast table. You see what I've had to put up with? He asked. Drachmas had come to pay her morning call, as she did every day. And as he did every day, Han found himself wondering what the point of the visit was. Riddles. Incoherent riddles. Ties all I ever got. It's all we ever get. Take it easy, Han, Leia said. Pelioni is the hardest part of diplomacy. But mine has reached its limits, Han said. I'm afraid I agree with Han, Mara said. Things are moving too fazzle everywhere else for me to put up with waiting here any longer. I'm still not even sure why we are here, Ian said. Right from the moment you yanked me out of that cell, I haven't known for sure if I was your partner or your prisoner. Are we prisoners? Hostages, maybe? Or are we here to negotiate something? And if so, what? I'm afraid Ayal is not that simple, Dreamus said. To my people, these things partner, prisoner, hostage. Negotiator are not so separate from each other as they are with your folk. To my people, one might lie only one of these or all of them at once, or some of them hangingly over time. So which is it? Han asked, a very clear warning note in his voice. A note dream is plainly missed. It is not yet determined. You must understand that to my people consensus is being all. Ambiguity has much use for us. If the issue is uncertain, then the meeting can go on. For disagreement is more difficult if no one understands the problem lully. So is agreement, Han said. There are people with guns and ships out there who are shooting all our people. There is not much ambiguity out there. Please. Please. Drachmas said. Understanding your impatience, but what you ask is not our way. Hoy, my people. Traditions make lore an awfully handy set of excuses, Mara said. Every time I have ever dealt with a Sklonian who didn't want to do something, she's explained to me how tradition made it impossible, or the ways of her people caused it to be difficult to decide, or whatever excuse seemed handy. And my people always had to be respectful of your ways, and accept the structure of your culture. No more. This isn't some trade deal for luxury goods where you can leave us hanging for six months on the off chance that your convenient traditions will get us so frustrated that we give up and offer a better price. This is war. This is survival. There is no time. It is time for you to accept the ways of our culture before we are all wiped out. It is our way to speak plain, to speak true, to choose a course, and to follow it. Please, said Draconis, you must endure. 
Things are being complex. Take time to solve all. But there is no time, Mara said, putting a hard-edged emphasis on her words. We cannot take what no longer exists, and we have run out of time. Or rather, you have. I may be many things, but I will not be your prisoner. What is the meaning of your words? Drachmas asked. Inform whoever it is you should inform that I am leaving. Jan one hour. I am going to walk around to the landing pad on the other side of this villa. I am going to get aboard the Jade's Fire, and I am going to L. Y. away. My companions are welcome to join me if they wish, but I will be leaving in any evening. I would also remind you that Leia and I escaped from the Human League and flew the Jade's Fire off Corellia, while we were facing much heavier opposition than anything I have seen here so far. Besides which, as my ship is the one that brought the Chief of State of the New Republic to this planet, the case could be made that an attack on it constitutes an attack on the New Republic that you claim to recognize and support. In short, I would not suggest trying to stop me. You will not succeed, and I will not be responsible for any damage from the attempt. But, but... The only way to prevent my departure is to have our group meet with someone in authority. Someone who will provide clear answers to our questions, someone with the power to make decisions before that hour is up. If such a person does not appear, I will leave. And I'll be with her, said Han, and turned toward his wife. Leia looked troubled and angry, but she nodded. And so will I. Drachmas looked from one of them to the other. But, but. But you have one hour. Mara said. Vanish. Go make things happen. Drachmas looked positively frantic. I will be seeing what I can do. Please. Do not go. One hour. Mara said. Go. Move. Drachmas nodded, turned, dropped to all fours, and rushed away as fast as she could. If I didn't believe in the power of a united front, I would have refused to go along with you. Leia said, her voice testy. You did some damage, but it would have been worse if I had refused to play along. I'm a diplomat and you're not. You should have let me do the talking. I've been letting you do the talking, and all it's gotten us so far is an enforced vacation at this villa. I'm a businesswoman, a trader. Negotiation is my stock and trade. Do you call insulting our host negotiating? Negotiating is the art of getting what you want, Mara said. It's not the art of making the oilier side feel better. They aren't the other side. They're our partners. In this negotiation. If they were our partners, we wouldn't need to negotiate, Mara said smoothly. Han noticed something. Mara's sharp tone, her apparent anger, her impatience, had all vanished at the same time Drachmas did. They had all been performance, posturing, for Drachmas' sake. Now she was calm, relaxed, as she spoke. Partners or opponents, I still don't think we'll get anywhere pushing them around like that, Leia said. We'll find out in about 57 minutes. Mara said as she poured herself another cup of tea. I've dealt with the Salonians before. Have you or Han? I speak the language, and I've dealt with them socially. But I haven't done any real negotiating, said Leia. I haven't really dealt with them at all, said Han. Not since I was a kid back on Corellia. Then there is something you both have to understand, slash Mara said. Leia seemed about to protest, but Han held up his hand, asking her not to do so. Go on, Mara, he said. It's a little hard to explain. Mara paused for a moment. Think think about a sabak game, where each player knows the other is bluffing, but they both keep shoving chips into the pot, just to save face. Either of them can back down. Or two armies fighting each other, 
throwing endless troops into a vicious battle over a useless bit of land. There are cases when humans forget about the purpose of the competition, and the competition itself becomes absolutely vital. Sometimes it's irrational. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it has survival value, or evolution wouldn't have given us the tendency. Maybe sometimes you're thinking about the next hand in the game, the next battle. Maybe if she knows you just won't quit, your opponent will decide the fight isn't worth the cost. She'll give up and you'll win the next fight without even having to fight. Of course, most of the time, it's not even a conscious decision. We do that sort of thing without even thinking about it. It's a blind spot. None of that sounds much like Salonians, Hans said. No, it doesn't. Mara agreed. I was talking about a human blind spot. We're much more competitive and individualistic than the Salonians are. All that stuff about consensus isn't just talk. They really are that way. To oversimplify just a bit, they have a compulsion to reach agreement, whether or not it makes sense, just as we sometimes feel we have to win. Whether or not it makes sense. It's something the Salonians can help doing in a situation like this. It's a blind spot I see have. If we just waited until they were ready lower us, they could lake weeks or months or years just I zero. Decide what they want to ask us for. I had low let them know they'd lose everything, if they didn't ask for something right now. Are you sure that was wise, Dot? Leia asked. No. I'm not. But sometimes the important thing is to make something happen. It almost doesn't matter what. That almost can cover a lot of ground, Hans said. I suppose so. But maybe it means we have the chance to choose our ground. Maybe I know we can figure out what's going on around here. We can make some good decisions, Mara said. There's something we need to consider. Drachmas told us that all Ihe's worlds have repulses. And that someone from the outside was helping to organize the search for them, fine and good. You can use one to shoot down a ship. Even better, from a military point of view. But you can shoot down a ship with a lot of things that are a lot easier to get at, easier to control, easier to aim and use. I don't think we have the whole reason behind the scramble to grab the repulsa on Corellia. And don't forget Trachmas said IHE rebels on the other worlds are searching toward them or else they've found them already, and they are putting them to use. Using them lore what? Han asked. I haven't the faintest idea, Mara said. But you don't try that hard to grab something you don't need urgently. Not in the middle, oh. A war where you're trying to save your strength for when you need it. We've seen all sorts of indications that the various rebellions regard the repulsors as being hugely valuable. I'm starting to think the repulsors are the whole reason there are rebels. In a sense, I don't think there are any rebels at all. They're a front, a smokescreen, for the real enemy. What do you mean? Leia asked. I have a huna that the repulsor searches aren't because of the revolts, said Mara. My guess is that the revolts are happening as a cover for the repulsor searches. We're all fairly certain the revolts were organized from the outside. Drachmas said as much for what that's worth. Besides, what are he odds against rebellions on five planets simultaneously just by coincidence? There had to be some coordination. We've all agreed on that. I'm saying the organizing principle was the need to get at the repulsors. That makes sense if it's someone from outside doing the organizing, an external force, said Leia. I can't quite see our human. League acquaintances making a first approach to their close personal friends in the Salonian Overkin to put this together. If some outside force did the organizing, they could approach a dissident group on each planet, supply it with money and expertise and so on. And we know the rebels are coordinating with each other, 
at least to a certain extent. All of them participated in that coordinated attack against the Bakuran ships. But why would the rebels cooperate with each other and with this external force? Han asked. What's in it for them? Leia shook her head. I can't say for sure, but if I were setting up the deal, I'd say something like, take our money and information, cooperate with us. Use your local people to dig up the repulsor for us, hand it over to us, and when we kick the new republic out. Live you a free hand on your own planet. But in. We. Exchange we get your help and ultimate control over your planet's repulsor. Except then you run the risk of the rebels deciding that the repulsors are worth something. Han said. At a guess, something like that is what happened with the Human League. Mara said. If this external force idea is right, then the externals would be the ones running the Starbuster not the Human League. When the Human League started tossing threats around, the external force couldn't have been too happy about it. If they even knew about it, Mara said. They may be completely external low this star system. They'd have some representatives, some observers, in system. But once the jamming comes on, you can throw the observers in jail and say whatever you want without anyone outside hearing aisle. And once the interdiction out goes on, outsiders can't get at you to do anything about it. Sooner or later, the interdiction held and the jamming are turned off but by then, Thrak and Sal Solo is running the planet, maybe the whole Slar system, and the external forces can do what they like. And if he's managed to grab a few of the repulsors by then, maybe he's got some serious bargaining chips. Or maybe not. We don't even know what the repulsors can be used for. Let alone why they are so important. Leia thought for a moment. If all this is true, then the rebels themselves aren't the problem. It's the repulsors, and the people who got the rebels searching for them, he external forces. It's obvious the externals don't care about the rebel causes the rebels are all against each other. The Human League I dot s mostly on the Isolonian and anti -drawl. As much as it is for anything. So the externals are supporting them for some other reason as a way to get at the repulses. Cut the links between IHE rebels and IHE external forces. Gain control for the repulses. Figure out how to use them against the externals and the rebellions ought to dry up and blow away. Fine, Han said. Very nice and neat. But you've just given yourself a huge lazy of jobs here. I don't see how we could even start to accomplish any of them. But at least they're political jobs, intelligence jobs, not military jobs, Leia said. Considering we have no military assets at all in system, that's good news. There's a military aspect, of course, but we're hoping to get some help on that angle from the Sclonians. She glanced at Mara. Unless the Salonians call your bluff in another 45 minutes. I wasn't bluffing, Mara said. Do you have any clear idea of how the Salonians lit into all this? Han said. Are the Overden and the Hunchuzik even still fighting each other? I haven't seen any signs of battle, or any mention of it from Drachmasan. she's not so good at keeping secrets. You it wouldn't surprise me if they had stopped lighting, Mara said. But if they have, that's probably bad news for us. My impression is that the Overden has indeed seized control of the Repulsor Dash, and the Repulsor is a very powerful weapon. Salonians aren't much for lost causes. A lot of times we humans fight on even when all hope is lost. Honor requires it, or we're hoping for a miracle, or we're praying that a million to one chance breaks our way. Not the Salonians. Typically, a fight between two groups ends when one side or the other demonstrates they have a massive advantage over the other. The Salonians on the losing side will then see there is no point in going on and request a negotiated settlement. More than that, they will want to ally themselves with the winners. And you think our noble Hunchuzik allies have decided that they've lost, Han said. 
You think they're dickering with the Overden? And we're part of the deal? Something like that. Maybe the Overden wants us as bargaining chips, maybe as hostages, maybe they want to negotiate directly with Leia. Of course we don't even know for sure that it's the Overden, and not the Hunchu slash you see who have the repulsor. Maybe our side won. It is most regrettable, said a new voice, but I fear that is not the case. The inestimable Mara Jade has described the situation exactly. Han looked behind himself in surprise. The newcomer had arrived in utter silence from inside the villa. She was an older-looking Salonian, tall, but a little stooped over, her first shot. Through with gray, but her eyes bright. I am Clavitz, she said, and I speak for the Overden. We have won our Hune Husic sisters over to our cause. She paused, and then smiled, displaying an unpleasantly impressive collection of teeth. And that means, Ty, we have also won all of you. Tendra Risen had had just about enough of waiting. It was time for a little doing. The gentleman caller would be stuck in normal space, moving in toward the first distant inner planets of the Kuaian star system for months yet. Assuming the interdiction field stayed up. We suppose it didn't stay up. The gentleman caller was now the fastest ship in the universe, but even a slow ship would need only a minute or two in hyperspace to cover the remaining distance to the inner system, Tendiari knew belter than anyone about that fleet waiting in orbit around Sikoria. It seemed quite likely they would be headed this way. They would need the field to come down for that to happen. They might or might not reactivate it once they were in. The field might be down for just a very brief period. Therefore, it seemed likely there would be a moment, maybe only a loo minutes, perhaps longer, when she could activate her hyperdrive and get to where she was going if only she knew when that moment was. The Navy Pucker had a gravitic field indicator, one that was very definitely showing the effects of the interdiction field. All she had to do was rig an alarm that would go off when the field went down. Then it would merely be a question of computing and making the jump before the field came on again. There were dozens of things that could go wrong, any number of perhaps unwarranted assumptions. But if she did nothing for much longer, she would go mad. She knew she had to take charge of her own situation if she was going to hang on to her sanity. But for the most part, she didn't think of it in those terms. She just wanted to do whatever would get her off the ship. Freen? Zubit? Norch? Norgshill? Normal? Normal processing resumes? Resumes? Reset? Reset. Normal processing resumes. Wowzer. Freeing. The stream of babble continued as Q9X2's head spun around three times, and a perfect forest of probes and sensors and manipulator arms popped in and out of their compartment. Comma. Not quite, Anakin said, frowning a hit. He pushed the droid's main power button off. All of the manipulators abruptly retracted into their compartments, and his status lights went off. Anakin reached into Q9's interior and unplugged a cable. This one was in backward, he said. He plugged the cable back in and turned the power back on. This time the droid powered up a bit more sedately. His head spun around exactly once, his status lights came on, none of his probes or arms came out and he simply beeped twice and announced, Normal processing resumes. Well, I should hope so, said Ibrahim. After all the trouble we have been to in order to get you fixed. Frixed? Floog, was I broken? Q9 asked. Excuse me. Voter Cybum's not quite stabilized. Once moment. About half of his status lights went out for a few seconds and then came back on again. Let's try tie again. Fixed. How was I broken? 
Anakin turned the repulsor on, and there was some sort of power surge, said Ibrahim. We were afraid we had lost you altogether, but Anakin and Chquaka got you working again. Ibrahim found himself wondering if Q9 had actually needed any substantial repair at all. It hadn't taken Anakin more than an hour or two to do the job. Had Chewbacca left the work on O9 for Anakin as a way of letting Anakin make amends for what he had done? Or was Anakin's instinctive, near-mystical ability with machines so great that he could do things Chewbacca? With his centuries of experience, could not? Chubi had only worked on Q9 for a few minutes at a time, when he was taking a break from his work on the propulsion systems. Ah. Uh, well. Life was full of minor mysteries that would never quite be solved, and Ebrahim's command of the Wookiee language was not good enough to question Chewbacca on such a subtle point. Not that it was ever wise to question the Wookiee too closely. I am grateful lo both of you all of you for repairing me, said Q9. But what is I he's about turning the repulse on? That seems a most foolhardy act. Whose idea was it? My idea, Anakin said, looking down at the deck of the lounge compartment. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cause so much trouble. I am relieved to hear it. I would be even more relieved to learn that you had caused no trouble at all. I gather this was not the case? Oh, Anakin managed low do just a bit of damage, Ibrahim said breezily but we will discuss that later. Right now I would suggest that you run a full set of diagnostics on yourself. It might well be that you find that several corrective adjustments need to be made. Q9 activated his repulsor pads and floated up into the air to his normal hover height. I shall do so, he replied. But I would suggest that someone else around here might want to run some diagnostics and make some adjustments. With that, he floated silently out of the compartment. What did he mean by that? Anakin asked. I think he was suggesting that little boys should try and learn from their mistakes. That's not what he said. Anakin objected. No, my version was more polite. But the advice remains good. Anakin looked from Chewbacca to Ibrahim. You mean I should think more before I work on a machine? Anakin asked. That is precisely what I mean, Ibrahim said. Precisely. November. Run along and play with your toys, not with machinery. He watched the lad hurry off to find his brother and sister. Of course, he said to Chubasia. The problem is that Anakin sees toys and machines as one and the same thing. Chubasia nodded grimly as he put away his tools. In any event, said Ibrahim, it is good to have Q9 up and about again. Thank you for your help. And I think it is about time I relieve my aunt. My watch is about to start. Chewbacca gave a yip and a hoot of polite dismissal and Ibrahim turned and left the lounge. The two drawl had been taking turns on watch in the Falcon. Cockpit. The sensor displays there might well give them some sort of warning if trouble showed up. By having the drawl take the watch. Chubasia had time low keep up his work on his repairs to the Falcon. Wookiees in general, and Chewbacca in particular, were not given to bursts of optimism, but Chewbacca had made it sound as if he was close, very close, low getting at least some propulsion restored. Even if all they could do was fly high enough to get out of this enormous trap of a cylinder and back up to the surface that would be at least some help. Ibrahim entered the cockpit and saw his aunt silting at the pilot's station. She was using a pile of old clothes under her somewhat ample rump to boost her up high enough to see all the instruments. She looked around as he entered. Greetings, nephew. Q9 floated in a moment or two ago, and made several insulting remarks. It is good to see that he is operational again. It is indeed, dearest aunt. Is there anything to report? She shook her head. 
No, there is not. And for that let us be profoundly grateful, Dash. She stopped speaking and looked at the overhead detector display. She stared at it. Slock still, for all of five seconds. She shook her head. It would appear I spoke too soon. She said and then slapped down the red alert siren. It started hooting loudly, loudly enough for the children outside the ship to hear it and come running. Aunt, what is it? Ebrahim asked. I should think that would be obvious, she said, studying the display. It's a ship, oil course, coming in right on top of us. But I am not so much interested in what it is. I would much rather know who it is. Chapter 9 If and When It's amazing how much you can find when you know where to look, said Lando, studying the data that was flowing past, screenful after screenful. And it doesn't hurt to have someone as good at data searches as Arla. And ah, well, even 3PO's language skills have been helpful. 3PO turned his head rather briskly. Helpful? I would say they have been essential. You wouldn't have been able to translate a tenth of that information without me. Don't push it, Lando said. Yes, you were a great help, all right? There, I said it. But I was about to say that without Administrator Sunson, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere at all. Jenica Sunson smiled broadly and gave Lando a jab in the ribs that was probably just a trifle harder than she had intended it to be. Easy, all of you, she said. All I did was show you the log files. But the log files had told them a lot and led them in a lot of profitable directions. It was all down there, very clear. Looking from here, it was easy to spot signs of something going wrong. Station systems no one had even known about started coming to life. Power fluctuations. Spikes and drops in various forms of radiation, some of them significant enough to require the temporary evacuation of part of the station. The station repointing its spin axis, gradually reaming its poles in new directions. The change in spin orientation. How did you people explain that away? Asked Lando. Centerpoint has always been self-correcting, Jenica said. The bare center point isn't absolutely stable. The station has always moved itself around a little to stay properly oriented and positioned. It wasn't like it hadn't ever happened before. That low one side, said Lando. The main thing is that I've now pretty much confirmed what I suspected the second I saw those conical forms in the poles of Hollowtown. That form of six small cones around the larger one is the exact geometry you need for a particular kind of old-style repulsor. Actually, if you get down and take a look on the microscopic level, you'll see exactly the same pattern, repeated over and over and over again, on the surface of modern repuser systems. Crudely put, we don't make one big repuser element like that anymore, because the bigger the repuser, the heavier the object has to be for the repulsor to work efficiently. Lando brought up a wireframe diagram of centerpoint and pointed to the image of the repulsors. These are pretty big, but on the other hand, planets are pretty big too. But all the inhabited planets have their own repulsors. Kalenda objected. What did the builders of Corellia need this place for? Because this isn't just a repuser, he said. This is a hyperspack repuser. This station was designed to open up a gate, a tunnel through hyperspack. Grab a planet and pull it back this way. It acts as more of a tractor beam than a repuser, really, but that's the idea. How? Luke asked. How does it work? Lando shrugged. I don't know. But as Administrator Sunson has pointed out a time or two, knowing how it works isn't always that important. It's knowing that it. The station to report Al. The events, but the automatic logging reports I've found indicate there was more of the same. 
Then there was a different sort of power flow shifts from the automatic recording instruments that have kept up right until the present moment and they start at exactly the time the jamming and the interdiction field come on. Then we get the second glow point flare, and shortly thereafter, the second induced supernova. But how could it be we didn't feel any of that, or see anything? Jenica asked. You're talking about a hugely powerful pulse of energy being shot off from this station. No one saw anything. There wasn't any huge vibration or any burst of heat. This station is putting out a hugely powerful interdiction field and a powerful jamming field right now. Can you feel either of those? The pointing, Kalenda said. What does the repointing show? Lando brought up a holographic projector and threw up an image of the stars near to Corellia. The red spot at the center of the display is our position. This is the pointing of center points south pole relative to the starfield before things started happening. A blue line streaked out from the center of the display and pointed toward nothing at all. This is the pointing after the first shift in spin orientation. A line of red lanced out and stabbed straight through the heart of a star. That is TDI-0036EM-I-27I, Lando said. The first star to go Nova. Lando punched in another command, and a shaft of gold streaked out and touched another star. Thanta Zilbra, Lando said. The second star on the list. A population in the tens of thousands. My guess is most of them are dead. I know logistics, and I don't see how they possibly could have gotten everyone out in time. And this, he said, is where we're pointed now. A line of violet fire flashed out and hit another star, square and true. That is the third star on the hit list we got in the initial warning message. Bovo Yagen. I looked it up. One source says one planet with eight million. Another says two planets with a total estimated system population of 12 million on the planets, and who knows how many stations and habitats and mining camps and so on. Centerpoint is the starbuster, and it is getting set to blast that star and those planets and all those people down to cinders and dust. When? Kalenda asked. Lando hit another control button and a countdown clock appeared. Are to run the problem. We have to backtrack a little to account for how long the pulse will take to travel through hyperspace, and how long it will take for the chain reaction to take hold inside the star and build up to an explosion. Centerpoint is going to have to send a tractor repulsor hyperspace burst in exactly 123 hours, 10 minutes, and 13 seconds from now in order to keep to the schedule in the original warning message. Twelve hours and twelve minutes after that, the chain reaction induced by the energy pulse will bloom out of the star's core, and up it will go. Burning stars. Centerpin my home is a weapon, Jenica said, her voice full of shock. And whoever controls it is going to have the power to control the Corellian sector and maybe the whole galaxy, Gariel said. Do what we say, or we blow up your star. Wait a second. Luke said. There's a piece that doesn't fit. If Centerpunt is the Starbuster, then it's the prize, the most important place in the Corellian system. Why the fuss over the planetary repulses? Why didn't the plotters worry about Centerpoint? Three reasons, Lando replied. The first is that they didn't try to get it because they already had it or at least had found a way to control it. I figure there is some well-shielded, well-hidden control room on this station. Some place we wouldn't find it if we looked for a hundred years. Probably there isn't anyone in it anyway. All of it automated, set to work off timers and remote control. Second reason might be plain old misdirection. If you get everyone worried about the repulsors, no one's going to have time to go looking for the Starbuster. And the third reason has been staring us right in the face, Kalenda said. I think I just figured it out. 
I haven't really worked with repulsor field theory since school, but part of what makes repulsors work is that they can interfere and resonate with each other, right? And you can use that interference between two or more repulsor cells to provide steering and control. Power to a small side repulsor cell can deflect the beam from the main repulsor. Lando nodded. Exactly. The planetary repulsors can jam Centerpunt's hyperspace tractor repulsor beam. They are the only repulsors strong enough to do it. But it goes deeper than that. The planetary repulsors can work as amplifiers, not just as jammers. In practice, it would be the devil to manage. But in theory, you could tune all the planetary repulsors into a single network slave to center point. That would provide center point with even more power and range than it has now. Right now, center point gets its power by tapping a little bit of the gravitic potential of Talus and Tralus. Suppose it could tap into Salonia and Corellia and Drattle? For that matter, I haven't quite worked out the geometry of it yet. But with all five planets and center point in the network, you could probably tap into the star Corel's gravitic potential. If I designed this system back whenever it was designed, I'd make sure that was possible. Just imagine center point with that much power. It would be able to strike at any point in the galaxy. The masters of center point could grab any planet they wanted and pull it into this system or drop into a star, if they wanted. Centerpoint could blow up any star its masters chose. It could set up an interdiction field or communications jamming over the whole galaxy or any part of it its masters you wanted to isolate. It could probably do a lot of other things we haven't even thought of yet. A lot of things that didn't make sense are starting to make more sense than I'd like, said Luke. But using the repulsors for jamming. How would that work? That's a lot simpler, Lando said. If any of the planetary repulsors fired a properly tuned beam at center point, it would disrupt the aim and the tuning of the tractor repulsor beam. Could the planetary beams actually move center point itself? Luke asked. Not enough to make any difference, said Lando. Center point's more powerful than any of the plankter eyes. If the planetaries push center point off its present position, center point could just push it back. But any one of the planetaries can shut center point down by sending out a jamming signal. A.H. right, Kalenda said. Now we know all this. What do we do about it? Lando turned his hands palms up in a gesture of helplessness. Not much. We don't know it's being controlled or from where, or how. We've got a rough idea of what the system is, but we're nowhere near understanding how to operate the system. There must be some cable we can cut, some control system we can smash, Jenica said. I bet there is, but I don't know where it is. And we won't find out unless we search every deck and shell and compartment on this station. And even if we found the control system... I'm not so sure we could smash it. Remember the system is robust enough that it's been up and running since before the Old Republic. Then we could blow up the whole station, Gariel said. With what? Kalenda asked. We have one light cruiser and two destroyers. None of them are carrying. Any bomb powerful enough to destroy something 300 kilometers from end to end. Maybe, if he gave the Bakuran engineers enough time, they might be able to rig fixed-point detonators powerful enough to wreck the interior pretty thoroughly. With enough time. But not with only 120-odd hours to do it. Well, there's one thing we can do, Luke said. Get the word out. Tell our people what we found out. If we can find Han and Leia and Chewbacca, if we can find our allies on the worlds here, and let them know what we know, that's a start. If they can get to a planetary repulsor in time, and if they can figure out how to run it, and if they can jam that hyperspace tractor repulsor beam, then maybe we can save some lives. Lando shook his head. That's a lot of ifs, Luke, 
he said, the doubt heavy in his voice. I know, said Luke. He looked up at the countdown clock, the clock that showed how long Bovo Yagen had to live. The seconds were melting away. And it's going to take all the ifs we have to beat that one up there. The ship doved down into the repulsor chamber, moving fast and aggressively, but not so fast that Ebrahim wasn't able to see the insignia painted on the underside of its fuselage as he looked up at it. A stylized human skull with a knife in its teeth. Human League! He cried out. Can we get the shields up? No! Aunt Marka shouted. The children are still outside. We have to wait for them to get aboard. Ebrahim hopped up into the co-pilot's chair and turned toward the weapons controls as the enemy ship dropped down to a fast, assault-style landing. Burly figures in combat gear were tumbling out of the attack boat's hatches even before it had stopped bouncing on its landing legs. Weapons Ebrahim did not know much about such things, but he had to try. There had to be some sort of auto system to let the turbolacer's suddenly huge hands were scooping him up out of the seat, tossing him out of the way. Chewbacca scrambled into the co-pilot's chair and started powering up the defense systems. Power began to surge through the Falcon's weapons. The children are aboard. Marka shouted. Raise the access ramp. Activate the shields. Chewbacca hit the ramp close button and reached for the shield controls, but it was too late. A trooper with a very powerful-looking blaster was looking up at Chewbacca from below the cockpit. The Falcon was surrounded by troops standing inside the shield perimeter. Chewbacca tried the shields anyway. The lights in the cockpit surged for a moment as power went to the shield generators, but nothing else happened. Chewbacca roared in frustration. Shield jammers. They must have attached shield jammers to the hull, preventing the shields from forming. A tall, heavy set, bearded figure stepped out of the assault boat and walked toward them, a most unpleasant smile on his face. Sal Solo, Ebrahim said. It's him. That's our dad's cousin? Anakin asked. Ebrahim turned around and realized for the first time that the children had crowded their way in. All of them, the entire party, were there, in the cockpit. That is his cousin and yours, child, said Marka. But I doubt you will gain much joy from knowing him. Ebrahim tried not to listen. There was something that had just flitted across his mind, at the thought of their all being together. Wait a moment. That wasn't true. They weren't all together. But if he, Ebrahim, assumed they all were here, then surely their friends outside might make the same mistake. Ebrahim had an idea. Not even a plan, just an idea that would give. Them options, advantages. Maybe enough so that there would still be a way out of this. It was a long shot, but still it was a chance that could turn this thing around. That was the good news. The bad news was in two parts. First, they only had a few seconds to put it in motion. And two, his idea relied completely and entirely upon Q9X2. Thrak and Salsolo could not have been happier. It was a gift from the gods, an absolute gift from the gods. He strode about his new possession, admiring it thinking of all it could do and do for him. At last he had his hands on a planetary repulsor. He had gambled everything that he would get to one in time. He had thought it would be the one on Corellia. That he ended up grabbing the one here on Drawl was but a slight irony. He had one. That was all that mattered. He had one in time to control the situation. He looked up admiring the view straight to the surface, that sharp-edged circle of blue, kilometers above his head. He looked down a bit, at the massive, graceful cluster of cones that made up the repulsor array itself. ASI his. All his. 
His eyes strayed lower, to the Millennium Falcon. What a bonus, what a magnificent and glittering extra prize it was. Grabbing the Falcon by itself would have been enough to humiliate Han Solo, to pay him back for the crime of escape. But to find Han's Wookiee and his children aboard as well what could be better? There were two absurd draws as well, but they were no prize at all compared to the children. The children represented not just a chance for personal vengeance, but something else, something more an opportunity. If he handled it right, a war winner. Now suddenly he could control, could manipulate, Leia Organa Solo herself. Now she would have to come to the bargaining table, because she had no choice. And once she came to that table, Thraken was certain she would leave with nothing at all. He would force her into a bargain that would leave the New Republic with its heart torn out, so badly injured, so utterly discredited, that it could not survive. Of course, the recent destruction of Thanta Zilbra and the coming destruction of Bovo Yagen might well accomplish that on their own. A galaxy that saw that the New Republic could not prevent such a disaster would be a galaxy that lost faith in the New Republic. It would be a galaxy tie realized revolt against the New Republic was possible. That would be all to the good, of course. But better, far better, if the galaxy saw Thrak and Sal Solo as a central figure in bringing the New Republic down. The man who dared to grab the Chief of State's children and hold them hostage that would be a man to fear, a man to reckon with. Now he would be that man. But holding them would do no good unless Han Solo and Leia Organa Solo knew about it. The communications jamming would have to come down. That was easy to accomplish. An encoded radonics command to the hidden control station on Kenterpoint would shut down the comm jamming in short order. No doubt the people who had built the hidden control center took a dim view of Thraken controlling it in their stead but they should have thought of that before sending in operatives who could be bribed, operatives who would betray their masters. But now, now, the last piece of the puzzle had dropped into place. He had a planetary disruptor, and alone of all the rebel leaders in the Korklion system, he knew what a planetary repulsor could do. Being able to smash a ship was trivial compared to the ability to hold the Starbus Kaplot hostage. Thraken knew it would take time perhaps a long time before his technicians would be able to operate the repulsor, but even that did not matter. For now he was in a position to bluff things out, to pretend he controlled the repulsor. That ought to be more than enough to get what he wanted. More than enough. Admiral Hordel Osilage watched on the long-range scanners as the human league assault boat dove down the mouth of the repulsor. The image was grainy and blurry. The scanners were working at maximum range, which meant the assault boat was far beyond the maximum range of the intruder's weaponry. It was going to be beaten to the punch. Frustrating. Infuriating, but it would not do to show it. It would not do at all and one had to admire the nerve, the audacity, of the assault boat's commander, quite literally diving his whole ship down the barrel of a weapon that could have reduced his craft to dust and rubble in milliseconds. Even if the intruder had been capable of atmospheric operation or planetary landing, he could not have risked it with a move like that. Not when the intruder represented such a huge fraction of the firepower on the Republic's side of the equation. Osilage envied his opponent's freedom to take chances. But speaking of taking chances, he faced a repulsor precisely like the one that had smashed the watchkeeper down to nothing at all. He had to assume this repulsor would be just as powerful within a short period of time if it was not so already. After all, someone had turned it on. More than likely, that someone knew how to aim it and fire it as well. And it occurred to him, more than likely that someone was an ally of the Human League. If that was so, then the assault boat hadn't been taking chances, but had flown in to take possession of a planetary repulsor that had been located and activated by Human League agents. And yet. And yet. That was a fast, hard assault landing, not a slower, 
safer arrival at a secured base. Almost as if the other side had been as surprised as Osilich himself. Almost as if they had been trying to do what he had been trying to do take advantage of an unexpected opportunity. Osilich had the feeling the story was not over. Something else was going to happen here, something more was going to change. And change could usually be exploited. Besides, it was just one small assault boat. There could not be more than 20 or 30 people aboard it, at most. Surely the intruder ought to be able to lake on a force that small, no matter how powerful the weapon they controlled. Osilich had always been a great believer in the idea that weapons mattered far less than the people who used them. The intruder carried a small force of assault troops, and she carried her own assault boats. Perhaps the intruder would not be able to attack the repulsor in a frontal assault, but there were other forms of Atlek. Forms that took a bit more time, and a bit more fines.se, but could work just as well, if one was audacious. Osilage turned to the ensign at his side. My compliments to Captain Semi. The intruder will move into an orbit synchronous with the planet's rotation, well out of line of sight from the repulsor's sight. We will await developments here while we commence preparations for a ground assault. The ensign saluted and scurried away. Osilage stared at the image of the planetary repulsor in the scanner screen. He raised his hand and offered up a small, mocking salute to the commander of the assault boat. You have won the first round, he said to the screen. But let us not forget the main event is still to come. Chapter 10 Casting the Stone Luke stepped out into the huge airlock where the Lady Luck and his X-Wing were waiting, and breathed a sigh of relief. Chknika had taken them on a roundabout route but they had gotten here faster than he had thought possible. And with that clock counting down toward the death of Bovo Yagen, there was no time at all to waste. He thought he knew what he had to do next, but he had to be sure. He had to check. The others watched as Luke found a packing crate that had been abandoned on the airlock deck and sat down on it. He shut his eyes and concentrated forcing himself to take it slow, to be sure, to extend his senses as far as possible. Leia is on Salonia, he said at last as he opened his eyes. No doubt about it. I can feel her there. My guess is that Han is with her, and probably Mara Jade as well. The three children are on draw, and if what Kalenda told us is right about how they all escaped from Corellia, that probably means Chewbacca and the Falcon Ark there with them. I can get a sense of a mind that's probably Chewbacca, but I can't be sure. Not at this range. And I might add that all of them seem worried. It's hard to explain, but but I get the sense, the feeling, that all of them Leia and the kids, and the people with them are all prisoners of one sort or another. Then we'd better get cracking and bust them out. Lando said briskly. You go to Leia. Lando said. Take R2 and the X-Wing. Figure out the coordinates for the kids' location on Oral. And give them to me. I'll fly Garakal and Jenica back to the Bakuran fleet, where they can inform Admiral Osilage of what we have learned. Gariel should get back to her post on the ship, and Jenica is our expert on center point. She ought to be of some help if things get rough. After I've dropped them off, Lieutenant Kalenda and I will fly on to Drawl and see what we can do about getting to Chewbacca and the kids. Jenica looked toward Lando. You're not very optimistic, are you? We don't know how to find the Drawl repulsor, Lando replied. I don't care how good an engineer Chewbacca is. There isn't going to be any way for him to work on a repulsor he can't get to. We have to rescue them, of course, but unless they're sitting right on top of a repulsor, I don't see how finding Chewbacca is going to help us get one. He turned back to Luke. Leia is by far the better chance. She's on a planet where they've got a working repulsor, 
and it's probably controlled by the people holding her. All you have to do is let her know what's going on, and then hope she can talk her captors into jamming center point. Luke smiled faintly. Yeah. Easy. Should be a piece of cake. Jenica rubbed her chin. It all nearly makes sense, she said thoughtfully. But I don't like the fact that we're leaving center point unguarded. I don't think the loss of the overwhelming force represented by two small ships, two droids, and five people is going to matter that much, Lando said. What are we going to be able to do anyway? Wait for someone to land and then sneak up and kick them in the shins? Jenica cocked her head a bit to one side and nodded. Point taken. I guess I don't know what more we can do. Luke stood up and nodded. In that case, he said, I suggest we do what we can right now. We have you, but we'll not keep you long, said Clavitz, speaker for the Overden. She sat at a table opposite Mara, Leia, and Han. Drachma sat at Clavitz's side, demonstrating simply by her presence that her clan had submitted to the victors. She did not look happy to be there. We need merely come to certain straightforward agreements, and then all may be on their way. We're not going to come to your agreements, Leia said wearily. The morning had lengthened into late afternoon, and they were in the sumptuous interior of the prison villa. For prison it had proved to be. The Overden had thrown a force field around the Jade's fire, and guards around the force field. Leia could see the ship on the landing pad, just outside the door, but there would be no escape aboard her this time. Even if we did wish to reach agreement, we could not do so while you were detaining us. Even if we did, it would be pointless. My government would never ratify any agreement made under duress. How can you be under duress when you will be free to go as soon as we are agreeing? We are under duress now. Leia said, her voice and manner calm, imperious. And we will not agree in any event. Therefore, the point is moot. I ask you again to be reconsidering, Clavitz said. All we ask is that you are acknowledging reality. We are free. We are no longer of the new republic. We have thrown you off. We are our own place our own planet. We ask merely that you are recognizing this fact. You are no freer now than you were under the New Republic, Mara said, her voice cold. There was no dictator over you, no one telling you how to think and feel and act. You have thrown off no tyranny. It is not freedom for Salonia you ask her to recognize. It is the dominance of the Overden. Hey, I'll tell you what, Han said. Let's give them what they want. Complete freedom. Complete freedom from trade, from interstellar commerce, from imports. Complete freedom from travel off-planet. Total embargo. How does that sound? It sounds quite pleasant to us of the Overden, who wish to be free of anti salonian influence. Is that not so, my dear friend? Speak for the Hunchuzik. Do you not agree that complete isolation would be the greatest of blessings? Oh yes, eminent Clavitz. Dragmas said in a mournful tone, clearly feeling miserable and humiliated. There could be no doubt that all the people of Salonia long to be isolated from the outside universe. What about all your friends and relations on Corellia, where you lived all your life? Han asked. They will rejoice with me in knowing we are free of all outside influence, Drachmas said, staring down at the table. I'm afraid you're no good at lying. Honored Drachmas, Han said. I've seen dead people who were more convincing. Drachmas looked up worriedly and risked a quick look over at Clavitz. Please be in no doubt at all about my sincerity, honored Solo. Don't worry on that score, 
said Han. I have no doubts at all. I insist that we return to the main point, Clavitz said, clearly a bit put off by Draconis's performance. Recognize the freedom of Salonia under the guidance of the Overden, or never leave this planet alive. You've got yourself a deal, Leia said. Clavitz looked toward her eagerly. Then we have persuaded you? Absolutely, said Leia. We picked the second choice, the one about not leaving alive. Go ahead and kill us all right now. Clavitz sighed wearily and extended her claws to drum them on the tabletop, making a rather unsettling clicking noise. It was hard to miss just how sharp those claws were. I can see, said Clavitz, that we are going to be here for a while. Thrak and Sal Solo sat in the co-pilot's seat and watched intently as the pilot brought the assault boat up to the rim of the huge cylinder that was the planetary repuisor. Slowly, slowly, slowly up and over. The assault boat hung motionless in the air for a moment, then spun slowly about, until its nose was pointed directly at the two bright spots of light on the evening horizon. Talus and Trellis Thracken could not spot it with the naked eye from this distance, but he knew that, with just the slightest of magnification, he would be able to see center point there as well. All was in readiness. All he had to do was press the button, command the radonic system to send its signal, and then order the pilot to bring them back down into the repulsor. Then it would simply be a matter of waiting for the radonic signal to cross the distance between here and center point to reach the control center. The automatic control center would shut off the jamming, and that would be that. He would not even have to come up here again to transmit the broadcast over comm channels. The comm signal wouldn't be blocked by the repulsor or require line of sight. Most convenient. Simple, really. Thracken was not generally of a poetic turn of mind, but it occurred to him that what he was about to do was to cast a stone into a pond, square into the mid-eye. The ripples would move out from where the stone struck, out in all directions. Some of the consequences he could predict, but he knew, if anyone did, just how risky a game he was playing. The ripples might well spread out in directions he had not considered, touch on shores he did not expect. He wanted to turn off the communications jamming because it served his own purposes, but being able to communicate would serve many other purposes beyond his own. Sonic consequences he could predict. Once the jamming was down, the original controllers of the Starbus Kaplot would immediately use the primary comm system to send the command shutting down the interdiction field. They would move into the core client system and run right up against the Bakuran ships. That suited Thracken fine. Lay the two sides battle it out. Let one side defeat the other. The winner, whoever it was, would be weakened by the fight, and Thracken's own forces would have an easier time of it in the final confrontation. He was also just about certain tie the system's original controllers would lock out the subsystem Thracken had been using, preventing him from manipulating the system any further. They would not want the jamming back on. So be it. That meant Thracken's enemies here in the Corellian system would suddenly be able to communicate with each other, exchange information. They would learn things about each other, and about Thracken but they would learn them too late. He was not worried about that. But what of the consequences he had not imagined I? What unknown risks was he about to lake? There was, clearly, no way to know. But there was one thing he did know. Shutting off the communications jamming would allow Thracken. Sal Solo to tell the whole Corellian system that he had Han Solo's children. Han Solo would hear it, and know it, and he helpless to do anything about it. What sweeter revenge could there be? Thracken pushed the button. The command signal went out. Oselage watched on the intruder's long-range scanners as the assault boat hovered just barely into view over the top of the repulsor, turned itself slightly, and then floated back down out of sight. 
He looked toward the intruder's chief gunner and saw the man shake his head. I'm sorry, sir. There just wasn't time to set up a shot. Not at this range. Especially with atmosphere in the way. If he had stayed there another thirty seconds the chief gunner left the thought unfinished, but Osilich understood. He sighed. If that assault boat had stayed there long enough for the intruder to set up the shot, then this war might be over right now. Boy, you get out of touch for five minutes and everything changes, said Lando as the Lady Luck flew clear of the Mammoth Center Point airlock. Where's the intruder? What's the intruder? Jenica asked. Biggish sort of thing. A ship. A Bakuran light cruiser. It should not be hard to miss, but I can't spot it. Have you looked in the last place you had it? She asked. Lando smiled. I did, just now, and it wasn't there. But I bet I find it in the last place I look. So where is it? At a guess, something has happened, and Anmaro Osilage has charged off as bravely as possible to do something about it whether it needs doing or not. I'm not sure I appreciate your tone, Lando, said Gariel. I'm not sure I appreciate the way Osilich takes chances, said Lando. But the question is, what do we do now? I'm not sure, Gariel said. Life is going to be a lot easier if and when we get communications back. She thought a moment. Can we get a laser comm link with Sither of the two destroyers? Not easily, Lando said. It'd probably be easier and faster just to Eilie over to the closest ship, dock, open the hatch, and ask what's going on. Then let's do that, Gariel said. We can decide what to do when we know more. A very sensible attitude, that, said Lando. We're on our way. Jaina let out a sad sigh. Things were very bad. The prisoners sat, sad and forlorn and rather crowded in the mobile stockade, unable to do anything but watch as the Human League troopers and technicians unpacked their gear, obviously getting ready to settle in for a long stay. The mobile stockade was really nothing more than a force field generator designed to stay outside the force field itself, so that those held in the field could not get at the generating machinery. The force field was transparent, however, and those inside could see the generator, plain as day, straight in front of them. This did not sit well with Anakin, to put it mildly. The idea that he used SEC but could not touch the device that was holding them prisoner seemed to upset him far more than the fact that he was a prisoner. The other two children tried to keep him as distraited as possible, but it was not easy. On the bright side, struggling to keep Anakin cheered up distracted them from their own worries. The two drawl, Ibrahim and Marka, seemed to have decided that being locked up gave them a chance to catch up on a decade or so of family gossip and they clearly had an enormous family. They sat there, for hour after hour, discussing the doings of this cousin, the money problems of that uncle, the scandalous failure to divorce of that great aunt twice removed and her fifth husband. Chewbacca paced back and forth, from one side of the hemispherical force field containment to the other. He was forced to watch the human league techs poking around the Millennium Falcon, wandering around on the upper hull, opening the access panels, and studying the interiors. Once or twice, a league tech would open a panel and laugh out loud at what he saw. It was difficult to restrain Chewbacca at those moments. He would pound his fists on the force field and roar his frustration, but doing so gained him nothing more than slightly singed fur on his hands and upper arms. Perhaps only the two draw were calm and settled enough to deal with the situation rationally when Thrak and Sal Solo marched over from the assault boat. Jaina certainly wasn't in any mood to be reasonable. A human league tech was by his side, carrying a holographic recorder. Good afternoon to Al. Of you, said Thraken in that voice that was so close to her father's, and yet so far away. Cousin Thraken strange and unpleasant to think of him that way, 
Jaina told herself, but that was what he was. Hello, said Jaina, and Jason muttered a hello as well. Anakin took one look at his father's cousin and burst into tears and Jaina couldn't blame him. It was upsetting just to look at at Thraken. He looked so much like their father just a little darker, a little heavier, the hair a different shade. The beard helped. Make him seem at least a little different from dad, but somehow that only made the similarities more upsetting. It was like looking at at a dark side version of her father, the way he could have been, if anger and resentment and suspicion had taken hold of him. Make that child stop crying, Thracken said, as if Jaina could make Anakin quiet with a wave of her hand. I can't, she said. He might calm down in a minute, but he's scared of you. There's no reason to be scared of me, said Thracken. Not yet. That was less than comforting. Jaina knelt down and gave her little brother a hug. It'll be all right, Anakin. Honest, I seven she whispered to him, hoping that she was telling the truth. Why aren't you here? Jason asked, glaring at Thracken. What do you want? Not much at all, not much at all, Thracken said. I merely need some pictures of all of us together. Chewbacca roared, growled, and bared his teeth, then gestured for Thracken to come into the stockade containment. Thracken smiled. I don't speak your barbaric language, Wukiek, but I understood that. No, thank you. I can get quite close enough to you for my purposes from outside the force field. Why do you want Holos of us? Aunt Marka demanded. Thracken smiled. I should think that would be obvious, even to a member of your species. I am in the process of turning off the jamming of communications. When the jamming is off, I will broadcast the holos to demonstrate that you are my prisoners. While I doubt anyone will much care what happens to a pair of rotund drawl or a psychotic wookie, I would expect that the children's parents will be inspired to more reasonable behavior if they knew I had their children, and a planetary repulsor. Marka Duchess of Mastigophorus drew herself up to her full height and glared at their jailkeeper. You are on the verge of a most serious error, she said. For your own safety, I urge you to reconsider this act slash. Thracken laughed out loud. You are scarcely in a position to make threats drawl. Save your breath. Very well. May the consequences be on your head alone. Honor required me to say what I did. But a wise being can tell a warning from a threat. For the briefest of moments, the bland smile flickered off Thracken's face, but then it was back, as calm and meaningless as ever. I need say no more to any of you on this subject, he said. Now I want the three children on this side of the stockade, closest to me, and you three aliens on the far side. Why dash? Ebrahim began. Because I wish it. Thracken snapped. Because if you do not obey, I can manipulate the force field to make the stockade half the size it is. Because I can shoot you all dead if I so choose. Thracken paused and smiled. Because I can and will harm the children if you do not. He said. Now go to the other side. The two oral and the Wookiee exchanged looks with each other. It was clear they had no real choice. They moved to the opposite side of the stockade. Anakin had more or less settled down by the slime, and Jaina urged him to his feet. There was always one sure way to distract Anakin, and that was to have him watch someone use a machine. And of course there might be other benefits to watching the procedure. Look, Anakin, she said. Watch what the man does. Anakin nodded and wiped his nose. The three children stood as close as they could to the edge of the field and watched intently as the technician knelt down by the stockade's force field generator. He pulled a very old-fashioned metal key out of his pocket, 
shoved it into a slot on the generator, and turned it a quarter turn to the left. Then he changed several of the settings on the device. A new force field, a vertical wall running across the middle of the stockade field, and separating the adults from the children, came into being. He turned the key back a quarter turn to the right and pulled it back out. Ah, uh, diktat, sir. It might also be wise to intensify the fields somewhat, so that they are more plainly visible on the holographic recording. Will it make the prisoners themselves harder to see? Very slightly, S.I., but they will be quite recognizable, and the sight of the force field will make a very clear visual statement that they are prisoners. It will make your words stronger. Very well, Threekin said. Make the adjustment. The technician turned a dial, and the force field turned a trifle darker. Very good, said Thraken. Very good indeed. Now then. Take your hoe, O recorder, and shoot, he said. Gel a nice long sequence of each face in turn, and then a wide shot of all of us together. I don't want there to be any chance of someone not being sure I have the children or of someone thinking that it's been faked in some way. The technician lifted his holographic recorder to his face and set to work, recording the image of each unsmiling face in turn, then taking a wide shot of Thraken with all IHE prisoners. At last he was done. That should do it. Diktat Salsolo, the tech said. Very good, said Thraken. I dot else go get the transmitter set up and get ready to send that out. What about setting the force field back, sir? Thraken looked at the stockade for a moment. Leave it, he said. It might be wise to keep the children separate from the aliens. It might make it harder for them to scheme together. With that, he turned and walked away, the technician following behind. Jaina watched as the two of them walked away. Did you see enough of what the tech did? She asked Jason. Not really, I he said. I don't think I could manipulate the controls with the force, anyway. I don't have that kind of fine control. And besides, the tech had that key. Anakin, what about you? I could do something if I could get at it. He said. Change some stuff but you need that key to turn a field on or off, or cut all power. You saw him. Have to have that key to turn it off. No hope there, then, Jaina said. Hush, child, said the Duchess Marka from the other side of the vertical force field wall. There is always hope particularly against an opponent who believes everything can be won with bullying. Jaina went over to the vertical wall the other children trailing after. Has he really made a mistake, Aunt Marka? She asked, wanting comfort and reassurance as much as information. Oh. Yes, she said. Very much so, child. Chewbacca laughed gently, a small growly noise, and then let out a yip and a hoot. The Wookiee looked around to make sure no human league trooper was close enough to watch. Then he moved up as close as he could to the vertical wall and opened the palm of his hand. He had a pocket comm link. Jaina looked up at Chewbacca with a wild grin. I should have known, she said. With all that long fur, you could hide practically anything on your body. And besides, who's going to frisk a Wookiee? Chewbacca chuckled again at that question. But what good does that do us? Jason asked. That thing doesn't have any range at all. Not more than a few kilometers. You're forgetting someone who is quite nearby, Ebrahim said. Someone who has built-in communications equipment. Ebrahim smiled to himself. Someone who is probably getting most tired of waiting. Q9X2 was most definitely tired of waiting in itself a remarkable accomplishment in a droid. Any other droid would have simply turned itself off after setting an implanted timed wake-up command in its standby circuits. 
not Q9. He was afraid of missing something. Not that there could be much to miss when stuffed upside down into one of the Falcon's hidden smuggling compartments. Q9 found Ty he was more bothered by being confined than by being inverted. It would have been more pleasant to have been right side up, but time had been exceedingly short, and this had been the first place they had found where he could fit at all, in any orientation. Ibrahim's instructions had been simple enough, and did not require Q9 to stay turned on. Wait at least 14 hours. Do not emerge until it is safe to do so. At that time, examine the ship and the situation as best you can. Determine the best method for coming to our aid, and caney out time method. Rather on the vague side, but the intent was straightforward. The execution would be tricky, as most of Q9's sensors had to be extended out of his body before he could use them, which meant they were less than helpful while he was upside down in a tight-fitting storage bin. He could have stayed powered down, but he was simply too agitated for that. Q9 had run some diagnostics and analyzed his onboard service log. He knew exactly how close he had come to being destroyed by Anakin's activation of the repulsor. Droids were rarely reminded of their own mortality in quite that way. Now, shortly thereafter, Zero Nine had ample time to consider the notion of his own destruction. It had nearly happened in the recent past, and the odds seemed fairly high that it would happen in the near future. Under the circumstances, deliberately shutting oneself off seemed the height of folly. Suppose one component had failed, or was on the verge of failing, and his diagnostics had missed it. Suppose he loaded a timed. Wake-up event went into standby, and then the wake-up command was never implemented. In short, he had no desire to turn himself off when he was not confident he could turn himself back on again. Clearly, it was an absurd state of affairs, but there it was. Q9 Was afraid to go to sleep. He settled in to wait some more. Gary O'Captison stood on the hangar deck of the Sentinel, next to the Lady Luck. I don't think there's any argument about what we should do, she said. We go on to draw, and rendezvous with the intruder. You absolutely, Five said Lando. If someone has already found a repulsor there, that is the place to be. Not for me it isn't, said Jenica. Sentinel and Defender are keeping watch on Centerpoint Station, and I'm the closest thing to an expert on Centerpoint they're going to get. I stay here. Lando nodded. You're right. He said. Lieutenant Kalenda, what about you? Kalenda cocked her left eyebrow up a bit and shook her head slightly. A tough call, she said. But at this point, I'd say my place is with Admiral Osilich. So you can keep an eye on him? Lando wondered. Good enough, he said. Get aboard then. What about me? Thrupio asked. Shall I continue on with you? It is more likely that my language skills will be more useful on a trip to draw than here. Lando was sorely tempted to refuse and leave Thrupio behind. But the irritating thing was that the droid might be right. Suppose they got to the repulsor and encountered Drawl who didn't speak basic? Get aboard, he growled. Thrupio trotted up the access ramp. Gariel and Kalenda said their farewells to Jenica and boarded the Lady Luck. Lando waited just a moment before going aboard. There was something more he wanted to say to Jenica Sunson, something he might not get the chance to say again. And by the amused look on her face, it seemed as if she was expecting him to say something. In fact, she said at first, Is this the part where you tell me how you never met anyone like me? And how you want to get to know me better? That sort of thing? Maybe something about how we've been through a lot together, we've made a connection, and we shouldn't just let it drift away. Some nice, smooth line a lady couldn't help but fall for? Lando couldn't quite tell if she was mocking him or daring him, 
warning him off or urging him on. The strange thing was it didn't matter. He had been shot down in romance plenty of times before, but there was a little piece of him that felt quite sure this would not have been one of those times. But this time, there wasn't going to be a this time. Lando sighed and shook his head. There was a time, not very long ago, when I would have said those words, and meant every one of them at least, while I was saying them, even if I sort of forgot them later. The problem is, I did say something very like them to another lady, very recently, and I did mean it at the time. The funny thing is, for the first time in my life, I'm catching myself JY forward slash forward slash forward slash meaning it. I might even mean it for a long, long time. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to back off. Jenica looked surprised though not half as surprised as Lando felt. You know, she said, that might be the classiest speech of its kind on record. I think you've got yourself a very lucky lady out there, and I don't mean the lady luck. She stuck out her hand to shake, and Lando took it. Take care of yourself, Lando. I must admit I almost wish you had made a play for me just so I could know for sure what I would have done about it. Now I guess I'll never know. Lando smiled back, his broadest, most charming grin that showed every tooth in his head. Neither will I, he said. You take care of yourself too. He let go of her hand, boarded the Lady Luck, and made his way to the pilot's station. Gariel was waiting in the starboard observer seat, and Kalenda was at the co-pilot's station. So, said Kalenda as she ran the pre-flight check, is she going to let you call her? Her eyes never left the instruments, but there was just a hint of a smile at the corner of her mouth. Lando wasn't sure but he thought he heard a very unexpressed prime ministerial giggle from behind him as he sat down. Excuse me? He asked. Call her. You asked if you could look her up after this was all over. Did she say yes or no? Lando felt himself blushing. Had it been that obvious? Was his reputation that bad? Ern, ah, uh, well, if you have to know, she asked if Jay was going to ask, and I said I couldn't. Promises made elsewhere. This time Kalenda did turn away from the instruments to look straight at him. You're kidding, she said, that disconcerting over her shoulder gaze of hers throwing him more than a little off. Ah, uh, no, said Lando. I'm not. I don't know why I should tell you any of this at all, but that's what happened. Traitor's honor. Kalenda let out a low whistle and shook her head. Well then, Madam Prime Minister. It looks like our little bed is off. Captain Kalrishan, why don't you get us out of here? Uh, I'm right, yes, said Lando. He finished his own pre-flight check and gently lifted the lady up onto her repulses. There were definitely times and places when he realized that he still had a lot to learn about women. The Lady Luck left the hangar deck, gathered speed, and headed for Drawland for the intruder. Luke Skywalker eased the X-Wing's throttle up to maximum thrust and kept it there. The dance of the orbits had put Salonia just about as close to center point and the double worlds as it ever got, but the distances were still great and he was in a hurry. He, too, had wondered what the absence of the intruder had meant, but he had no line to worry about it. He had a job and a duty. Bovo Yagen, and its millions of people. Now, at last, they had at least the hope of saving them. And if if they could stop the destruction of Bovo Yagen, it might well mark the beginning of the end for the Starbuster plot and the rebellions on the worlds of the Corellian system. But the galaxy had little interest in ifs. The universe concerned itself willy what did happen, not with what might. They had a slender chance here, but that was all. And the survival of those twelve million people might well depend on and how fast Lai got to Salonia and Lae. Twelve million people. Luke remembered thinking, not so long ago, that in the galactic lime scale, 
what happened here scarcely mattered at all. All of recorded history, all the days of myth and legend before that time, were a blink in the cosmic eye. But twelve million people, twelve million lives. That many hopes, that many dreams and pasts, that many families, that many memories and histories that would vanish as well, as if they had never been. All the unborn generations that would never be born, all the promise, all the potential, that would be gone, stolen from the galaxy's future. Surely it was wrong to destroy a star, something that old. That big, that powerful and complex and beautiful, just for the sake of some transient political advantage. Luke smiled. No one was going to use supernovas as weapons. Not during his eye blink of history. Not if he could help it. R2 beeped and whirred in tones of warning, and Luke checked his display screens. Oh boy, he said. Company. A flight of eight light attack fighters was climbing out of orbit to meet him. It was not the sort of trouble Luke needed just now. Maybe he could scare them off without getting too involved. Luke eased back the throttle of the X-Wing and zeroed out his shields completely, shunting all the surplus engine and shield energy to his weapons system. Arto let out a twittering squeal of protest. Take it easy, Arto. I'll have the shields back up before we're in range of their weapons. Luke had flown against LFs not so long ago. He knew what they could do and what they could not. The LAFs were overmatched by the basic X-Wing, but not to the point where he cared to take his chances against eight. LAFs single-handed. The best way for Luke to win this fight was to avoid it altogether. The trick now would be to convince them that Luke and his enhanced X-Wing fighter put together were unbeatable rather than just very good. Luke reached out with the Force, extending his senses as far as he could, touching the minds of the Salonian fighter pilots seeking not to manipulate their emotional state but to judge it. The Salonian temperament, with its desire for group consensus, was not one much given over to the strains of battle. They did better when fighting alone, on behalf of a group, rather than as part of a group fighting side by side. He felt at once that the Salonian pilots were nervous, jumpy, unsure. From two or three of their minds he detected the sensation of returning to a place of doom and fear. At a guess, those were veterans of the recent fight against the Bakurans, veterans who had just barely come back. It was enough. If Luke did this right, then everyone would come back from this one. They might not enjoy it, but they'd be alive. Luke checked his power displays. Weapons power was at maximum. Luke shifted all his shield generation power and weapons charging power into the propulsion system and throttled up to 120% of maximum rated thrust. The X-Wing leapt toward the LAFs at terrifying speed. Two of the LAFs fired at him, panicky unnamed shots that went completely wild. One of them nearly shot his own wingman. Luke knew the chance he was taking, flying without shields. If one of those random shots turned lucky and managed to connect well, that would be too bad. Best to 27 to get this over with before anything like that could happen. This one would require all his skill, all his ability and the force and a fair amount of luck as well. Luke disengaged the firing computer, shut his eyes, and aimed the X-Wing by feel, by instinct, through the force. Once, twice, three times he fired. Three turbolasca bursts leapt out. One, two, three, the bursts hit the LAFs, catching each of them square on the ventral weapons pod. Suddenly three of the LAFs could fly, but could not fight. It was flying, and shooting, intended to send a message. Slash him faster than Yan, bigger than you, have better weapons than you, and can. Shoo! From farther away. I could destroy you all if I chose I do so. I do not so choose. Do not make me change my mind. The three veterans got the message right away, it seemed, reversing course immediately and heading for home. 
Two of the other Alephs hesitated for a moment, then followed the others. That left three to deal with, and three was a lot better than eight. On the other hand, it left him facing the three pilots who were hardest to scare. The three of them were headed for him in a face-on triangle, one fighter at each angle of the triangle. They were rapidly closing to firing range. Luke throttled back enough to let him put his forward shields back on, but he didn't switch power back to weapons charging. One way or another, this engagement would be over before his weapons systems ran out of stored power. Suddenly Arthur began to whistle excitedly and a text message began to scroll past Luke's display screen, much too fast for Luke to follow. R2, what is it? The droid's half-frantic beeping and whistling sounded in Luke's headphones. Luke checked his delector display, saw the three LFs closing fast, and made a quick, easy decision about priorities. R2, later slash, Luke said, I've got another problem right now. Whatever it is, it's going to have to wait. These three pilots weren't easy to scare, but they weren't the best tacticians either. They were bunched up too close, too tight. A shot that missed one of them was almost bound to hit one of the others. Maybe he could use that. But he would have to do it before he got in under their firing range. Still unwilling to kill without need, Luke thought fast. Suddenly he thought he saw a way. He switched the fire control selector from laser to torpedo and rapidly punched in a series of commands, reprogramming one proton torpedo for distant proximity fusing. Suddenly all three LAFs fired at once, concentrated volley fire. It would seem the LAF pilots were managing to coordinate their fire in spite of the communications jamming. Maybe these pilots knew their business better than he thought. The laser blast slammed into the X-Wing, and Luke gave thanks that he had thought to reactivate the shields when he did. The X-Wing's forward shields handled the multiple hits, but just barely. Luke knew he had to get out of here, and fast, if he was going to live through this. One last trick. He fired the reprogrammed proton torpedo square into the center of the LAF formation. The X-Wing shuddered slightly as the torpedo leapt away. Part of what Luke was counting on was the element of surprise. No one used proton torpedoes in fighter-to-fighter encounters. They were slower and less accurate but more powerful than turbolasers, intended for use against bigger targets. The three LAFs fired in volley again the incoming laser blast streaking past the outgoing torpedo. Luke's X-Wing shuddered from stern to stern as the second laser volley slammed into it. Luke checked his shields and shook his head. The next volley would punch through his shield for sure. Luke cut his engines, letting the X-Wing move on its own forward momentum alone. Let them think he had lost engine power. It might make him that much harder to find when the proton torpedo exploded precisely in the middle of the LF. Formation, lighting up the sky. No doubt blinding the pilots, at least for a second or two, and with any luck scrambling half their instruments as well. Luke re-engaged his engines, accelerating at maximum power, right into the blast of the proton torpedo, right through the middle of the opposing fighter formation. The X-Wing bucked and slammed and shuddered as it flew straight into the explosion's shock wave, its weakened shields offering just barely enough protection. Luke flew into the blast of the torpedo, hanging on for dear life as he rode the maelstrom. Then, suddenly, it was over. He was through clear, safe. Luke checked his detector screens. Two of the LAFs were tumbling, clearly disabled, at least for the moment while the third seemed to be in only marginal control. One of the disabled fighters seemed to be starting to recover as he watched, but Luke knew better than to stick around to SEC how it all came out. He came about on a new heading, straight for Salonia. Luke breathed a sigh of relief. That one had been just a bit too close. 
There were times when the advantages of being a Jedi Master could turn around and bite you, no doubt about it. A regular fighter pilot without the power to use the Force wouldn't have felt any moral obligation to risk his own life while using the Force to spare his enemies. Luke smiled faintly to himself. One of these old days, his moral obligations to spare life were going to get him killed. Artu whistled again for his attention. Luke reconfigured his power levels back to normal distribution and leaned back in his pilot's seat. All right, Artu, he said. What is it? Artu took control of the main status display screen and showed him. The display page to communication status, and Luke saw it there for himself. The communications jamming is down, he said. But why but Artu answered Luke's question before Luke could finish asking it. The screen cleared again, and Artu began playing back a message he had recorded even as Luke was chasing off the LAFs. A grinning, stylized human skull with a knife between its teeth appeared on the screen, with a blaring shout of triumphal music behind it. Luke recognized the skull. The symbol of the Human League. The skull faded out to be replaced by the only somewhat more pleasant features of a smiling Thraken Sal Solo. But Luke was not smiling as he listened to what the man had to say. Chapter Eleven. The ripples spread. It was evening, and Kivitz and Drachmus were just on the point of leaving. Han had lost count of the number of times they had come to Ely, asking if Leia had changed her mind yet. This had to be the third or fourth visit already today. Clearly, they did not know when to give up. Leia, Han, Mara, and the Salonians were all in the living room of the prison villa, standing up, saying their pointless diplomatic goodbyes, when suddenly the comm system in the corner came to life, all on its own. A blare of static filled the room. Han was startled enough to jump half a meter in the air but the others took it all a bit more calmly. Relax, Han, said Mara. Someone out there has just used the auto-on system. That's all slash it was possible to turn most comm systems on by remote control, so that the authorities could make an emergency announcement. The flat field screen came on, showing a crazy quilt of shifting, scrambling color. Then the image settled down to show a grainy image of a huge grinning skull it appeared to a thunderously loud and distorted musical accompaniment. The graininess and distortion told Han that the signal was being broadcast by a transmitter that wasn't quite up to the job, some piece of equipment that was being pressed into service. Even as he judged the technical quality of the broadcast as a matter of reflex, it took Han a moment to realize the full implications of the system's power on. Hey, wait a second, he said. This means the jamming is down. Now we can. Sure, quiet Leia said. If it's worth it to Thraken to shut off the jamming just to make an announcement, it has to be important. I want to hear it. She hit a button on the comm system's control panel, setting it to record the message, then sat down in front of the comm screen. How arc you knowing it is Sal Solo who dash? Began Drachmus, when the skull image faded away and sure enough, there was Sal Solo himself, seated in what looked like the control room of a small military craft of some sort, smiling with every bit of the warmth and kindness of the skull his image replaced. There was something awkward, a bit clumsy about the setup, as if it had been improvised. The image wobbled a bit as if it was coming from a handheld holographic recorder. Greetings to all of you throughout the Karelhan system. I Thraken said as a bit of static scrambled his image for a second. I am Thraken Salsolo, dictat of Corklia. I have ordered that all communications jamming be turned off, so that I might inform all those in the Karelian system our friends and enemies alike, of two very important new prizes that human league troops, acting under my command, have won. First, let it be known that we have gained control of Drawl's planetary repulsor. The New Republic kept even the existence of this extremely powerful device secret from you, 
the people of the Karelian system. Because we didn't know it existed. Han muttered. SHHHH. Hissed Leia. But now it is our possession. Soon we will control the repulsor on the planet Karelia as well. I understand that these devices are unknown to all of you. Suffice it to say that with these powerful weapons we shall be able to protect ourselves from all our enemies, whoever they may be. Drachmas turned to Clavitz. The League now has the draw repulsor? She demanded. What will this mean? The second prize that we have won is of a more personal nature. Thraken went on. We have rescued the three children of Leia Organa Solo, chief of state of that same new republic. Han felt the blood drain from his face, felt his heart turn to ice. He looked to Leia and saw the same horror there. We have saved them from the aliens who held them prisoner. Thraken went on. They are safe here with me now. I look forward to my chance to return them to their mother. First, of course, she must make her whereabouts known to us. She herself must come out of hiding and confirm her recognition of the Karel Man sector's freedom. I offer this video imagery to prove that I have the repulsor and have the children safe. Of all the lowdown, dirty, rotten dash, Han growled. The lies that man tells. The screen went dark again and then showed a vast, silver cylindrical interior space, as seen from the bottom. The image was a bit wobbly still, and the resolution was not all it could be. But the picture was clear enough for all of that. The Hoya Cam panned about to show an assault boat and the Millennium Falcon sitting at the bottom of the cylinder. Men in uniforms walked purposefully about the two ships. The Hoya Cam panned up to show six huge cones rising from the floor, and a seventh, larger than the others, in the center of the chamber, with the sky visible through the top of the chamber. It is at least most certainly identicalish to our own repulsive dash, said Drachmas, before Clavitz cut her off with a warning glare. The holocom view swung back down to the floor of the chamber, and zoomed into a group of forlorn-looking figures sitting and standing in a confined space. The view faded away, and then the image brightened to show a closer view of the sad-looking group. It was the children, held inside a force field containment, with Chewbacca, Ebrahim, and a draw Leia did not know held in an adjacent containment. The cam moved from face to face, showed a close-up of each of them. Jason, looking sad but determined, Jaina worried, her gaze straying to Anakin, Anakin glaring straight at the cam. His face was streaked with tears, and he looked snuffly, as if he had just calmed down after crying. The cam moved along to show Thraken, smiling coldly. Leia choked back a sob, and Han felt a lump in his own throat. Thraken had them. Thraken had stolen children, Han's children. Thraken had kidnapped his own flesh and blood. But then Han felt his sickness at heart. His fear, his horror, turned to cold, hard anger, clear-sighted anger. Thraken wanted them scared and shocked. But already Han was determined not to give Thraken what he wanted. The holocom panned to the second drawl, and then, at last, to Chewbacca. There was something in Chewbacca's stance, in Chewbacca's expression, that gave Han hope. Chewbacca stood tall, he looked at the holocom, bared his fangs at it. He didn't look or act remotely beaten. Han knew Chuya and that was not a Chewbacca who thought he was beaten. In that instant Han knew, knew beyond doubt, that Chewbacca still had a trick or two up his sleeve. Or at least he would have, if he wore clothes. The image faded away and returned to the original shot of Thraken in the ship's control room. That will be proof enough f, all that I speak the truth, Thraken said as another ripple of static whipped through the broadcast. I await the answer of the Chief of State, and as dictat of the Independent. Sector of Karelia, I call upon all Karelians to grant me their true allegiance. 
The skull and dagger image came back up, there was another blare of martial music, and the screen went dead. Han Han he's got our children. He's got our children, and we we can't do what he says. We can't. Leia looked to her husband, her eyes full of tears. I know, said Han, the words tearing at his insides. It wouldn't do any good, even if we tried. What good would it do even if Leia? Said the words, even if she confirmed Corellian independence? At the very least, she would be driven from office, more than likely arrested on a charge of treason, and Taik agreement repudiated and that would be nothing more than simple justice. It was plainly obvious Tai Corellia could not be allowed to break away, or else the whole new republic might well collapse. Even a failed attempt, a failure that managed to seem noble and heroic, that looked like patriots struggling to throw off tyranny, would badly weaken the new republic. Perhaps weaken it fatally. And how many would die in a new round of wars and rebellions? How many children of other parents would be murdered in those battles? Backslash no we can't. Ihan said the words ashes in his mouth. But how can we let him have them? This is most horrifying, and most bad, said Drachmas. Thraken turns even more deeply against his own blood, his own den and clan. Klavitz turned toward Dremus. What is it you are saying, Hunchuzu? It was plain that, Hunchuzuk, was not meant as a compliment when it came from Klavitz. Know you not, eminent Klasivils? Thraken Sal Solo is of the blood of Han Solo, of Leia Organa Solo's children. Close as two clans of the same den. He threatens his own. Impossible, Clavitz said. How could any being do such a thing? I am astonished. Astonished by so. Many things. Thraken asks that you confirm your recognition of Corellian independence. Have you indeed recognized his claim? I do not understand, and I must. Thraken Salsolo lied. Drachmas said, the disgust plain in her voice. He said things that were not true, for his own gain. Half of what he said was false, or else truth phrased to make lies seem true. Impossible again. He said that. Quiet. Both of you. Mara shouted. It is possible, and he has done it. She gestured with her arm to indicate Han and Leia. He has done it to this man, and this woman, and their children. Respect their shock and sorrow. Be gone. Give them time for shock, for grief, and take your foolish debates elsewhere. No! shouted Han. All his anger at his cousin, his blazing hot fury at the villainy of his own relation, suddenly found a new target, one closer to home, one that he could strike at and do some good. Suddenly he found words that were weapons, weapons that could strike at the bumbling, seemingly reasonable, manipulative, dissembling enemy who stood before him. Stay where you are. You, Clavitz. How dare you sneer at Thraken Salsolo, because he holds those of his blood hostage for gain. You do the same. You hold us. But but you are not of my family, not of my blood. Han stabbed his finger at Drachmas and spoke. She is of your blood, and you hold her spirit hostage by holding us, by forcing her to collaborate with you in goading us, harassing us. She has saved my life, and I hers. She has risked her life for mine, and I have risked mine for hers. She has vouched for me with your folk. She has granted me her protection. We have lived and fought together. No, it is not blood but it is family. We have claims on each other, of duty and respect. We were allies against you and your overden. Now you force her to spit on her allies against her will, for your own amusement. Honored Solo, please no more. Drachmas said. There is much more, much more. 
Han said to Drachmas. Your people speak the truth and have no skill in lies. Can you say, with honesty, that anything of what I say is wrong? Drachmas suddenly seemed smaller, sadder, pushed down. No, she said, I cannot. Suddenly Han was inspired. Suddenly he had an idea, a hunch, an instinct. It might be wrong, but if it was right, if it was right, and he understood the Salonians properly. Yes. Yes. Then let us have more truth, Han said. You, Clavitz, speak now of your repulsor. Who operates it? Whose hand paws are on the controls? Clavitz looked suspiciously at Han. Why, those of good Salonians, of course. But whose Salonians? Han demanded. Are they yours? Are they of the Overden? There was a moment's deadly silence, and Clavitz stood stock still, only her eyes moving back and forth from Han to Drachmas. Then her whiskers twitched once, involuntarily, and the claws of her hand paws extended just a hairbreadth before retracting. I must say no more about that, she replied. Han felt an angry jubilation, a moment's brutal glee. He had won. He knew it. But he could not play the next card in this hand of Sabak. Only Drachmas could turn it over. This was he crucial moment. Drachmas could choose not to hear what she had heard, or else. You are wrong, eminent Clavitz. Drachmas hissed from behind clenched, fully exposed, needle-sharp teeth. You arc wrong down to the depths of your dishonored soul. You must, indeed, say more about it. You must say a great deal more. I must say no more. Who? Drachmas demanded. Who controls the repulsor? We capitulated because you had shown your power. But the power was not yours. It is dishonor. Who? I must say no more. I will be Ansaridi. Bellow Drachmas, a Drachmas who suddenly seemed the size and spirit of an enraged Wookiee. Her eyes blazed, her fur bristled. Her claws were out, her teeth were bared, and her tail stump eye ashed with anger. Who? It is they are they are the, the castouts. The Sikorians. The Salonians of the Triad. I. Sweet burning stars, I Mara whispered. The Sikorians. The Triad. I don't believe it. The room was silent again, but the silence seemed to echo from every corner, to shout at them all, to fill the room with its deadly emptiness. If an Outworlder, a human skilled in lies, had told me such a thing, I would join with the honored Jade and refuse to believe it. Drachmas said, speaking at last, speaking in a voice as low, as quiet, as threatening and ominous as far off thunder. But you, a Salonian, speak the words, Klesivitz. And I am forced to believe. The words sicken me. The truth fills me with revulsion. Clavitz dropped to all fours and cringed at Drachmas's feet. Plainly, it was no empty ritual. It was Clavitz submitting to Drachmas and begging for mercy. Rise up, snarled Drachmas. Rise up and come with me. Others must be sickened by the truth. Others must hear. And then the days of the Overden will be over. Klesivitz got up on her hind legs and bowed deeply to Drachmas. Drachmas did not acknowledge the bow, but turned and left the room, her head held high, the humans forgotten. Clavitz followed after her, head down, shoulders slumped, the roles of victor and vanquished utterly reversed. And suddenly the humans were alone. I don't understand, said Han, drastically understating the case. I had a hunch there had to be some ringers brought in. I figured it had to be outsiders who had researched its operation that were actually running the repulsor. I figured that would make Clavitz look a little bad but nothing like that. 
What happened? I'll explain later, Mara said. Right now, see to Leia. Han turned toward his wife, who had sat back down in one of the splendid, luxurious chairs that filled this splendid, luxurious prison of a villa. She was sobbing quietly to herself, the tears falling quietly. Oh, Han. Our children. That man has our children. I know, said Han. I know. But he is not going to keep them. I promise you that we will get them, but suddenly Leia was on her feet, looking up, an eager, faraway look in her dot eyes, the change in her demeanor bewilderingly fast. Han exchanged a glance with Mara, and it was plain they were both wondering, for a fleeting moment, if Lysia had suddenly become unhinged. But Han should have known better. Leia was made of sterner stuff than that. It's Luke, she said. Luke is coming this way. I can fee him, reaching out with the force to me. He's homing in on me. How soon is he coming? Han asked. How fast will he? Han's question was answered even as it was drowned out by the roaring thunder of a fast, low-flying aircraft. The tremendous noise filled the room, rattled the windows, and knocked several knickknacks off side tables. The sound receded as suddenly as it had arrived, as Luke's X-Wing buzzed the villa. Han rushed out the open doors and saw the X-Wing flying off into the distance before swinging around to make another pass. The X-Wing came in low and slow this time, circling the villa. Lysia and Mara had joined Han outside, and all of them were frantically waving their arms, as if there was some mad chance that Luke would miss them after flying in directly on top of them with pinpoint accuracy. The X-Wing made one long, slow circuit around the perimeter of the villa, firing one or two bursts of turbolaser fire to encourage the guards to be on their way. The guards took very little convincing. By the time the X-Wing set down next to the Jade's fire, they were all headed straight for the nearest spot on the horizon. The canopy of the X-Wing swung open and Luke climbed out as fast as he could and jumped to the ground. He threw his arms around his sister, and then around Han. Mara hung back from these more effusive greetings, but at least managed a sincere-looking smile for Luke. Oh, Luke, it's been so long, and so much has happened, said Leia, giving him yet another hug. That it has, Leia, that it has, said Luke. I don't know that it's been all that much time, said Han, but I'll go along with the part about a lot happening. The last time they had seen Luke, he was bidding them all farewell on their way to a nice, quiet family vacation on Corellia. Han hadn't expected to encounter anything more exciting than a walk down memory lane, or anything more deadly than an excessively dull diplomatic reception. Things had not turned out as expected. It did seem a lifetime ago since they had seen Luke, but how long had it really been? A few weeks? A month or two at most? The constant changes from planet to planet, the differences in length of day and time zone, all made it hard to keep track. All he knew for sure was that it seemed as if everything had been happening at once for a long, long time. Luke looked up from his embrace with Han and Leia and nodded to the other party present. Hello, Mara, he said. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, Luke, she said, and it seemed to Han as if the hard edge of her voice was just a trifle softer than usual. I wish the occasion could be happier, Luke replied. I saw Thracken's broadcast. I don't know what to say, except I'm sorry. We'll get them back. Leia. I promise we will. I know we will, Luke, said Leia. I know. But thank you. Look, said Mara, no offense to anybody, but Luke's chased off all the guards. I'll bet we can crack open the force field around backslash 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 J. Jade's fire pretty quick if we tried. 
Shouldn't we be escaping along about now? Luke shook his head. Let's get your ship clear, by all means. But I think it might be smart if you stayed right here for now. If I've got this worked out right, we're going to need a lot of help from the people who are holding you, and we'd better slay where they can find us. Why? What? Asked Han. What's happened? A lot, said Luke. Most of it bad. Though maybe there's some good news, as well, buried underneath it all. And that's where our Salonian friends come in. Han looked at Luke and sighed wearily. It never is simple, is it? Come on, kid. Let's head inside. I think it's just about time we all sal down and compared notes. Q9. Q9. Come in. Q9. Are you there? Of course I am here, Q9 replied. I'm here, right where you left me, upside down in a storage bin. Where else would I be? The droid had grown quite tired of his hiding place and become quite irritable as a result. An interesting rhetorical question, said Ibrahim, his whispered voice coming in via the droid's corn link system. But never mind. Suffice to say that we would like you to come over here now, if you would. With pleasure, replied Q9. Or more accurately, I will take great pleasure in getting out of this smuggling compartment. However, I will come to you, assuming I can get to wherever it is you are being held. We are quite nearby, within sight of the ship. Very good. But let us discuss a point or two before I come. My built-in surveillance gear detected the cessation of jamming quite some time ago. It is two hours since I monitored Thrak and Sal Solo's broadcast. Parenthetically, I must add that none of you were looking your best in that. But in any event, why have you waited until now to call me? I? We have been waiting for the Human League troopers to go to sleep. The last of them turned in about an hour ago. It would seem they are now all quite soundly asleep on board the assault boat. Why have they not posted a guard? Why are they so lax? I-7. Ibrahim laughed. We arc. At. The. Bottom. Of. A. Sheer-sided, kilometers deep pit, we arc being held inside a force field, and of the two ships available, one is non-functional, and the other is full of enemy troops. I expect they simply felt rather secure in their situation. It could be a trap, I said Q9. They could be trying to lull you into a false sense of security. They are the ones with a false sense of security. They do not know we have a comm link, and they are unaware of your existence. Where did you get the comm link? Q9 asked suspiciously. T did not know that you had one. How do I know you are Ibrahim? How do I know you aren't a human league agent posing as Ibrahim? How do I know this is not a trap to lure me out of my hiding place? Q9 could hear the sound of Ibrahim sighing wearily. Q9, I do believe that you have developed a paranoid streak. You would develop one too, if your main circuits were shorted out by a maniac child and you were barely given a chance to double-check your repairs before you were stuck in a dark hole for a day. I have been in an inverted position for all that time, wondering what could happen to me next. I have come up with quite a number of alarming possibilities. I see, said Ibrahim, a note of impatience creeping into his voice. That is most unfortunate. Let me see if I can put your mind somewhat at ease. We did not tell you we had a comm link because we were somewhat pressed for time when we were captured. I myself did not learn that Chewbacca had concealed the comm link on his person until long after we were off the ship. As for the other matter, I am indeed Ibrahim. The receipt of sale shows that I paid 1,250 drawlish crowns for you. 
However, in reality, at the last minute I managed to talk your owners into a discount for cash of a hundred crowns, a detail which I forgot. When I inadvertently reported the higher amount as a deduction on my taxes, you pointed out the discrepancy to me and threatened to turn me in if I did not correct it. At the time I seriously considered selling you for the eight extra crowns I was forced to pay in taxes as a result. There have been many times when I have regretted my decision to keep you instead. Does that satisfy you? I suppose so, Q9 said doubtfully. Very good then. Now stop acting like a mentally unbalanced victim of paranoid dementia and get the blazes over here as quickly and quietly as you can. Ibrahim out. No need to be so irritable about it. Q9 said to himself, knowing full well Ibrahim had shut down his calm link. I see nothing demented in my effort to ensure my own self-preservation. He paused for a moment. On the other hand, there is something distinctly peculiar about a droid that has started talking to itself. Master Ibrahim may well have a point concerning my mental state. Ah, well. Q9 gently activated his repulses, so they pushed the camouflaged cover up off the smuggling compartment. He let the cover get about a third of a meter high, and then lowered power to the port side repulsor causing the lid to slide down to that direction and fall to the deck with the eye out clunk, it was more noise than Q9. Would have preferred to have made, but he had little choice in the matter. Q9 extruded a pair of manipulator arms and slowly pushed himself straight up out of the compartment, until his body was completely out of the hole. He rotated his body around on the ball and socket joints of the arms until his base was pointed straight down. Then he activated his repulsors again and drew the two arms back into his body. It was a distinct relief to be right side up again and out of that hole. Q9 floated around the Falcon's circumferential corridor until he came to the access ramp. The ramp was open and down, which saved him the trouble of opening it himself and saved that much more noise as well. However, it did represent lax enough security that Q9 could not help but worry anew that it was all an elaborate trap. But if it was, he had already revealed his position, and he was as good as caught, anyway. He might as well press on. He moved down the ramp and out onto the wide expanses of the repulsor chamber's interior. It was dark, the chamber lit only by the dimmest of starlight. Q9 switched over to infrared, and suddenly the chamber was ablaze with illumination. He moved forward about 30 meters from the falcon, and then stopped. He spun his upper dome in a complete circle, scanning the interior. As Ebrahim had promised, the prisoners were indeed easy to spot. Six warm bodies inside a force field were a fairly obvious target. Obvious enough that Q9 was not exactly thrilled to be moving toward it. He consoled himself with the notion that he himself was probably a first-rate target in infrared anyway. He completed his scan, and got a good range and bearing on the assault boat as well. Just as well to keep a sensor pointed in that direction. Q9 floated briskly toward the force field containment, and came to a stop precisely one meter from its perimeter. I'm here too, he said. Now what do you want? It was not easy to judge drawlish expressions in infrared, but it would seem that every hern was glaring at him. Most beings would find that obvious. He said, I want you to get us out of here. Of course, said Q9. To pose a rhetorical question, what else would you want? Q9 rotated his view dome left and then write. Any suggestions on how I might accomplish that? Around the other side, Ebrahim said. The control panel for the containment is on the children's side of the dome. Ah. So it is, Q9 said, realizing that he was suddenly feeling quite cheerful. He floated briskly around to the other side of the containment, and saw the control panel on the outside, and the children on the inside watching him. Good evening, children, he said, 
in a most lighthearted tone of voice. How are all of you this evening? He bobbled up and down on his repulsor, in rough imitation of a little bow. Anakin regarded him gravely for a moment or two, and then turned to his brother and sister. Q9 is acting weird. He announced, Am I? Q9 asked, A moment please, while I run a behavioral diagnostic. Q9 activated the appropriate routines and ran them against his action log for the past hour. You're quite right, young Anakin. I am behaving somewhat erratically. It might well have something to do with being roasted alive and being stuck in a storage bin for hours on end, but that's all as may be. We're all friends here. In any event, rest assured that my actions and reactions are still within acceptable limits. Quite so. It is one of the flaws of the Q9 series design. Ebrahim said, speaking to the children in a quiet voice from the far side of the vertical wall that divided the containment. At times, they do not respond well to periods of extended stress. But then, who does? Q9 asked. He may exhibit fairly drastic mood swings for a time, but he should settle down after a while. Ebrahim said. We'll just have to deal with him as he is for the time being. Great, said Jason. We're counting on a manic depressive droid to break us out of here. And break you out I shall, said Q9. Just tell me how. He spun his view dome about to check again on the assault boat, and then spun it back, a bit abruptly. But be quick about it, before the guards have a chance to awaken. Yeah, said Jason. Right. Anakin is the one to ask. Ah, yes, Q9 said. Anakin, master of all machines. Just tell me what to do, and I shall do it. So long as pushing the wrong button doesn't drop the planet into the sun, or any such trivial inconvenience. Q9, said Ibrahim. You must control yourself. Settle down. It is most important. My apologies, said Q9. Strange how they were all fussing over him now, when most of the time they barely gave him a moment's notice. That is, when they weren't actively against him. Interesting, he said. I already seem to be slipping back into a depressive paranoid phase. Just just try and keep your thoughts ordered and balanced. Ebrahim said soothingly. Anakin, get him started. Ah, uh, okay, Anakin said. The control panels turned away from us, but I think there's a big slot for a sort of metal key right in the middle of it. Can you see it? How did you know that was there if you can't see it? Q9 asked suspiciously. I saw the other guy using it, Anakin said, glancing toward Jason a little doubtfully. It's there, right? Yes, it is. Ibrahim said that sometimes you can use your manipulator arms to pick locks and stuff. Do you think you could pick that one? Q9 extruded a close-up view cam on the end of a flexible arm. It carried a small illuminator light at its end, right next to the cable. He switched on the illuminator and brought the cam to bear on the lock. He examined it carefully from several angles, then turned off the illuminator and retracted the close-up cam. No, he said. Oh, Anakin said. That's not good. Is that it? Q9 asked. Can I go now? No, Anakin said. He shut his eyes and extended his hand out toward the control panel. I can almost do it but I can't see the controls the way I can see the inside. He shook his head and opened his eyes. Read me what the labels say. Read me all the buttons and switches. Q9 extruded the close-up cam again and turned on the illuminator to examine the display. It is a most archaic system of controls, he said. The first dial is labeled main power select that's the one with the lock on it. 
The selector can be set to off, single containment, double containment, or quad containment. It is set to double. Below that is a dial marked overall intensity. It is marked off from 1 to 11, and is set to 8.5. Twist that one down as far as it will go. Anakin said. Q9 extruded a manipulator arm and twisted the dial to the left as far as he could. It will not turn any lower than the point mark 2. I would conjecture that it cannot be turned lower without the key. Right, right, said Anakin. The boy reached out his hand and probed cautiously at the force field. He seemed to be able to push his hand slowly into it, but only by a few centimeters. No, no, said Anakin. Still too strong. Read me the other controls, he said. There are three dials. The first is lit up. It reads double containment left side relative intensity. The dial is marked from 1 to 11, with the dial set at the center point 6. The other two dials appear. To control quad mode settings. As we are clearly in double mode, the quad settings are not of any consequence. Twist the double level to one side as far as it will go dash. Q9 did so, and the force field forming the children's containment promptly darkened, so much that the effect was plainly visible even in the near darkness of the repulsor chamber. Turn it the other way, Anakin said. Q9 did so, and the field faded away again until it was completely invisible, even in infrared. Anakin pushed at the field again, and it gave a bit more this time but even pushing as hard as he could, he could not get out. Any more controls on that thing? Anakin asked. That is all, Q9 replied. Thought so, Anakin said. Couldn't feel anything else. Then why did you ask me? Because I wanted to be sure. Anakin said. Don't act so weird, okay? Am I still behaving strangely? Q9 asked. Or do you just want me to think I'm behaving strangely? Is that your plan? Q9, we don't have lime for this. Said Jason. Later. Whatever it is you're doing, do it later. All right. Q9 looked at him suspiciously. I am not doing anything besides following orders. Never mind, Anakin said. Q9 is at all as low as it can go? So it makes the field as weak this side as it can be? As low as it can go without the key, yes. All right, said Anakin. Hope it's good enough. Here goes. He extended his arms in front of him and spread out his stubby fingers as far as they would go. He shut his eyes and stepped forward until his hands were in contact with the force field. Gotta move slowly, he reminded himself. Pushing slowly, gently, he thrust his hand deeper and deeper into the weakened force field. The field around his hands began to shimmer and spark brightly at first but then fading away, until Anakin was standing in a pushed-out bubble of the force field, a bubble that was marked by dim, shimmering flickers of power. Anakin pushed farther on, but seemed unable to make further progress. Help me, he said to his brother and sister. Jason and Jaina stepped cautiously forward into the extruded bubble of the force field. Jason shut his eyes and stretched out his hands. He frowned and shook his head. I don't see what you are, oh, I get it. He pushed out his hands farther, and Jaina did the same. The bubble lit up again with shimmers and sparks that did not light up quite as much as they did the first time, and that faded away more quickly and more completely. Try again, Anakin, said Jaina. Anakin pushed on the force field with just his left hand this time with slow, steady pressure that stretched the field farther and farther. And then, moving quite slowly and gently, he bunched up his fingers into a fist and extended just his index finger. He pushed forward with his finger, 
stretching the field farther and farther until, at some gradual and indefinable moment, the tip of his finger was through and outside the field, on the other side. Jason, take my hand, said Anakin. Jaina, take his. Jason grabbed his brother's right hand in his left, and Jaina took Jason's right in her own left hand. Anakin pressed onward until his whole finger, his whole arm, his shoulder, his head, his chest, were through. He leaned forward, pushing slowly, steadily forward. He lifted his left leg up, forcing it gently up and through the field. The field sparked and shimmered for a moment as his legs slipped clear of it, and he set it down on the outside. His right leg seemed to move through more easily. And then, but for his right arm, he was through and on the outside. He kept moving forward, very slowly, leaning forward as he pulled, dragging his brother's arm out through the field. The field sparked and shimmered with greater violence when Jason's hand touched it. Jason winced and almost flinched backward. There was the crackle and spark of static electricity as his hand moved forward through the field. It was as if the field was resisting him more than his brother, and it was plain to see from the expression on his face that it was far from a pleasant sensation. The field seemed reluctant to let his head come through, and sparks and fire flickered about his face. His head broke through quite abruptly, and he let out a little grunt of pain as it did. His hair sprang straight out from his head, alive with static electricity, something that had not happened to Anakin. The sparks flared and flickered about him as he forced one leg and then the other through the field. Jack gasped with relief as his body broke free of the field. Anakin still held his left hand, and the two boys moved slowly out from the field as Jason pulled Jaina's hand through the field. Sparks shimmered again, but in a deeper, duller, angry color. Ow! Oh, Jaina said. It sits like fire. Just keep coming, Jason said. Your hand is free of the field. Keep your eyes shut. It's easier that way, believe me. Keep coming. Keep coming. There's your arm free. Here comes your head. Hang on. Hang on. Almost free. All right, your face is clear. That's the worst part. You should see your hair. No, don't open your eyes yet, but it's sticking straight up from your head. Good. Good. Now push your leg through. Steady. Easy does it. Good. Good. Now the other one. Up over through. Good. Just a foot to come, whoops. Jaina tumbled down onto her brother as she broke free of the field, and Jason went down, taking Anakin with him. The stretched-out part of the force field shimmered and sparked one last time, and then retracted, shrank, pulled back, merging smoothly back into the rest of the field, as if there had never been such a thing as a distortion in the field's surface. Boy, that hurt, Jaina said. Like getting a shock all over my body. I think it was worse for you than me, Jason said as the three children disentangled themselves from each other and helped each other up. Did it hurt you at all, Anakin? He asked his brother. Anakin shook his head. Nope. It sort of tickled a little bit. Well, it didn't feel nice like tickling, but sort of like that. That was impossible, of course, said Q9. What you just did was quite impossible. No one can walk through a force field that way. We didn't go through it, really, Anakin said. It was more like we went between it. Stretched it out until there was room between the field, sort of. Then I just pushed the parts apart and went through. That's all. Ah. Uh, that's all. Thank you. That makes it all quite clear, I assure you. 
Anakin, what about Chewbacca and Ibrahim and Aunt Marka? Asked Jaina. Anakin shook his head. I don't think I can do it from this side. He said. Not to pull people through. It's harder to do, the bigger and heavier you are. Can you do anything with the control panel? Jaina asked. Anakin went over and looked at the panel, put his hand over it, and shut his eyes. He concentrated, focusing his attention deep inside the device. At last he took his hand off and opened his eyes. No, he said. But you can make all sorts of machines do whatever you want. Jaina protested. Yeah, but that's easy, Anakin said. Real little stuff I can move around. I can make stuff do what it's supposed to do. But the lock insides are too big. And the lock's doing what it's supposed to do. It's already working. I couldn't ask for a clearer explanation, said Q9. But I take it you can't get the others out? No, said Anakin. Not without the key. I see you had this all carefully planned out in advance, Q9. Observed. The plan was that you would be able to pick the lock. Ibrahim said, rather severely. But that is all to one side. If we indeed cannot get out, obviously the children must attempt to escape on their own. With your help, of course, Q9. What? Q9 asked. How? How are we supposed to get away? By flying away in the Millennium Falcon, of course. Wait a second, said Jason. You want us to fly the Falcon? Chewbacca looked at Ibrahim, made a yawping sound, and then bared his teeth and shook his head. I agree that it is foolhardy and dangerous, Ibrahim said to Chewbacca. He turned to the three children. But it is nonetheless the best of many bad choices. Chewbacca, you yourself said the repairs to the Falcon were all but complete. I feel quite certain that you would have no trouble explaining to the children what still needs to be done. And I have no doubt at all they could perform the repairs. As for the rest of it, we three in here have far, far less value as hostages, and Thraken knows it. The three jewels are already outside this force field stockade. Anakin, Jason, Jaina the danger would be great if you tried to escape on your own. But I sincerely believe that the danger to you, and to ourselves, and to others, would be much less than if you stayed. Thraken is a cruel and heartless man, and I do not wish you in his clutches. As I see it, there are only two possibilities. The first is that your mother goes along with what he tells her to do. She'd never do that, Jason said. I quite agree. But if she did, I believe your uncle would decide you were too valuable to give up. He would keep you, in hopes of extracting further concessions. And every time she gave in, he would have more reason to hold on to you. I believe you would be permanent prisoners. And if Mom did give in to him because of us, a lot of other people would get hurt, said Jaina. And killed, added Jason. Precisely. The second, more likely possibility is that your mother would refuse his demands. She would do so fully knowing the consequences, and it would break her heart. But she would refuse him, all the same. Sooner or later, your cousin Thraken would either become so angry and frustrated that he would take it all out on you or else he would threaten to torture you, or actually do so, in order to get what he wanted out of your mother. Torture? Jaina said. I hadn't thought of that. Would he really? Jason asked. I think it quite possible. Even likely. Q9 looked from his master to the children and back again. There was something unstated here, something he nearly said himself, before thinking better of it. No one was saying that it would be better for the children to have a clean, quick death in a crash rather than be the unwilling pawns in a cruel game. 
a cruet game where many others would suffer, a game that could only end with the pawns being destroyed at the exact moment it suited their master. How noble, how brave of them all to say nothing at all about it. How odd that he, Q9, was having such peculiar and emotional reactions to everything. Just that moment a new and terrifying thought crossed his mind. Half a moment, he said. What about me? Ibrahim looked toward Q9 and chuckled to himself. Oh, you'll go with them, of course. What else could you do? What, exactly, do you expect Thrak and Salsola would do to you if he woke up in the morning to find the children gone and you here? Q9 thought that one through, and did not care one little bit for the conclusions he reached. I might have known, he said. It's clear now that it's all been a plot against me. It seems to me there are other beings worse off than you in all this, Ebrahim said. But never mind that. Go and go now. The longer you delay, the greater the dangers will be. But we don't know what's wrong with the ship, and we don't know how to fix it. Jaina protested. Ibrahim held up his hand with the calm link in it. We have this calm link in here, and you children can use Q9's built-in calm link to communicate with us until you re-establish the link to the Falcon's calm system. I'll have the calm link. Chewbacca can tell me what to do, and I'll tell you. We'll walk you through it. You can do it. Chewbacca nodded his agreement, and made an encouraging little burbling snarl. It's nice for you to say, said Jaina to Ibrahim, but that doesn't mean you're right. I'm sure you can do it. Now you must go, said Ibrahim. The guards could awaken at any moment. We have no choice in the matter. Go. The three children looked at each other for a moment, and then, moving as one, they turned and headed for the ship, leaving so suddenly and quietly that Q9 was taken by surprise. He hovered, motionless for a moment, before he swiveled his view dome about and realized they were gone. He raised himself up on his repulsors and took off after them. Admiral Osilich himself met the Lady Luck when she landed on the hangar deck of the intruder. He waited, resplendent in his customary dress-white uniform, and watched as the lady's hatch swung open. Greetings to you all, I he said as Lando, Gariel, and Kalenda disembarked, 3PO following behind. I trust your information is as interesting as you promise. I find it most ironic that the moment we are at long last able to speak over the comm links, we must worry about being overheard. I think you'll agree that it's all worth hearing and that it's worth being sure we keep it to ourselves. Lando said. Let's get to some place where we can talk. Of course, said the Admiral. We shall go to my private quarters. He glared at Thripio. That can stay aboard your ship, I think he said to Lando. Well, really, how inconsiderate Dash. 3PO began, but Ocelage frowned fiercely enough to silence him. The rest of you, come this way. Lando glanced toward Kalenda, but she just shook her head. No doubt the same thought had crossed her mind. The Admiral spent so much of his lime on the bridge, it had never occurred to either of them that he even had quarters. But he did have them and he led the group to them in short order. Lando had always prided himself on a sense of design, a knack for knowing what looked right. It was instantly plain to his practiced eye that Ocelage's stateroom suite was a jarring display of opposites the opulent up against the Spartan, the huge and magnificent against the small and thrifty. The room itself was spectacular, the cream-colored walls and deep blue carpets, the sheer size of it, twice the size of any other stateroom on the ship. A huge circular viewport, two meters across, took up most of one bulkhead, and out of it Lando could see a breathtaking view of drawl framed against the night sky. The indirect lighting was warm and even, coming from every side so that it was impossible to cast a shadow in the room. The personal appointments to the room, on the other hand, 
were barely there at all. A camp cot sat in one corner, with a fold-up night table by its side. The cot was made up with sharp-edged precision, the pillow plumped up and set precisely in the center line of the bed, exactly over the point where the covers and sheet were perfectly folded back. Somehow, the perfection of it all told Lando that Hordo Oselage made his own bed in the morning, despite any number of valet droids and human servants. He was not the sort of person who would trust anyone else to make his bed properly. There was an alarm clock, a portable comm unit, and a reading light on the night table, and a single, largish book as well. Whether the volume was a novel of some sort, a weighty historical tome, you a Bakuran religious text, or the Bakuran Navy regulation book, Lando could not tell. There were absolutely no other personal items at all in the room. Whatever else he did own was presumably hidden away behind the closet doors. In the far corner near the door was a Spartan, utilitarian desk with a small, neat stack of work waiting for the admiral on one side, and a much larger, but equally neat stack of work already done on the other. There were a few writing instruments lined up neatly to one side of the desk, a desk lamp, a data pad, and another comm set. Nothing else. The desk was positioned so that when the admiral sat behind it, as he did now, the splendid viewport was behind him. That was the sum total of furnishings in the room. Indeed, there were no other chairs in the room beside the one behind the desk. But even as Lando was noticing this, a gunmetal gray service droid trundled into the room, carrying three folding chairs on its back. It set the chairs in front of the desk with surprising speed and efficiency, and then was gone. The three visitors sat down facing the desk, and Oselage stared at them expectantly. Tell Rene, he said, all about center point. Lieutenant Kalenda cleared her throat and spoke, a bit nervously. The long and the short of it is that center point is the starbuster. It is the device used to make stars go nova. I see, said Oselage, in about the same tone of voice he would have taken if Kalenda had just told him the evening dinner menu. And we also are pretty sure that the planetary repulses are the way to shut center point down. Indeed? He asked in the same calm tone. Most interesting. Perhaps, he said, you could provide me with a few details. Chapter 12 Incoming The alarm buzzer squawked wildly in the tiny sleeping cabin of the gentleman caller. Tendra risen leapt up out of bed, her heart pounding. She scrambled to her feet, getting herself entangled in the sheets and nearly falling flat on her face before she got herself sorted out and headed for the control room. She didn't recognize the alarm. What in the burning suns had broken down this time? She reached the control room and checked all the displays, but saw nothing but a green board. Then she woke up the rest of the way and remembered. She had installed this alarm herself. The one that went off when the gentleman caller's Navi computer detected the interdiction field going down. The interdiction field going down. Suddenly her mind was racing. One part of her was suddenly afraid. The field coming down could mean any number of things, many of them not good. But all that was beyond her control. Later she could let her imagination run wild, let herself speculate about what it all meant. Right now the field coming down meant exactly one thing. She could get moving at last. She scrambled into the pilot's seat and set to work. Tendra had had very little practice with Navi computers before boarding the gentleman caller, but she certainly had plenty of time to practice with the one on. The ship since then. Working as fast as she could, she set up the problem, getting a fix on her present location and a precise grid reference on her intended target point letting the Navicorn pewter massage the numbers and come up with the proper values for the jump in and out of hyperspace that would get her there. 
She knew where she was well enough she had had plenty of time to practice finding that out too but the question of where to go she had never quite decided. It had seemed simpler to keep the Navaconipeter updated with all the potential destinations, so that she could decide at the last minute if there was a change in the situation. Except, now, it was time to make a decision, and she was far from decided. But she had to move fast. Whoever controlled the interdiction field might well be able to bring it back up again at any time. She did it for a moment longer, and then made up her mind. Centerpint. She would go to Centerpint. The last she had heard from Lando, it had seemed he was heading that way. She suspected that meant very little when dealing with Lando, or in time of war, let alone both, but she had to choose someplace. She punched in the proper settings and flipped the Navicorn pewter over to automatic operation. The display came on, showing a 30-second countdown clock. The clock started moving, and the seconds melted away. For half a moment Tendra considered the idea of getting set to jump to hyperspace on manual if the automatics failed. That was the way the heroes always did it in the Holovids, after all. But no. The Holovid heroes were always seasoned pilots of the spaceways, or else they were the most naturally gifted pilots the galaxy had ever seen. Besides, they were always backed up by that most powerful of allies' cooperative scriptwriters. Life didn't work that way. She couldn't count on it all turning out right by the last scene. Besides, this was exactly the second time she had ever flown a hyperspace jump. If something went wrong with the automatics, and they decided to shut down rather than proceed, it would be prudent of her to take their word for it. Better to sit out here for another month or two, going half mad with boredom, rather than have the hyperspace motors blow up under her or kick her out into the far side of the galaxy. She checked the countdown clock. Fifteen seconds. It had been a hell of a long ride so far, and even if this worked, and she got into the Corellian system, even if her Navi computer was dead on and she arrived right at Centerpoint's main docking collar, there were no guarantees that this ride was over quite yet. Ten seconds. And what about Lando? Was he alright? Was he anywhere remotely near Centerpoint? Would she even be able to find him? It was the middle of a war, after all. Things were not likely to be all that well organized. Five seconds. What was she doing here anyway? Why had she climbed into an overpriced second-hand starship to go chasing after some smooth-talking ladies' man she had met exactly once? She had always thought of herself as a level-headed sort of person. Right now the evidence was strictly to the contrary. Three seconds. This was crazy. She was about to jump into a war zone. She ought to abort the jump to light speed, reverse course, and head back home to Sicoria, where it was safe. Two seconds. No. Too late for that. If she did, she would spend the rest of her life wondering what if. One second. Instead, she was about to find out. Zero. The cockpit viewport exploded into life as the sky filled with starlines, and the gentleman caller made the big jump to light speed. Suddenly Tendra Risen didn't have the time to worry about anything at all. Oscillage stood up from behind his desk, turned, and paced the room thoughtfully. He paused in front of the viewport, and now gave a long, hard look at the planet drawl. He had no interest when it was just a lovely sight, thought Lando. Now that it has great military significance, though now he wants to take a look at it. So if I understand you correctly, he said, turning to face the others, the planetary repulsors are of far greater significance than we thought. If we possessed one in time to deflect the hyperspace tractor repulsor shot from center point then that would save all the good people of Bovo Yagen and perhaps, just incidentally, win us the war. Do I have that about right? 
Just about right, sir, said Lieutenant Kalenda. However, it is more than a question of possessing the repulsor. It is knowing how to use it. And I'm not entirely sure Thrak and Sal Solo is able to control it. But they fired it already. Not really, sir. It was in an uncontrolled startup. There was a massive burst of unregulated repulsor radiation, that's all. The Salonian repuser shot was much more controlled. And there's another reason. Remember his assault boat went into the repulsor after it was fired. We're only assuming it was his Tex who fired it. After seeing that broadcast he made, I'll tell you who I think set it off, said Lando. And who might that be? Osilaj said, smiling coldly, indulgently. An expression that said he had already rejected whatever Lando was about to say. The children, Lando said. I think they managed to turn it on by accident. The repulsor burst attracted Thraken's attention, the same as it did yours, and he got there first. Don't be absurd, Osilaj said, all but openly sneering. How could children activate a planetary repulsor? I don't know. It's possible Chewbacca did, but I doubt he would be so careless as to allow an uncontrolled burst like that. Maybe the two draw did it. But someone in that group is the one who pushed the button. I doubt it. I believe it was some of Saas Solo's people who activated the repulsor, an advanced team if you will. I believe they somehow captured the children whilst in the process of searching for the repulsor. But all this is beside the point. Sal Solo has the repulsor now. And I have a marine assault force preparing to go in and take it from him. It is just before local dawn at the repulsor site now. The marines plan to go in just after sunset tonight though I may push that forward if circumstances merit. They are holding tactical exercises and running simulations right now. Why not go in now? Lando asked. I asked Commander Putney, the assault troops commanding officer, that same question some hours ago. I assure you Putney is feeling as much anxiety as you to go at once, but it's not that simple. The main problem is that, as per my orders, their assault boats were combat-loaded for a prolonged exploratory sortie onto Centerpunt, in case that proved necessary. That is a wholly different mission than a quick strike attack against a small force in a fixed position. It simply takes time to unload the boats from one mission profile and repack for another. There are other factors. The Marine commander believes that going in during darkness will be to their advantage. He has also worked out the relative time zones and the effects of changes in local time and duration of day. He calculates that the Corellians in the Repulsa will be at their most tired, their most sleep-deprived, just about at local sunset this evening. Suffice to say that although you and I are actually in agreement on this point, and wish the attack to happen sooner, there are cogent reasons for the delay. The risks are obvious, but I believe that once all. The factors are weighed. Our best chance for success is to wait. And you're either right, or you're wrong with no way to know for sure until it's too late. Then you're a genius for guessing right, or a monster and a fool for guessing wrong. I don't envy you that sort of decision, Admiral. They stuck me with a generalship once, a long time ago, said Lando. I didn't care for it. Mostly because of decisions just like this one. You have my sympathy. Thank you, Captain Kaurishan. Given our past differences, that was most generous of you to say. Believe me, every word was sincere. But we haven't touched the main question. Do any of you believe that our friend down there, the very high and mighty Thraken Salsolo, is now able to operate that repulsor? Or if not, will he be able to soon? Hard to tell, really, said Kalenda. My working theory is that the outside force running this thing sent in technical teams, 
intending to have their own people control the repulsors and not trusting to the locals. Sal Solo would have been given enough text to cover one repulsor. Has he kept those texts home, or has he brought them along? How good are they? Do they know what they are doing? What sort of shape is the repulsor in? Was it damaged by the uncontrolled startup? Kalenda shook her head. There are too many variables. Umph. Someday, an intelligence officer will answer a question with an answer, instead of a new collection of questions. The Salonian repulsor is up and running. The draw repulsor is a question mark. What about the Corellian one, or the units on Talus and Tralus? Kalenda shook her head. We have no indication that they are functional. But that doesn't mean a thing. That they haven't been used might mean they haven't been found yet, or that the technicians have their finger on the button, just waiting for their big moment. Murk and muddle, Osilage said. All of it murk and muddle. Nothing clear, nothing absolute, no one clear enemy you can point your finger at and say it's him. Attack. What do you make of it, Madam Prime Minister? You have sat there, quite silent for a while now. Gariel leaned back in her seat and crossed her arms thoughtfully. You have pointed your finger square at the chief difficulty. There are too many enemies, and they are too vague, too uncertain, too diffuse. I think that is part of a deliberate tactic. It is meant to confuse us, distract us, get us looking in all the wrong directions. And I am afraid it has worked. We have heard so many conflicting stories, dealt with so many contradictory claims, that we no longer know what is real. All I know for sure is that we have not met the real enemy yet. I no longer believe the rebellions have any reality. The rebel groups are essentially fakes, all of them. Some are wholly artificial, and some are tiny little splinter groups, fringe organizations that the real outside force has pumped up with money and support. The partial exception is the Human League. It was a real organization, but it got financed by the same outsiders as the rest of the rebels. And I feel quite confident that the Human League is now as much in rebellion against its paymasters as it is against us. The outsiders, the external enemy, set all this in motion in order to grab the Corellian sector and damage the New Republic. But the Human League and Thrak and Sal Solo have decided to grab Corellia for themselves. We haven't seen the real enemy yet. We've only seen their frontmen, their stooges, their stand-ins. But I think that the end of the communications blackout means that we are going to meet the real enemy, and very soon. There was a discreet bleep from the intercom set on the desk. Osilage turned and walked back to the desk. Yes, what is it? He asked. Sir, said a voice on the comm unit, we've just detected the interdiction field coming down. It is fading away very rapidly and is already below the threshold to permit hyperspace travel. Is it indeed? Then I think we can assume someone or other is about to do some hyperspace travel. All stations on all ships to stand by alert. I want the detection officers sharp. Yes, sir. Sir, there is another matter. The moment the field came down, we received another communication from Source A. He is on the... One moment. Osilage stabbed a button down on the comm, cutting off the speaker. He picked up the comm's handset. Rare to see a handset, thought Lando. Even rarer to see one used. Most people were glad to talk to the empty air with their hands free rather than holding a hunk of plastic to the side of their head and talking into it. But handsets had the great advantage of keeping those nearby from hearing the conversation. And Osilage had clearly never been one for letting anyone know anything unless they needed to know it. All right, go ahead. Osilage listened. 
Is he indeed? By all means, put him through. No, no, voice only is fine. But one moment, please. Osilich put his hand over the handset speaker. My apologies to you all. If I had not promised otherwise, I would gladly include you all in this. But I gave my word to keep discussions with others source private. Gariel stood up, and Lando and Calvita took their cue from her. Of course, Admiral. We understand. Your word must be your bond. Thank you for your understanding, Madam Prime Minister. Lieutenant Kalenda, Captain Kalrishan. We will continue this discussion later. I wish I could head up to the bridge and watch the show, said Lando as the three of them stepped out into the corridor. Why can't you? In fact, I think I'll go myself, said Gariel. Well, uh, yeah, but... You're... In... Ex-Prime... Minister... And... The plenipotentiary and all that, said Lando a bit hurriedly. You're a very official person. I'm just some guy who's along for the ride. Lieutenant Kalenda? Gariel asked. Aren't you coming? No, ma'am. Not just now. I see, said Gariel, though it was clear she did not. I seem to be missing something. I should think you'd both be most eager to get up there and see what's going on. Well, yes, we are, Lando admitted. But the last thing a bridge crew needs during a crisis is off-duty personnel playing tourists. Or uninvited high-ranking guests breathing down their necks and jiggling their elbows, he thought, though he never would dare say such a thing to her out loud. I see, said Gariel. I expect that military etiquette would preclude my going as well, wouldn't it? The woman was sharp. You had to give her that much. Ah, well, yes, ma'am. In that case, to hell with military etiquette. I will go to the flag deck, which is designed with the purpose of letting those in it observe without interfering. I will not bother anyone. I will not get it into my head to start issuing freelance orders. But I am going up there to see what is going on. My, my apologies, Gary Mayam, Madam Prime Minister. I meant no offense, Lando said. At least not so much that you need to bite my head off. Gary O'Captison sighed wearily. And none taken, she said. My apologies to you. That was uncalled for on my part. But by all that's sacred, this is my mission. I'm the reason this ship is here. Luke Skywalker came to me and asked me for help, and I got it for him. And my government named me as plenipotentiary empowered to make all decisions in its name. I am entitled, I am honor-bound to see everything, know everything, before I make those decisions. But they all coddle me here, insulate Rene, keep all the awkward facts and unimportant details away from me. It was a relief to go to center point and nearly die of smoke inhalation. At least I was doing something. And now Centerprint is going to incinerate another star in three days' time. And the interdiction field has just dropped, and the devils of dark space alone know what that means. And I'm supposed to just go to my cabin and sit quietly in polite ignorance because going to the flag deck isn't the done thing? You've got a point, said Lando. And you too should see it all too, but you're not going to, because it would be rude? Yes, ma'am. It sounds ridiculous, but... It sounds ridiculous because it is ridiculous, Gariel said. She looked from Lando to Kalenda and back again. I order you to accompany me to the flag deck, right now. Lando glanced at Kalenda. He was just about certain that Gariel Captison had no legal authority under any interpretation of space law at all to issue him an order 
and he was only slightly less sure that she had no right to issue orders to Kalinda, either. But who was going to tell that to an ex-prime minister and plenipotentiary? Very well, Madam Prime Minister, he said. If you insist. Gario grinned. Oh, I do, I do, she said. So let's get going, she said and led the way. Kalenda and Lando followed, and they let her get a few steps ahead, and then a few steps more. Once she was safely out of earshot, Lando leaned over toward Kalenda and spoke in a low voice. Well, I put my foot in at that time, he said. That you did, Kalenda said, her voice just as low. But on the bright side, at least we get to see what in blazes is going on out there. Sounds good to me. On another subject, Kalenda whispered, Do you have any idea what that source of business is about? What indeed, Lando thought. There was something about the idea of a casual question from an intelligence officer that didn't quite ring true with Lando. She was not the sort of person who ever asked questions without a reason. Was it a trick question? Was she trying to see if he knew more than he should? Or did she just see him as a good analyst, a good guesser, a good source for informed speculation? Or was she just making conversation while he was getting paranoid? Not that it mattered what she was or was not after, Lando had no information. He had a guess or two, but that didn't count. The second he had heard the words, Source, he had immediately thought of the brilliantly original idea of calling Tendra Risen Source T. That brought an immediate idea to mind as to who Sorsa might be. But he knew better than to stick his neck out. You're the intel officer, he said. Your guess is as good as mine. Probably better. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Okay, okay, I do have a guess or two, I admit it. I just think I'd like to keep them to myself. Even I don't quite believe them. Kalenda laughed. Fair enough, she said. But I've got a feeling I have the same idea you do. Come on, let's hurry and catch her up, before she has us thrown in the brig for disobeying a direct order. Tendra Risen figured she had to be the first one in. She had to be. It didn't take much of a guess to figure that whoever had dropped the field had done it to jump their own ships in, or that the ships would be at the ready. But even so, she would get there first. The gentleman caller was old and slow, to be sure, but how? Many other inbound ships were there likely to be inside. The interdiction field? It was not until after the automatics activated the hyperspace drive that it dawned on her that being first might not be the best idea when jumping into a war zone. After all, she knew for a fact that there were warships waiting in system, at least some of them in the vicinity of center point the spot she was headed for. The crews of those ships would be able to detect the interdiction field going down every bit as well as Tendra could better, in fact and they would know that meant ships warships, enemy warships coming in. So the incoming ships would be on alert, because the Bakuren ships would be on alert, with their weapons at the ready in short, a fearful muddle of everyone on alert. And she would get there first. All of a sudden, that didn't feel like anything to be quite so pleased about. For fleeting seconds Tendra considered aborting the run and bailing out of hyperspace early. But if she knew two things for sure, one was that she was not a particularly skilled or practiced pilot, and the second was that, lacking skill or practice, the odds on surviving an uncalculated jump out of hyperspace were near zero. Besides, she didn't have much more than fleeting seconds to think about it. The hop she was making was not long at all. In fact, the Navi computer was already counting down the final few seconds before the drop back into real space. There was little Tendra could do besides check her seat restraint and instrument display, and hang on for the end of the ride. The Navi computer counted down to zero, 
and suddenly the viewport was a blaze of light once again, the star ohms flaring down into the all but unchanged stars of the Corellian system. The stars were the same, but not the rest of the sky. There, dead ahead, was the heart-stoppingly lovely sight of the double worlds, two blue, white, and green. Globes seen in quarter phase, their cloud tops and oceans and continents bright and clear and beautiful. And there, directly and exactly between them, the strange shape of center point, a white-gray sphere with a fat cylinder stuck on each end. Her destination was in sight. Tendra all but sobbed in relief. She had made it. She had made it. After all the endless days and weeks, time that seemed as long as months or years, she was no longer alone, cut off from the outside universe. She was here. And soon she would be able to get off this damned ship, stretch her legs a bit on something besides one little bit of ship corridor, eat something besides. Unidentified ship. This is the Bakuran destroyer Sentinel respond at once or be fired upon. Tendra would have jumped right through the viewport if her seat restraints hadn't held her down. It had been so long since the comm system had been of any use that she almost forgot how to use it. But that, almost, had best not come true if she wanted to live through the situation. She concentrated for a moment, remembered what button to push, and spoke. Um, hello, Sentinel this is, ah, uh, tender risen aboard the gentleman caller. Stand by, gentleman caller. Please activate your standard identity code transponder. What? Oh. Tendra reached over and flipped the appropriate switch. The transponder would transmit the gentleman's identity whenever queried by a standard traffic control system. I forgot that thing was off. Hasn't been much use for a while. True enough, gentleman caller. You are cleared to proceed, but are cautioned not to approach within 100,000 kilometers of Centerpoint Station. There will be no warnings if you approach closer. Sentinel out. That sounded ominous, and it definitely put a crimp in her travel plans. But it didn't take much thought to. Realize there was not much point in arguing with a destroyer. Nor did it seem the moment to call them back and ask if they knew where Lando was. But then how was she going to find Lando? And where should she go, if not to center panel? But, at that moment, the gentleman caller's detection system chimed for her attention. Tendra paged her main display to the appropriate screen to see what was up. And suddenly where to go was the least of her problems. Getting away from where she was, in any direction at all, had just become a top priority. All of a sudden she had company out here. Lots of it. The view from the Hag Bridge was certainly informative. There was no doubt about that, but what he could see from there did not exactly make Lando happy. The main screen was showing the tactical schematic display from the Sentinel, relayed back to the intruder. It showed the Sentinel, the Defender, the relative positions of Talus, Trellis, and Center Point and at least 50 unidentified ships, with more appearing at every moment. The Sikorian fleet, Lando said to Kalenda, the triad fleet that Tendra warned us about. But what are they doing here? Kalenda demanded. Whose side are they on? I think a better question might be, who is on their side? Said Admiral Osilich, who seemed to have appeared from nowhere at all. I expect they will change their minds in a hurry, but right at the moment, that fleet is in search of the people who have caused them the most trouble in this system and I'm afraid our little squadron does not meet that qualification. But who's caused them more trouble than we have? Gariel demanded. The Human League. Kalenda answered. 
The Human League hijacked their whole operation or at least tried to. Exactly, said Osilich. The Sikorians, or at least the triad who ruled that world, they were the ones behind it all. The triad? Gariel asked. That is the name given to the oligarchy, or joint dictatorship, that rules Sikoria, so-called because there are three of them. One human, one drawl, one Salonian. No one knows anything about the three dictators not even their names. In any event, they discovered the secret of Centerpoint and the existence of the Repulsus. I expect it was the Drawl who found it, buried in records in some ancient archive. The Drow. Keep excellent records. But that is not important. They recruited malcontents on the various worlds to front revolutions for them, with the intent of creating chaos and confusion something they could hide behind while digging up the repulses. They timed the revolts to coincide with the trade summon on Corellia, with the hopes of catching as many big fish as possible in SYSTCM. That part of the plan certainly worked. I expect the other revolts were set to go off at the first report of trouble on Corellia. How do you know all this? Kalenda asked. I know almost none of it. Osilich said, if you require a person to have proof, evidence, witnesses, documents before they know a thing, I am guessing. But if my guesses are wrong, I, frankly, would be astonished. But you're saying that something went wrong with the plan, I said Lando. Has there ever been a plan more complicated than crossing the street where something didn't go wrong? Osilich asked. But yes, something did go wrong. And the something was named Thracken Salsolo. Somehow or another, he inveigled his way into the inner reaches of the Starbuster plot, and he betrayed it. I expect the triad sent him technicians, and he either bribed or tortured them, or perhaps both, until they agreed to work for him. Those technicians were able to put him in control of Centerpoint's jamming capabilities and the interdiction system but not at Starbuster mode. Lando thought for a moment and nodded. That makes sense. The Starbuster seems to be running on automatic pilot right now, anyway. Somebody this triad, I guess worked out a whole detailed program for it, with stars to shoot at and the times to do it, and so on. Then they just set it running, and it hasn't stopped yet. There must be some way to transmit a stop code, once they got what they wanted. I don't suppose you've figured out how that is transmitted, have you? Osilich smiled coldly. Not as yet, he said. But in any event, getting back to Sao Solo. In the first public message regarding the Starbuster, he declared that he, not the triad, controlled the device. He laid claim to the Corellian system indeed the Corellian sector in his own name, not in the name of the triad, and made impossible demands for no better reason than to throw everyone into confusion. Then he activated the interdiction field and the communication jamming. But what was the point of it all? Lando asked. He had to know that sooner or later all those ships out there would show up, one way or the other. I'm starting to pile guesses on guesses here but my hunch is that he understood the real power of the planetary repulsors, something none of the other rebel leaders did. Controlling one gives him tremendous bargaining power with the triad. He can shut down their whole Starbuster operation any time he wants to. I think he was planning to be in control of one before he let in the Sikorian ships. And in point of fact, he is in control of one. But where did all those ships come from? Kalenda demanded. Sikoria is a pretty small planet to be able to throw that big a fleet around. Quite right, said Osilage, but I expect you'd be able to answer your own question if you gave it a bit more thought. Kalenda frowned, and then her eyes widened. From here, she said. 
they come from here. That's why none of the Karelian rebels were able to throw anything but LAFs and PPBs at us. The Sikorians had the rest of their ships. But how did the Sikorians get hold of them? Lando asked. And how were they able to find crews for that many ships? My guess is that the plain old-fashioned answer is that this is the Karelian sector, said Osilage. Practically everything is for sale or for rent in these parts. Probably the Sikorians bought or leased ships and hired crews from the rebel groups they created, the rebel groups having stolen them from wherever they could. Easy for them to arrange, when you recall that the Sikorian triad owns the rebellions. But probably the majority of the ships and crews out there are ex-Karelian defense forces sold out to the highest bidder, Kalenda said. The space-side CDF betrayed Governor General Mike Camberlecto wholesale, the first chance they got after they shot up my ship and threw a scare into Han Solo. And most of the CDF ships used to be Imperial ships. Probably a fair fraction of the crew too. They're older ships, but that doesn't mean they aren't good. And what are you going to do about them? Gairayel asked Osilich. They'd been continuing to arrive while we've been talking here. There must be 75 of them out there. Shouldn't we be getting back to center point to help out Defender and Sentinel Carrot? No, said Osilich. We will do no such thing. What? Gariel said. What do you mean? The intruder must complete her mission here before rejoining the other ships. The assault on the Repulsor is still our top priority. But Defender and Sentinel are outnumbered 75 to 2. And no one is shooting. Yet. Moving this ship toward the fleet could be seen as an aggressive act. And if it comes down to a shooting war, I doubt that 75 to 3 gives us much better odds. Frankly, 75 ships is a lower number than I expected. Either our friend Tender Risen miscounted, or the Sikorians have left a substantial reserve of ships back home. But if those ships move on Centerpint, two ships, or three, it will be impossible to stop them. Please try to understand. If we lose all our ships and control a repulsor, we win. But if we completely wipe out the enemy fleet and Thrak and Sal Solo still controls this repulsor, we have lost. And then the eight million people, or twelve million people, of Bovo Yagen, on their one planet or two, depending on what report you believe, will all die. Gariel seemed about to protest further, but she said nothing. Lando understood how she felt. It seemed as if there should have been some way to answer Osilage. Unfortunately, of course, there wasn't. Chapter 13 Evasive Maneuvers Han Solo paced the ground, back and forth, back and forth, the gravel crunching underfoot. He almost tripped over R2 once or twice until he managed to shoo the droid out of the way. Go over this one more time, he said, turning to Drachmas. The Salonian had joined Han, Leia, Luke, and Mara for dinner on the grounds of the villa. By all rights, they should have been lounging about the table, relaxing in the gentle breezes of perfect twilight, after a first-rate dinner. But Han just couldn't do it. It seemed utterly criminal just to be hanging around lolling in the lap of luxury, while the whole star system was falling to pieces. Everyone kept telling him that there was nothing they could do but wait, but Han had had enough of waiting about five minutes after Luke had told them about center point. I know I need to understand the situation, said Han, but I also know I'm completely lost. So please... Explain to me why it's in our best interest to just sit here and wait explain to me what it accomplishes. Yes, said Luke. Please do. I'd like to hear this. Very wellness, said Drachmas. Let me be trying it again. You have to start with knowing the idea that the three things that matter most to Salonians are honor, consensus, and the den. 
All else corns behind those three. Everything, and far behind. All right, that much I get, said Han. But what's that got to do with why having the Triad Salonians on repulsor duty was such a big deal? Merely everything, that's all, said Drachmus. The Triad Salonians on Sicoria descend from despised offshoot of a bloodline discredited long ago. I will not be going into the whole history, but suffice to be saying that the ancestors of the Triad Salonians disputed a just settlement in a matter of vitalness centuries ago. Some of them tried to lie and cheat their way into a position of advantage over other members of their own Denver. As a consequence, the den was split up into two groups, the victims of the fraud and the nasty perpetrators. The perpetrators were kicked off Corellia by my ancestors, the ancestors of the Hunchuzik, and also removed from Salonia by the Overden. So bad was the scandal that the victims formed a new den under a new name because the old name was utterly dishonored. Even now I must not speak it. It is obscenity, only to be used when time is right for splendidly rotten insult. This name losing had never happened to any other den ever before, and it has never happened again since. It doesn't seem quite fair to blame people for what their ancestors did, said Luke. Is muchly more fair for Salonians than humans, I am believing. Remember that the den is all. The den lives on while the individuals die. Also recall that the new individuals are virtual clones of the old ones. You humans tend to think of a den as collection of individuals. But we are not like humans. In many ways, we are more like highly intelligent social insects. We are individuals, but the individual is completely in service of the Denver. Well, nearly complete. We are something closer than your families, but not quite as close as the cells in the body. That's going a bit far, isn't it? Asked Mara. And it still doesn't seem fair to kick everyone out for the sins of the ancestors. Said Luke. Leia and I would be in very big trouble if humans did that. Drachmus bowed very slightly to Mara, an almost imperceptible movement. Maybe analogy is too far. Maybe yes and maybe no. But Master Skywalker, when you bleed, do you worry how blood cells that go out of you feel about leaving? If some of your blood cells are diseased, do you think about what is fair to cells that are still healthy when you treat the illness or do you get your blood changed completely, just to be on the safe side, just to make sure illness cannot come back? Han resisted the urge to start pacing again. It's the story of my life with you, Drachmus, but we've wandered off the point again. Thought we were talking about how humans different from us. Drachmus said. Han paused a moment, resisting the temptation to lose his temper again. He collected himself, and then spoke. I've got a feeling we're not going to get anywhere until we're all agreed on this, so okay. I'll tell you my reaction, and then maybe we can move on. I grew up with Salonians, and I never knew any of this. I admit it's embarrassing, but dash. Be not muchly embarrassed, honored Solo, Drachmus said in a soothing voice. Don't be forgetting the Salonians you met were trained and bred for sole purpose of dealing with humans. It's our job to make you feel comfy with us. I know, I know. And they did a good job. I grew up thinking that Salonians were just funny-looking humans with a few quaint customs left over from the old days. But just to round this out, I should have found out how it worked, even if your people didn't want me to know. Back in my smuggling days, I made a career. Out of knowing what the other side's worldview was like and yet I grew up knowing nothing about the people next door. It makes me wonder about the rest of my life, growing up on Corellia. How much else did I not see? Probably quite a bit, said Leia. None of us ever really sees our own culture all that well. Han rolled his eyes. Gee, there's an original thought. But even all this is off the point. 
What I was going to say was that it was embarrassing to find out how little I knew about you. Dot, but that right now I don't care about being embarrassed. Treat me like a complete idiot, but make me understand what's going on. If I've got this straight, now that Clavitz has admitted to being in the pay of the triad, and admitted to smuggling some of them back onto the planet, that changes everything, right? Right, said Drachmus. Excellent. Great. I'm glad. But how? Begging pardon? How? How does Clavitz confessing change everything? Because it means my hunches were tricked. We gave in under false pretenses. The Overden made us be thinking that the Overden ran the repulsor and had smashed the Bakuran destroyer all by themselves. All was fraud, she said, her voice growing genuinely angry. The Overden achieved a consensus favorable to themselves by trickery and deception and by involving themselves with the dishonored and nameless Denver. This is depth of crime. Even worse, the nameless Den was linked to Triad, and Triad linked to Sal Solo, who kidnaps his own, steals children. Guilt by association, Hans said. How advanced and sophisticated. Mara looked up at Han. Think it through. In a group society run by consensus, Guilt by association makes some sense. Anyway, said Drachmus, Overden and bad. No way could it be worse for them. You saw how Clavitz caved in once the truth came out. That will be happening every time Hunchuzik demands the truth of Overden Salonian. Overden will be losing so much face you'll be able to be seeing the back of their heads from the front. Hunchuzik will take over. Take over consensus, take over much property, take over possession of the repulsor. But the Sikorian Salonians are still the ones running the repulsor. Luke objected. Yes. And so we must wait. I know that human way, at least one human way to deal with such problem would be to give the Sikorian Salonians one chance to give up. If they didn't, then you go with all guns blazing nicely. But maybe everyone gets killed. You seize the repulsor, but have no idea where on switch is. Drachmus shook her head. This is not Salonian way. We will talk with Sikorian scums, nasty though job will be. We are talking with them right now. And we will talk to them. And talk to them. Finally, pressure peer pressure on Sikorians to give up will be too much and they will give up. And do more than giving up. They will cooperate with Hunchuzik, tell us how to run machinery, as part of their penance for being on the losing side. This is how it will be. We just have to sit back and wait. Sounds terrific, said Han. So what's the catch? I. The catch is all takes time. Everything I tell of will happen. Is inevitable. The trouble is like an old Salonian saying. The agreed to we do at once. The inevitable can take a little while. How big a little while? Asked Luke. Drachmus shook her head. An hour. A day. A month. A year. Luke frowned. An hour we have. Maybe even a day. But not much longer. Centerpin Station is going to fire at Bovo Yagen in just over 84 hours. Unless we fire a planetary repulsor beam at Centerpoint at just the right moment, a whole solar system dies. And a whole sector starts to panic and wonder who's next, and a whole galaxy starts to wonder what the point is of a new republic that can't protect them said Leia. And I hate to say it, said Han, but they'd be absolutely right to start wondering. Should I reset the breaker now? Jason asked. Not yet. Just a sec, said Anakin, a bit absently. One more of them to stick in. He was lying on his stomach, propped up on one elbow, leaning over the open underfloor access panel. 
He stared down into the morass of wires and cables and circuit boards for a minute or two, then reached in and pulled another of the fist-sized power shunt transpacitors. It took a good solid yank to pull the thing out of its socket. He held it up and stared at it for a moment, almost as if he could see through it, into it. Boy, did this get all melty inside. He set it to one side. Jaina, give me the one from the hyperdrive. Jaina handed him the last of the transpacitors they had gotten by cannibalizing the Falcon's faster-than-light drive. Anakin plugged it into the socket, then reconnected the power shunt board to the main sublight engine circuit. All right, he said to Jason. Push the reset. Jason was sitting by the next access panel over, where the circuit breaker board was. He held his breath and threw the switch back to the on position. There was the slightest of pauses, and then the green status light came on. Jason breathed a sigh of relief, then turned to Q9. It worked, Schwacka. We ought to have repulsors and sublight engines now. Chewbacca's voice an anxious yelp and a growl, answered, sounding as if it came from a little bit out of. The comm link mic's normal range. There was something more than a bit incongruous about a Wookiee voice coming from Q9's speaker. Chewbacca says to hurry. Ebrahim said quite needlessly. Okay, okay, we're hurrying, I Jason said, getting to his feet. He closed the panel over the breaker box while Anakin closed up the one over the circuit board. We're on our way to the cockpit now. The muffled sound of a comm link being fumbled about came from Q9's speaker and then a hoot from Chewbacca and Ebrahim's slightly exasperated voice. Give it back, he said, apparently to the Wookiee. I'll tell them. There was a slight pause, and then Ebrahim's voice again, a bit louder and clearer. Get moving as fast as you can, he said. The sun will be rising soon, and I'm sure our friend will be getting up as well. All right, all right, muttered Jason. Nag, 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 all the time. Come on, Q9, let's go. I still don't see why you couldn't have taken the time to go get another comm link out of stores, said Q9, speaking in his own voice. I don't enjoy being used as an intercom. Jason smiled as he headed for the cockpit. It saved us the five minutes of finding one and getting it tuned and matched to the one Chewbac is using. Believe me, we needed the five minutes. Don't worry. We'll switch over to the ship's main comm system in a minute. Jason paused at the entrance to the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. He had been in the cockpit many times before, of course, but this was different, very different. No one was keeping an eye on him this time, or making sure he didn't press any buttons, or shooing him away. No. This time, he was here to fly the ship. Fly her. The very idea terrified him. Want to have a contest to see which one of us is more scared? Jaina asked. Jason turned around and smiled. His twin sister and his little brother were behind him, all three of them standing fight at the threshold of the cockpit. I don't know, he said. How close do you think it will be? Not close at all. I bet I'm a zillion times more scared than you. Don't be so sure about that, said Jason. Slash bet it's a tie. I'm not scared, said Anakin. I'll fly her, if you want. I might take you up on that one if you weren't too short to reach the controls properly, said Jason. Might I remind Ale of you of the need for haste at this point? Asked Q9. I believe I have gotten over my recent bout with paranoia, but let us not forget that there really is someone out to get us. He's got a point, Jason said. He turned to Jaina. Which seat do you want? Pilot or co-pilot? Jaina paused for a moment and then smiled. Like father, like son. You take dad's seat at pilot. He'd like it that way. 
I bet mom would too. Jason smiled back at her, then climbed in and took his place at the pilot's station, adjusting the seat up as high and as far forward as it would go. Jaina did the same. All right, Chewie, said Jason. We're switching over to the ship's main comm system now. He reached over to the comm panel and threw the appropriate switch. That's a relief, said Q9. Can you still read us? Jason asked. An answering roar came from the overhead speaker, and Jason hastily turned down the volume. Good, said Jaina. All right, Jason. Seat restraint fastened? Definitely, said Jason. He glanced behind him and made sure that Anakin, seated in the observer's seat behind Jaina, also had his belt on. Q9 had clamped himself to a stanchion. Everyone set? Not quite, said Jaina. Those human league guys are going to come after us the moment we take off. Maybe we should sort of slow down good old cousin Thraken a little bit before we leave. Wait a second, protested Jason, but Jaina had already activated the fire controls for the Falcon's ventral laser cannon. Jason could hear the whir of the motors as the cannon came out of the hull. I figure one aim shot at the force field generator, and then I re-aim as fast as I can and take a crack at the assault boat. The force field generator? Suppose you miss and hit Chewie and the drawl? I can't hit them. They're behind the force field, remember? You just be ready to get us moving straight up on the repulses the split second I tell you to. I don't think we should try anything with the sublight engines until we have a little room to maneuver. Jason shook his head doubtfully. All right, he said. But be sure you remember whose idea it was to start shooting. Hold on a second. He studied his control boards for a moment and then flicked a series of power switches on. The ship gave a sort of eager little shudder, and Jason felt a low hum of power flow through the ship. There we go, he said. Repulsors and sublight engines at standby. Chewie, get as close to the center of the containment as you can and shield your eyes, and tell the others to do the same dot I. A howl of protest came over the intercom. Will you relax? Jaina said. This will work, trust me. You guys just get ready to run and hide as soon as the force field goes down. Here we go. Jaina stared down at the gunnery display, making minute adjustments to the ventral laser's aim. One aim shot. She said again. Either it works or it doesn't. Chewy, every he-man mark a get ready. And they all think I've been acting strangely, said Q9. One shot on the count of three, then I re-aim on the assault boat and shoot it up as best I can. Jason, don't boost till I tell you to, Al. Right. All right, fine. I heard you the first time. Here we go, Jaina said again. One Jason boosted himself up on his scat a bit to see what was about to happen. Two. Should he try harder to stop her? Jaina was going too far, but there really wasn't time to argue. Three. A blast of fire roared from the ventral laser cannon, catching the force field generator square in the center of the control panel. It exploded in a gout of fire that seemed to light up the entire repulsor chamber. The force field winked out of existence. The blaze of light dazzled Jason, but Jaina had been watching her targeting screen. She swung the laser cannon around in the general direction of the assault boat and fired again. The first shot missed the boat completely, the blast of light bouncing off the reflective walls of the chamber to ricochet around a dozen times before it dissipated. She fired again and hit the left rear landing skid of the boat kicking the body of the boat up a half meter or so before it slammed down to the decks with a tremendous crash. She tried one more shot and missed completely again. The blast bounced back and forth off the walls and floors of the chamber. Jason could see three figures, 
one large and two small, running for the nearest entrance to the side caverns. Good. At least his sister hadn't killed them outright when she blew up that generator. Jaina, the way those shots are ricocheting, you're more likely to hit Chewie than Thracken. She shook her head. You're right, she said. Go. Let's get out of here. Everyone hang on to something, said Jason. I've never done this before. He pulled back on the repulsor power control, and the Millennium Falcon lumbered up into the sky. Thracken Salsola went sailing out of bed and crashed to the floor of his cabin. He lay there, half stunned for a moment, and then scrambled to his feet. The room was pitch dark for a moment, but then the emergency lighting cut in. Thracken had taken over the captain's cabin in the assault boat, putting him in the only private space on board. Even so, the cabin was small enough that it took him a minute to realize that the deck was canted badly downward to the right and rear of the boat. What had happened? He could hear shouting, panicking voices in the corridor. He pulled on a robe and stepped out of his cabin. Thracken stepped out into a milling, chaotic throng, a tangled knot of frightened, confused men. He spotted the boat's captain, struggling to get forward to the control room. Thracken grabbed the man by the shoulder. Captain Thrag, what in blazes is going on? He demanded. I don't know, sir. Thrag shouted back. He was short, fat, and bald, and not the most appealing person to see in his underwear this late at night, so long since his last shave. But there was a clear-eyed, hard-headed sort of integrity about the man. He took orders from Thracken without being afraid of him. A rarity, that. Some shots, and then some explosions, at least two of them. One pretty far off, and the other right under us. I think we lost one of the landing skids. That can't be. Let's get forward. The two of them shoved their way forward to the control cabin. The captain hit the button and the hatch slid open, offering a clear view out the forward viewport. Burning stars? gasped Thracken. Look at that, said Thrag. I don't believe it. The force field generator was a pillar of fire the reflection of the flame glittering and gleaming from every corner of the silver walls of the repulsor chamber. The force field itself was gone, and the prisoners had vanished. There seemed little doubt about where they had gone, either. There was the Millennium Falcon, rising straight up off the ground, headed for the sky. After them. But the ship was hit by laser fire. Thrag protested. We have damage. We have to check it first. No. If the ship is damaged, we fly with damage. Fly. Go. That would put the life of every man aboard at risk. Every man aboard is at risk of execution right now anyway, for dereliction of duty. Thracken snarled. What about the man on watch? He should have been here. He should have raised the alert. Where is he? The captain laughed bitterly and hooked his thumb toward the rear of the boat. With the rest of the sleepy drunks back there, would be my guess. What are you saying? I'm saying look at the crew your people send me. Dregs and scum, all of them. By the time men get posted to low-life duty like tending an assault boat, a lot of other people have turned them down. What do you expect when you recruit thugs? While if they've all been rejected, then they won't be much missed when they all get killed. Launch this boat now. Thrag looked Thracken straight in the eye, and then saluted. Very well, sir. But on your head be it, he said, and sat down in the pilot's chair. Ibrahim had a very nasty feeling that he had a large patch of singed fur somewhere in the small of his back. In any event, there was the acrid smell of burned hair, and there was definitely a tender spot back there. However, 
this was not exactly the time or the place to worry about such things. Besides, his lungs were about to burst, and he was much more interested in catching his breath than in a lot of idle chit-chat about whether or not his back had caught fire. The three of them, Chewbacca, Marka, and Ebrahim were hiding at the base of the cone nearest where the falcon had been. Had been. Ebrahim watched the falcon rising straight up into the freedom of the night sky, her way illuminated by the glow of its repulsor pads and fires lit by Jaina's marksmanship. Where the ship had been. That was the key point. Nothing else mattered. Not really. It was cold and hard to say it, but even if the falcon crashed, even if Thrak and Sal Solo shot it down with the loss of all hands, this moment was a great victory. For Thrak and Sal Solo had been denied even the hope of influencing Leia Organa Solo's decisions but he had paid a price even trying to use her kidnapped children against her. Ebrahim knew the drawl, and he thought he even knew the Salonians and humans fairly well. His attempt at blackmail had no doubt sickened and disgusted thousands, millions of people throughout the Corellian system. It must have turned millions against him, turned passive dislike into active resistance. It must have gained sympathy for Leia and for the New Republic. All that would have been worth it for Thraken if he had succeeded in manipulating her, forcing her to recognize Corellian independence. Even if she had been forced into a public rejection of his demands, that would have done her tremendous damage. A mother turning her back on her children, yes, Thraken Salsolo could have done a great deal with that. He hoped deeply, profoundly, with all his heart, that the children survived. But even if they did not, they had defeated their father's cousin, their enemy, simply by getting away. Goodbye, he said into the comlink, though they were almost certainly out of range already. Goodbye, and good luck. May may the force be with you. As he watched, the assault boat lifted off and lurched up toward the sky. There was no way to be sure, of course, but as best he could tell, the assault boat had lifted with all hands aboard. That left the three of them down here alone, even more stranded than they had been before. Of course, Ebrahim had no doubt they would have plenty of company in the near future. The question was who would that company be? Jason held the controls in a death grip as the Falcon rode her repusers up into the early morning sky. They came up out of the repulsor shaft, still moving straight up but Jason knew better than to try to fly too high and too long on repulsive power alone. He would have to make the transition to sublight engines and make it quickly. The repulsors were not intended for indefinite boost in the first place and Jason knew just how much this ship had been through recently. He put his hand on the sublight engine throttles and pulled back on them as slightly and as gently as he could. The Millennium Falcon took off like a lightning bolt streaking across the sky. Jason pulled the falcon's nose up, trying to gain some altitude or at least trying to avoid diving into the ground. He swallowed hard and eased the sublights back just a trifle, and then shut off the repulses. The falcon shuddered for a moment, but then settled down to smooth flight at least for a moment or two. Then she was suddenly diving in toward the ground far below. Jason pulled back up on the stick, forcing her nose up, fighting to keep her from fishtailing all over the sky. At last she seemed to stabilize as he got the feel of the controls. But he kept his tight grip on the joystick and kept his eyes constantly flitting back and forth between the viewports and the controls. Well, we're out, Jaina asked. Now where do we go? I don't know, Jason said. We never talked about that part, but... Behind us. Anakin shouted. Look at the detector screen. Jason had to look for a moment before he could even find the detector screen. But once he did, he had not the slightest trouble reading it. There was Cousin Thraken's assault boat, hot on their heels. A blast of laser flared past the Falcon's starboard side 
and Jason flinched involuntarily jerking the ship's controls and healing the falcon up and flipping her over on her roll axis until the topside of the ship was pointed down. The falcon was suddenly climbing at about a 45-degree angle of attack, but with the cockpit pointed down instead of up. The artificial gravity system held them in their seats, but Jason could look up and back and see the ground where a piece of sky should have been. The accidental maneuver seemed to have shaken Thraken off their tail, at least for the moment, but he would be back, no doubt about it. And he'd start shooting at them again. Shields up! Jason shouted. Where where are the shield controls? Jaina asked. Chewie moved in when he rewired the cockpit. Anakin said from the observer seat. Under your left hand, sort of. The panel with the big red buttons. Where? Where? Jaina said. I don't see it. I'll get it, Anakin said. He undid his seat restraint, hopped out of his seat, and wriggled in between the two pilot stations. He reached in and flicked the safeties off a row of red switches, stabbed his chubby finger down on a big red button, and twisted two dials. All right, now shields up. Top, bottom, and forward shields at um 20%. Rear shields at full. A dull crash and a shudder that ran through the whole ship told Jason that Anakin had gotten the shields up just in time and that Cousin Thraken's aim was getting better. Was he trying to shoot them down? Were those warning shots? Or was he trying to disable them? So far, as best Jason could tell, Thraken had just used the assault boat's chin guns, low-caliber lasers intended more for antipersonnel work than ship-to-ship -ship fighting. But what did it mean? Jason knew his dad would have been able to interpret the shots, know just what Thraken intended, and what to do about it. But his father was not here, however devoutly Jason might wish that he were. Probably probably Thraken was trying to disable the Falcon, not kill them. The thought was not much comfort. Thirty seconds before, he had been worrying about figuring out where to go. Suddenly he wasn't all that interested in getting to any place at all. All he wanted to do was get away from here, right now. Shoot! Thraken shouted. Shoot, damn your eyes. I can't shoot them if I can't get a lock on them. Thrag growled. The chin guns don't have any sort of automatic target tracking. I can't fly a pursuit and try for a pinpoint disabling shot at the same time. Maybe you're that good, but I'm not. We'll see how good I am, Thraken said, climbing into the co-pilot's chair. Switch gunnery control to this station. But it's your own blood relatives, Thrag protested. I ordered you to shoot at them, and I'm going to shoot at them myself. I'm not hypocrite enough to pretend there's a difference there. Thrag turned his attention from his flying long enough to look Thraken up and down. Do your own dirty work, then, and welcome to it. He said and switched over gunnery control. But I never thought I'd meet a man who thought it a special point of pride to shoot down his own flesh and blood. Ocelage's ensign rushed onto the flag deck, almost stumbling over his own feet in his hurry. Sir, something's happened. Ocelage turned, raised one eyebrow, and regarded the young man with a withering stare. Thank you for that cogent and highly detailed report, he said. Ah, yes, sir. I'm sorry. At the repulsor. Something's happened there. We detected several energy pulses that read like laser fire and explosions and then then two ships came out of the repulsor, one in pursuit of the other. They've just gained enough altitude for us to see them over the limb of the planet. Both are being flown very badly, and one of them seems to be damaged. Two ships? Kalenda said. That's all there were down there, unless someone is playing a very cagey game. 
Ocelot stabbed a button on the flag deck's main console. Putney here, said a slightly high-pitched and nasal voice. Commander Putney, this is Ocelot. It looks like everyone has cleared out of the repulsor. Both ships have taken off. Why? Putney asked. We're not sure, but one ship seems to be pursuing the other. We need to take advantage of the situation. They may or may not have left troops behind, but even if they have, some of their troopers and most of their firepower just headed off toward orbit. We are going to seize this chance with both hands. I don't care if your assault boat is only half loaded and your troops don't. Have their pants on. I want them headed toward an assault speed landing in the repulsor now. Yes, sir, Putney replied. Our heavy weapons aren't aboard, but if we're lucky, we won't need them. We can launch in five minutes. Do it in four, Ocelage said and cut the connection. He turned and gestured toward Kalenda. Get me visual and tactical on the two ships now, he ordered. Kalenda worked the controls with lightning speed and brought up the imagery from the long-range visual scanner and the tactical. The images of two ships appeared. Both were clawing for altitude, the one in the lead flying erratically and upside down. That's the Falcon, Lando said. That's the Millennium Falcon, Han Solo's personal ship. It's flying upside down, and I think the pilot must be drunk but I'd know that ship anywhere. That's the assault boat behind it, Ocelot said eagerly. And it looks to have taken some damage. Who the devil is flying the Falcone? Kalenda asked. It's not Chewbacca, I can tell you that much, said Lando. He could fly her better than that blindfolded and with one arm in a sling and I'm not speaking poetically. Then who is it? I have an idea, but none of you would believe me anyway, said Lando. You didn't last time. Ocelage looked at him sharply. You're saying one of the children is flying that ship? You said it, I didn't, I Lando replied. The assault boat is firing again. Kalenda cried out. Direct hit but they're still flying, Lando said. They must have gotten the shields up, somehow. Ocelot peered intently at the tactical screen, trying to make sense out of the course projection, but the Falcon was flying so wildly all over the map it was impossible to know for sure. Where are they going? He demanded. Where are they headed? Whatever course they're trying to keep doesn't lead even remotely toward anything. Where do they think they're going? Nowhere, Lando said. Away. Out. Do they know we're here? Ossetage demanded. Lando shook his head. If they did, they'd be heading toward us, or hailing us, or something. They're just flying in whatever direction they happen to be heading in when the pilot managed to get control of the ship. Ossetage was plainly excited agitated and just as plainly trying not to show it. Can we get a tractor beam on either ship? Or both? Kalenda checked. Not quite. But even if they are not moving straight toward us, they're moving in our general direction. We ought to have the Falcon within tractor range in 20 seconds, and the assault boat in range 10 seconds after that. Wait until they're both in range and then get tractor beams on both of them. Pull the Falcon in, but just hold the assault boat where it is, at least for the moment. Yes, sir, Kalenda said, and set to work relaying the orders. If we work this right, said Ocelage, we can grab the repulsor and Thrak and Sal Solo, all at the same time. He looked up to the main screen, still showing the triad fleet forming up, getting ready to do whatever it was here for except for the trifling fact of an enemy fleet massing for the attack, I think we might be in very good shape indeed. The Falcon lurched wildly to one side as the assault boat managed another hit. 
Shields didn't like that one. Anakin said, watching the defense display. That's it, said Jaina. I've had it. Let's give them some of their own back. Powering up ventral laser cannon and setting for aft aim. What? Jason cried. Are you out of your mind? I think you're all out of your minds, Q9 said. Quiet, Q9. Jason, he's already shooting at us. How could shooting back make things any worse? I don't know, said Jason, but I bet we find a way. Ventral laser on auto target seek. I've got a target lock. Jaina squeezed the trigger, and the laser cannon blazed away. Hit him, she said. Shields absorbed the shot, but I made him back off a little. Shields down 5%, Frag said. A nice clean shot, and no mistake. If that had had any power behind it, we'd be a hulk in space right now. Shoot at me? Fracken said. Those miserable whelps have the gall to shoot at me. Activating main armament. But you'll blow them out of the sky. Thrag protested. You need them alive. But I want them dead, said Thrak and Sal Solo. Main armament powered up and ready to fire. Jason risked a peek at the detector screen. Jaina, he's not backing off. He's bringing his main turret cannon to bear. We've got to get out of here. Hang on. Jason pulled back up on the stick, pulling the nose of the falcon up. The falcon climbed over its nose, into an inside loop, up and over before pulling out of the loop, right on Thraken's tail. Anakin. Forward shields to full. Jason shouted and his little brother scrambled to reset the switches, just in time to deflect a near miss from the assault boat's turret gun. The falcon bucked and shuddered, but her shields held. We're in behind their shields. I have a shot. Hang on. Jaina called. She fired twice. The first caught the turret gun right at the join with the assault boat's upper hull, blowing the gun clean off the hull. The second caught the sublight engine array, smashing the sublight emitters down to nothing. The assault boat was dead in space. Jason had to stop cheering long enough to keep from ramming the falcon right into her stern. And then a giant, invisible hand reached out and yanked the Millennium Falcon by the scruff of the neck. Assault boat has lost main propulsion. Tractor beam on. Kalenda announced. Positive lock on assault boat. Provisional lock on Falcon. Falcon attempting to break free. We can't hold Falcon for too long without damage to her. Lando went to the flag deck comm panel and punched in a comm access code he had not used in a while. Let's hope Han didn't go and change codes on me. He muttered then pushed the transmit key. Lando Calrissian to Millennium Falcon. This is Lando Calrissian calling Millennium Falcon. Shut down your engines and do not resist the tractor beam. We are taking you aboard a Bakuran vessel, allied with the New Republic. Do you copy? Lando? Came a young, eager voice over the comm line. Is that you? Is that you? That you, Jaina? Lando asked. No, I'm Jason, came the rather irritated reply. But Jaina and Anakin are here too. And so is Q9. Who or what is Q9? Admiral Osage asked irritably. I haven't the faintest idea, said Lando. But it looks like we'll get the chance to find out. He pressed the transmit key again. Where are Chewbacca and the Drawl? Still in the repulsor chamber on the planet, Jason answered. We'll have to send someone to get them. Lando glanced at the flag deck's hangar status board. We've just launched our own assault boat to them, Lando said. 
they'll be all right. Good, said Jason. We'll be really glad to see you, Lando. And I'll be glad to see you too, he said. Oh, and one more thing. Nice flying and nice shooting. Your father will be proud. Thanks, Lando. Don't mention it, Lando said and cut the connection. He looked up at the main tactical display, where the fleet of the Sikorian Triad was moving in, slowly and carefully in towards Centerpoint Station, and the two lonely destroyers that stood guard on it. From there, his eye shifted to a countdown clock, showing the 82 hours remaining until Centerpoint would fire at Bovo Yagen. At least, said Lando to the dead microphone, he'll be proud of you if we all live long enough for him to hear about it. And it occurred to Lando that he ought to make it his business to tell Han. Now, before it was too late, Captain Thrag sat in the smoky control cabin of his assault boat and laughed, but there was little joy or happiness in the angry sound. How have the mighty fallen, O mighty Dictat? He said. They have beaten you, beaten you completely. Shot down by children. Children so young they probably had trouble seeing over the control panel. Shut up, Thrag, said Thraken. Shut up or I'll kill you on the spot. Thrag let out one last chuckle and looked out through the assault boat's viewport. The enemy ship's tractor beam was pulling them in. There would be a board in a few seconds' time. The horrible thing is that you might even do it, he said. And why not? If there has ever been a man with nothing left to lose, you are that man now. They have you, Dictat Salsolo. He nodded to the ship in the viewport, the ship that was getting closer with every second. Now they have you, body and spirit. Eyed and solemn, as they led Thrak and Salsolo, Dictat of Corellia, away. Our cousin is a very bad man, he said. Neither of the other children could think of anything more to say. The Millennium Falcon sat down in the hangar deck of the intruder, the tractor beam operator setting the ship neatly down. The three children powered down the ship's systems as best they could and made their way to the access ramp. Anakin worked the controls, and the ramp came down. The three of them filed down the ramp and stopped dead at the foot of it. They had brought the assault boat in first, and already the Bakurans were taking the Human League troopers into custody. One by one, they were led out of the boat, hands on their heads, and hustled out toward the detention block. The next to last man out was a short, grubby-looking man, dressed only in his underwear and a thin undershirt. All the other prisoners had looked scared or angry, but this man was laughing. Laughing out loud? But the last man out, the last one of all, was not laughing. Thrak and Salsolo came out of the assault boat, walking straight and tall, hands at his side. He paused for a moment as he stepped down onto the hangar deck and looked around himself. He spotted the three children by the Millennium Falcon, and the smooth, arrogant look on his face melted away. A look of pure hatred, pure anger and malice took its place. The three children backed away a step or two, and Thraken actually took a step or two toward them before the guards grabbed him by the arms and led him away. Anakin stood between his brother and his sister, holding each of them by the hand. He stared wide. This is doing no good, Drachmas. Han said. You come. You tell us there might be progress. You go away. You come back. You say it again. Around and around. There are people at war out there. A whole star system could die while you go back and forth. I am knowing, I am knowing, I am knowing, said Drachmas. But believe me, there is nothing more we can be doing. We Hunchesek know the deadline. We are trying. But it is a very delicate situation. Push the Sikorians of the Nameless Clan too hard, 
and they might commit suicide or die of shame. And die of shame not expression, like with you people. Drachna seemed ready to offer an explanation of that statement, but then she caught Han's eye and got back to the point. The best thing you humans can do to hurry us along is just to be here, looking impatient, checking the time, reminding us to hurry. I go tell negotiators you impatient, time growing short, and they work faster. Just then, there was an odd, muted sort of beeping noise coming from Mara's pocket. At exactly the same moment Artur suddenly kicked up a fuss, whistling and chirping and spinning his view dome back and forth. Mara looked confused for a minute, and then seemed to remember something. She stood up, shoved her hand in the pocket of her coveralls, and pulled out a comm link. It's been so long since these things worked I forgot it was there, she said. She pressed the stud on the side of the comm link, and the beeping stopped. That's a call from the ship's monitoring systems. A high-priority message just came in. R2. Asked Luke, are you getting it too? The same message? R2 let off an affirmative-sounding trill. Gotta be the same one, Mara said. I've got to go over to the Jade's Fire to read my copy. Anyone care to tag along and see what it is? R2 confirmed it was the same message the moment he plugged into the data port on the cockpit of the Jade's Fire. That saved having to decode it twice. The decryption system on board the Jade's Fire was good, very good. It unbuttoned the message in only a few seconds a job that would have taken R2 a good many minutes. Mara, sitting at the ship's command station, hit the play button, and a hologram shimmered into life a meter or so above the floor. It was a full-length view of Lando, shown at about half-life size. Hello, he said in a very solemn voice. I don't know exactly what your situation is, so I will send duplicate copies of this to all of you. A lot has happened. The bad news is that the real enemy has finally shown up. It's the fleet from the Sikorian Triad. Luke knows about it. They are the real enemy. Everything else out the rebellions are not much more than diversions. The fleet has a total of about 80 ships of all sizes, and they are closing very slowly on center point. They seem to be timing it so they will get to center point just as the Bovo Jagen shot goes off. We haven't interfered with them yet, and they haven't made any hostile gesture toward our ships. I doubt that's going to last long, though. That's the bad news, and it's bad. The image of Lando paused for a moment, and then broke into a broad smile. The good news is very good indeed. Don't ask me how, because we haven't had time to sort it all out yet, but the children have escaped from Thraken and they did it aboard the Millennium Falcon. They flew the ship. And before you can turn blue, Han, the Falcon doesn't have so much as a scratch on her. But the punchline is they captured Thraken. Han, you should have seen it. The kids flew a classic inside loop and put two disabling shots right into Thraken's stern. The Bakurans have taken Thraken prisoner. Anyway, I know you won't believe it, but the kids did it all. I don't believe it, Han Dot said. SSSH, said Leia and they are all safe and sound aboard the intruder. Chewbacca and two Drawl who got mixed up in all this are being picked up from the repulsor right now. They're okay too, as best we can tell. But the real reason I sent this message is to ask you to come here. Gary O'Captison has called the Council of War for 18 hours from now. We need you all there. Madam Captison wants a Salonian representative as well. Please arrange that if you possibly can. Also, to be blunt about it, the odds are good we're going to need every scrap of firepower we can get before the end of this. We need all of you, we need the Jade's fire, and we need Luke's X-Wing. Send a return message as soon as possible, reporting your intentions. 
But whatever you do, please hurry. We are almost out of time. Chapter 14 The Last Goodbye Leia Organa Solo, Chief of State of the New Republic, ran full tilt down the access ramp of the Jade's Fire, onto the hangar deck of the intruder, and nearly knocked over two of the honor guard as she rushed forward to her children, flinging her arms around the twins. Anakin escaped her first swooping hug simply because he was hopping too fast and too high with excitement to be an easy target. But Han Solo was hard on the heels of his wife, and he scooped Anakin clear up off the ground. Luke joined the happy little knot of chaos, hugging the children, greeting them, tousling Jason's hair, tickling Jaina, lifting Anakin out of Han's arms to hold him in his own. Three Pio tottered around, offering his own greetings, and generally getting in the way. Anakin! Jason! Jaina! said Leia. Oh, let me look at you all. But then she threw her arms around all three of them, and held them so tight it didn't seem likely she could see much of anything at all. Lando Calrissian joined the tangle of welcome, throwing his arm around Han, shouting a friendly insult in his ear, pounding him on the back, giving Leia a kiss, teasing the children. The other new arrivals, Mara. Jade and the Salonian representative, Drachmus, followed. Admiral Osiej allowed himself a thin, wintry smile as he watched the proceedings. Not the most dignified of entrances, eh, uh, Madam Prime Minister? I would have expected more poise from the Chief of State. Gary probably could have managed some commonplace comment about ceremony giving way to family, or that there were other considerations besides dignity in the universe but somehow she couldn't bring herself to do it. She thought of her own little daughter, Melinza, back home on Bakura. She looked to Luke Skywalker, lifting his niece up onto his shoulders, and thought of how good he was with children, and of all the things that might have been, but never could be now. But still, the Admiral seemed to be expecting some kind of reply. So she decided to speak, and somehow, the truth slipped out. I think it's beautiful, she said. Admiral Hordal Osage turned toward her and regarded her with frank surprise. Indeed, he said. Clearly, then, standards of beauty vary greatly. Mine do not include noisy and unruly children. Then I pity you, said Gariel, quite surprised with herself for being so blunt. I know of nothing else that brings more beauty into my life. Gary O'Captison stepped forward, leaving a stunned Admiral Osage in her wake. She moved toward the newcomers and offered them a simple, graceful bow. Madam Chief of State, she said. Captain Solo, I bid you welcome to the intruder and wish you much joy of this wonderful reunion. And with that, she knelt down in her very official ministerial robes and gave each of the children a kiss. Let the old sour push chew on that for a while, she told herself. Gariel had had something of a wild streak in her youth. It was good to know it had not completely abandoned her. The situation is, in one sense, complicated and, in another, quite simple, said Belindy Kayenda addressing the council of war gathered on the flag deck of the intruder. And a motley crew this council is, she told herself. To her immediate left was Osilage in his perfect dress white uniform and his chest full of medals. Gary O'Captison in her ministerial robes, Lando Calrissian with a rather swell-looking purple cape thrown over one shoulder of his burgundy blouse, and Han Solo in a rather rumpled light brown shirt, with a utility vest worn over it. That vest had obviously seen a lot of use over the years. Then came Solo's wife, Leia Organa Solo, the chief of state, in a plain blue shirt and dark slacks borrowed from Mara Jade. All of the chief of state's own clothes had of course been lost, destroyed, or abandoned along the way in the last few weeks. Next to Leia was her brother, Luke Skywalker, in his neatly pressed and insignia-free flight suit. 
Behind him, against the wall, his two droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO, stood by in case they were called on. Both of the two drawl, Ebrahim and Marka, wore nothing but plain brown fur though both seemed to have gotten bits of their fur cooked off in the last two days. Then came the Wookiee Chewbacca, who seemed either moody or thoughtful she didn't have much luck reading Wookiee expression. Jenica Sunson had managed to find herself wedged in next to Chewbacca on one side. And a nervous-looking Salonian named Drachmas on the other. Sunson did not look too thrilled about her seating position. By her expression, she expected the Wookiee and the Salonian to start arguing over light meat or dark at any second. On the other side of Drachmas the Salonian was Mara Jade, looking cool and elegant in a well-tailored but otherwise quite ordinary ship's coverall. And Kanda reminded herself, she was there too, of course. The last few days and hours had been so chaotic that it would have been easy enough to forget her own existence. To cover the simple side of it first, she went on, the enemy is closing in on center point. They need to keep us from interfering with the next Starbuster burst which, of course, we must interfere with, no matter what the cost. Considering the number of lives at stake if we fail, I do not think anyone would disagree with me when I suggest that the destruction of our entire force would indeed be a low enough price for victory. And we must face the fact that we run such a risk. We have three major combatant ships carrying a total of 32 flight-worthy fighters. The enemy has at least 80 larger spacecraft. If all of them carried a full complement of fighters though I very much doubt they do the number of fighters on their side would be well up in the hundreds. The numbers were daunting enough to cause a flurry of whispers and mutters around the table. Kayenda waited for the murmuring to settle down, and then continued. We do have a few advantages I can tell you about. We have managed some fairly good long-range scans of the enemy fleet. We've gotten some good imagery of some ships. Most are not that large or that whaley armed. I can tell you that many of those ships are old, some predating the Imperial period. I doubt that any of them are of post-war construction. They are probably both dated and in relatively poor repair. Parts for many of those ships are going to be hard to come by. They are all but certainly relying on non-standard and jury-rigged repairs. I would also expect the qualities of their crews to be below average. Their pool of potential recruits could not have been the best. Probably most are flying with a minimum of previous training and experience. However, don't count too much on that. Some of those crews are probably going to be as good as ours. We just don't know which ones. In short, said Admiral Osilage, we have better ships but the numbers are most definitely against us. However, we do have a plan for dealing with the situation. We will come to that a bit later. I he looked over and nodded at Kalenda. Continue, he said. The complicated side of the situation is that we almost, but not quite, control two of the repulses. To the best of our knowledge, None of the various front groups I don't think rebel groups quite suits the case anymore none of the various front groups controls one at this time. I believe that was a major miscalculation on the part of the triad. They assumed that locating and activating a repulsor would take much less time than it did. Unless they got the estimates exactly right, said Mara Jade, and the triad's people are sitting on the Talusian and Trilusian and Corellian repulsors just waiting for the signals to push the button. Exactly right, said Kalenda. Obviously, the double world Talus and Trailus repulsors are the most worrisome ones. If the enemy controls those, he has the ability to crush our ships down to rubble in any millisecond he chooses. But we don't think they have that capability, O.S. Silage said. Their fleet is moving in with a great deal of caution. Their behavior is consistent with fears that we control one or more repulses, while they control none. In my considered opinion, 
it is not consistent with their controlling any of the repulses. It is not even consistent with a bluff. If the enemy had the talus or trailus repulsors operational, this battle would be over already. That caution might also explain why they haven't reactivated the interdiction field, said Mara. They might want to be sure they have a way out of here. That's possible, said Jenica Sunson, but we don't think that's why it's still down. We've run some numbers on how Centerpoint must operate, what it can do, that sort of thing. The short form is that we don't think they can reactivate it while Centerpoint is at this stage of powering itself up for a Starbuster shot. Too much power being diverted, too many systems busy. You can turn on an interdiction field while the system is in standby. You can turn one off at any time. You can leave it on while the system is powering up. But you can't initiate an interdiction field while the glow point is charging. At least we think that's the case. It damned well better be the case, said Oscillage. Our plans with Source depend on it. Excuse please, said Drachmus. What or who is a Source? We'll come to that a bit later, Oscillage said, a slight smile on his lips. What about Centerpoint itself? Han asked. Is there any weak spot that we know about? Some place where we might pile in a lot of firepower and get lucky? Blow the place up? No, sorry, said Sunson. It doesn't work that way. Don't forget that the glow point is a containment vessel for an extremely powerful reaction. It's very strong, and it's very good at absorbing and dispersing energy, and well insulated. The figures we worked up show that the energy levels in there at the moment are the equivalent of setting off a proton torpedo at least once a second, and Centerpoint has been putting up with that for days on end. And the rest of the structure is very strong, and very old, and so well sealed and shielded that we've never been able to map most of the interior. I'm told the Sentinel has landed search parties that are doing their best to find the control system and shut the system down but that control system has kept itself pretty well hidden for at least a thousand generations. I doubt they'll find it in just a day or two of looking. So the repulsors are our only hope, said Luke. But then why worry about the Triad fleet at all? Why confront it? Why not just withdraw, get our ships out of harm's way, and concentrate all our effort into activating the repulsors? Because the repulsors are not the only game in town, said Oscillage. That is an 80-ship fleet out there, after all. They could dominate this star system indefinitely, if they chose to do so, and we left them alone. Or suppose, for example, they got to the repulsors on Drawl and Salonia and grabbed them from us before we were ready to use them? Let's talk about the repulsors for a minute, said Luke. Where are we with them? How about the Salonian Repulsor? Drachnus? The Salonian shook her head mournfully. There is no changing. I have been checking with our people just before this fine meeting. The Sikorian Salonians, the Triad Salonians of the Nameless Den, are weakening. They see the force of our arguments but they are not with us yet. Is there any realistic chance of their being persuaded before the next Starbuster shot? Oscillage asked. Drachmus looked miserable. A small one. She admitted at last. Only a small one. Our best people are working on the Triad Salonians but we now think perhaps they have received indoctrination in just such a circumstance. We have tried everything, I assure you. Have you tried cash? Mara asked. I am begging your pardon? Cash. Money. A travel case full of credit notes. You know. A bribe. Or make it sound nice. 
call it a consulting fee. Tell them you want to hire them, and we'll pay well. Drachmus looked absolutely amazed. This had never been occurring to us. We will try it at once. Good, said Mara. And don't be cheap about it. Whatever you offer has got to be cheaper than letting the triad win. What about our repulsor? Asked the drawl, Ibrahim. Have you made any progress with it? Our tech staff has only had a few hours to work on it, said Osilich. It's early to expect results. But rest assured, we have every person with pertinent experience down there working right now. That is not the case, said a new voice, a stern female voice that was used to being heard and obeyed. It was the other drawl. Marka, the Duchess of Masti Gophorus. It is not the case, Admiral, and you know it not to be the case. Duchess, might I ask what you are talking about? Asked Osilich. The children, she said. Anakin in particular, but he works best when the other two are there to help him, guide him. Don't be absurd, said Osilich. What possible use could they be? How could they possibly have any expertise? I would urge you not to mistake a series of lucky accidents for ability. We do not have time to waste on such nonsense. Move on, Lieutenant. Kalenda hesitated a moment. It was not her place to contradict her superior officer. But on the other hand, it was not his place to be a damned pig-headed fool. And Gary O'Captison had reminded her, not so long ago, that there was more to life than adhering to military etiquette. Sir, my apologies for discussing this in front of others, but there may not be another chance, and the stakes are too high. I believe you are making a mistake. What? Sir, it is my job to analyze events and come to conclusions. I have analyzed the events surrounding the children, and I have come to the conclusion that their abilities are, are remarkable. They have been constantly underestimated, their achievements constantly dismissed. As exaggerated, or lucky accidents, or remarkable coincidences. That is simply not true. It is not credible. She pointed at Drawl, plainly visible through the main bridge viewports. The plain fact of the matter is that you have a repulsor down there because a seven-and-a-half-year-old boy found it for you and turned it on. It is no longer in the hands of our enemy and our enemy is in the brig because that boy and his siblings managed to walk through a working force field, repair a disabled starship, fly that ship into space, and shoot down a pursuing spacecraft flown by a professional military pilot. I could go on for half an hour, describing all the things that they could not possibly have done, but the point will remain the same. Osilage looked up at Kalenda, his expression utterly unreadable. Was there anger seething under there? Was he simply considering her words? Was he infuriated at the assault on his authority, or simply wondering if she might be right? It was impossible to tell. The man was completely inscrutable. You argue most effectively, Lieutenant Kalenda. You marshal your facts well. You will either go far as an intelligence officer or end your career in the brig for insubordination. I had intended to disembark all non-combatant Sandral in any event, and it occurs to me that the shielded side chambers of the Repulsa are probably the safest place to be right now. Madam Chief of State, Captain Solowith, as Lieutenant Kalenda claims, your children might be of help. Would you consent to their being put to work? Absolutely, said Han. Not that it matters what we think. Get them within a hundred kilometers of trouble, and they'll find it all on their own. Madam Chief of State, we need all the help we can get, said Leia. Let them do their part. 
Osilage raised his eyebrows and looked hard at both of them. Very well, he said. Then let us move on. Lieutenant? Well, sir, to sum up, we have two objectives, either of them very easy. First is to defeat the Triad fleet and prevent it from dominating this star system. Second is to do whatever we can to prevent Centerpoint from firing again. I believe that covers everything we were going to discuss, except for Source A and I believe you wanted to cover that yourself. Osilich smiled broadly and it was unusual to see any smile at all on his face. He stood up and looked about at all the faces around the table. Source A, he said. Source A, if I am not mistaken, is known to several of you already. But let me tell the rest of you about him. If the day had started with joyous reunions, it ended with tearful goodbyes. Do you really have to go, Mommy? Asked Anakin, his voice a little snuffly, his chin quivering just a bit. They were in the intruder's hangar deck again, the last load of non-combatants boarding the shuttle that would take them down to the safety of the repulsor-shielded side caverns. Yes, I do, dearest, Leia said, kneeling down in front of him forcing a reassuring smile onto her face. And so do you. Everyone has a job today. I have to help Daddy and Chewbacca fly the Falcon. You and your brother and sister have to go down to the Repulsor again and see if you can make it work the way we need it to. I bet we can, said Anakin. I'll bet you can too, sport, said Han, tousling his son's hair. He was smiling too, but even Anakin must have been able to see the pain in his eyes. And even Anakin knew that everyone had to pretend that everything was fine. Leia looked up at Jaina and Jason. You two take care of each other and of Anakin, all right? And do what Thripio and Ebrahim and the Duchess tell you to do. And be sure to be sure to dash. Suddenly Leia stopped her voice choked up. It was all too ridiculous. She was going into battle, she was sending her children to operate a machine that could move a planet around, sending them off to face more. Responsibility than most intelligent beings ever dreamed of, she might be killed and never see them again, and yet she was left with nothing to tell them but the age-old motherly admonitions to behave themselves and brush their teeth. We will, Mom said Jaina, her voice gentle and low. Don't worry, we'll do all the things we're supposed to do. Fear not, Madam Chief of State, said Thripio. I shall take good care of them all assuming the draw permit me. Leia threw her arms about her children, shut her eyes, and squeezed them as tight as she could. I love you all, she managed to say, before her voice choked up altogether. She held them for as long as she could, and a little bit longer besides, until Han knelt down beside her and gently pulled her arms back. It's time to go, he said. The ship has to leave. Leia nodded, unable to speak. She kissed each of them one last time, and Han did the same. The three children and three Pio walked aboard the shuttle transport, and the shuttle transport lifted off and they were gone. There were plenty of other goodbyes, of course, and none of them were easy. Luke, Lando, Mara, Kalenda, Gariel, all of the others. They all knew the odds were very much against everyone making it back. They all knew some of these goodbyes might be for more than a day or two. They might be forever. And yet, they all understood that sort of goodbye. They all had been there before, said goodbye to a comrade for an hour or a day, and then never seen the comrade again. There was a code, a ritual, a sort of a ceremony to it all, that made such goodbyes, if not easier, at least far more manageable, more understandable. But there was one other leave-taking that had a different set of emotions behind it. There was one more person Han had to see before he went into battle and that person was in the brig. 
Maybe it was curiosity. Maybe it was the last frayed thread of the family ties. Or maybe those family threads were stronger than he thought. Maybe blood was stronger even than betrayal. Or maybe though Han doubted it he just wanted to gloat. It didn't fee. That way, but you never knew. You never knew. Whatever the reasons, he had come. The guard activated the door control, and Han stepped into the detention cell. Thraken was sitting on a low bench set against the far wall of the room. Hello, Thraken, he said. Hello, Han. Come to see the rare specimen in his cage? I'm not sure why I came, said Han. For some reason I wanted to see you. So here I am. And here slash am, Thraken said, a cruel smile on his face. He lifted his head up, threw his arms out wide, and stuck his chest out. Here I am, he said again. Get a good look. You shouldn't have done it, Thraken, said Han. Oh, there are lots of things I shouldn't have done, Thraken said. I certainly shouldn't have gone off in pursuit of those miserable, freakish children. That was a fatal mistake. Fatal. But what specific act did you have in mind? The children, Han said. My children. You should not have kidnapped the children. Never involve the innocent. Always protect your family. Two of the oldest traditions of Corellia. I remember your sneering at those ideas, saying it was no great sin in breaking them. But that was just words. You didn't just talk about breaking those laws. You did it. You did it. Thraken, how could you? Easily, Thraken said. Far too easily. They just fell into my hand. How could I not keep them? Why shouldn't I have kept them? Because it was wrong, Thraken. Thraken sighed wearily and leaned back against the wall. Han. Please. I'm locked away in a cell. By all rights, the longest part of my trial will be the reading of the charges against me. The jury shouldn't even leave the box. There isn't even any point to a jury or a trial at all. The sensible thing would be just to have me taken out and shot. But I'm sure they will give me all the relentlessly fair justice they can find to throw at me and then lock me away forever. I'll probably never have any freedom of action ever again. So there's not much point in teaching me right from wrong. Not at this late date. You're beaten, Thraken, said Han. You've lost and lost everything. Thraken chuckled. True enough, Han. True enough. But I do have one consolation. What's that, Thraken? Thraken Salsolo, would-be dictat of Corellia, gestured vaguely toward the outside of the cell toward the universe beyond. The triad fleet out there, he said. Maybe I've lost, Han, but it does me a world of good to know that you haven't won yet. He smiled in a chillingly close imitation of Han's own lopsided grin, an imitation turned cold and hard and cruel. And I don't think you're going to either. Han stared at his cousin. Then, Without saying another word, he turned and knocked on the cell door. It slid open, and Han walked away. He still didn't know why he had come. Chapter 15 Showdown at Centerpunt At last, at long last, it was time to board ship, launch, and head out into space. But getting to that point was not easy. The Bakurans needed all the firepower of the newly repaired Millennium Falcon, and no one could argue that the Falcon needed a crew of at least three a pilot, a co-pilot, and a gunner in order to provide the maximum firepower. There was, of course, never even the slightest debate over who the pilot and co-pilot should be. 
Han and Chewbacca belonged in those seats, and there was no doubt about it. But more than a few people tried to talk Leia out of sitting in the quad laser turret. It was not proper for a chief of state to go flying around taking potshots at enemy ships. But Leia was adamant. She had had enough of being pushed around in recent weeks. It was high time she paid a little of that back. The harder people tried to talk her out of going on the mission, the more determined she became. Even Ocelage tried to talk her out of it. But even Ocelage realized, eventually, that he had to back down. But now she was aboard, Chewbacca was aboard, and the Millennium Falcon was ready. Now was the moment. Han checked his status boards one last time, confirmed his departure instructions, brought the repulsors on, and flew out into the sky. Once well clear of the intruder, he eased back on the sublight engines and waited for the others to form up on him. They were going into battle together Han, Chewie, and Leia aboard the Millennium Falcon, Mara Jade alone aboard the Jade's Fire, Lando aboard the Lady Luck, and Luke in his X-Wing. It made a certain amount of sense to put all the Nambakuran ships in one formation. It saved forcing the Bakuran fighter pilots to learn how to deal with non-standard ships in their formations. Han had been aboard all of the other ships, and their pilots had been aboard his. Perhaps more importantly, all four of the pilots knew each other, trusted each other's skill. Han watched as the Lady Luck flew out of the hangar doors and toward him. Suddenly Han felt good. They were flying into danger, into battle, but what of that? He had done it before. He was behind the controls of his own ship, in space, surrounded by friends. What was to feel bad about? He saw the Lady Luck do a double barrel roll just as Luke's X-Wing launched. Han laughed out loud. He wasn't the only one feeling good. He keyed on the comm system. Falcon to Lady Luck. Lando, you old pirate, the idea is to fly in a straight line just at the moment. I think you just wobbled off course a bit. Ah, uh, can a guy have a little fun now and then? Relax, both of you, said Luke as he pulled into position off Lando's starboard wing. We're going to get a chance to do all the fancy flying we want today. The Jade's fire launched, and Mara came on the line. I don't know about the rest of you, she said, but I'd be just as happy if this stayed nice and simple. Chewbacca cut off the ship-to-ship -ship link hooted loudly, and bared his fangs. Han laughed. All right, he said, so she's a spoilsport. Any spoilsport who can fly the way she does can be my wingman any day of the week. How far have you gotten? Asked Anakin as he looked over the gleaming silver control panel. It looked just the way he had left it, after pushing one button too many a few days before. The technician's name was Anton, and he was a thin, wiry-looking fellow, dark-skinned with shoulder length, shiny black hair that hung straight down on either side of his face. He didn't answer at first, but instead gave Anakin a strange look, a look Anakin had seen before. It was the look Anakin got from grown-ups who had heard he was weirdly good with machines, but didn't quite believe it yet. Anton glanced at Jaina and Jason and got an encouraging nod from both of them. I assure you, young Master Anakin is remarkably talented. Through Pio volunteered. Antone seemed unwilling to take the droid's word, but Ebrahim and Marka and Q9 were there too, and somehow the presence of the drawl seemed to convince technician Antone to take things seriously and cooperate. I'd say we're stuck, he said, except that might be saying too much. It makes it sound like we've been making progress and then stopped. But we never got anywhere in the first place. Not at all. Anakin asked. Not at all. The system won't respond to any commands we give it. Sure it will, said Anakin. 
He sat down at the control panel and pushed his hand down onto a flat, featureless spot on the console. He pulled his hand away, and the surface of the console started to shift and rise up, forming itself into a joystick-like shape but one perfectly shaped to Anakin's hand. Anakin touched the joystick, just touched it, and a hollow wireframe 5x5x5 of cubes appeared in the air over the control panel. Anakin let go of the joystick. It remained in place for a moment, then melted back down into the console as the cube display vanished. How did you do that? I Antone demanded. He scooted Anakin out of the chair and pressed his own hand down on exactly the same place on the panel. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. Antone gave Anakin another strange look, and then comprehension dawned in his face. Burning stars? He said. Burning stars. It must have. Imprinted. Itself. On. Your personal characteristics the first time you used it. Huh, Anakin said. What do you mean? Demanded Jason. It imprinted on him, somehow. It locked in on his fingerprints, or his DNA, or his brain waves, or something, and locked them into its memory. It'll only work for him. Anakin's eyes lit up with a wild gleam. Only for me? He asked. It's all mine? There must be a way to let other users use it. Jason objected. Yeah, probably, said Antone. But we don't have time to look for them. We have to work with what we've got. Wait a moment. Ebrahim objected. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Antone nodded solemnly. Your little friend here is the only person who is going to be able to operate this control panel. And from what I've seen, and what you've told me, even if he can make it work, I'm not sure he really understands what it does. I believe, said 3PO, that you have just offered an excellent summing up. Gary O'Captison watched Admiral Osilich pace the floor of the flag deck, and could not help but feel sympathy for the man. They were, for the moment, alone. On the flag deck, and that fact spoke volumes. He had told everyone to go off and do his bidding, and now they were gone. Later, perhaps, this place would be chaos, with aides rushing in and out, mountains of message forms covering every flat surface, klaxons blaring and orders bellowing out from the overhead speakers. But now it was quiet, empty, a lonely place. And Osilage must be an especially lonely man right now. There would be decisions yet to make, orders to give, but now, for the most part, his job was over. He had deployed his forces, issued his instructions, laid his plans. Now all he could do was wait. It isn't easy, is it? She asked. You send them out to do your bidding, and off they go, following your instructions, living or dying winning or losing, because of what you ordered. No, he said, it isn't easy. Everyone else knows what to do, because I have told them. But who tells me? For Osilage, that was a remarkable bit of introspection, bordering on self-pity. He himself seemed to realize that had given too much away, for he stopped his pacing and sat down in the admiral's chair. A chime sounded and a deep, melodic robotic voice spoke from the overhead speaker. All outbound craft launched and clear. It said, Intruder getting underway in thirty seconds. All hands to assigned battle stations. Osilage sat motionless throughout the announcement, not moving or speaking. Gario could not tell if he was listening to it intently or not even aware that the voice had spoken. The chime sounded again, there was a change in the vibrations of the ship, and the flag deck instruments started reporting forward movement. They were on their way. Tell me, 
Osilage said at last, speaking after such a long silence that Gariel jumped ten centimeters in the air. The plan. Do you think it will work? The irony was almost too obvious. After endless weeks of being trapped aboard the gentleman caller, wishing above all else to move faster, get to where she was going sooner, Tendra Risen now had not the slightest desire for her ship to go anywhere at all. The gent floated quietly in the darkness of space, in a stable free orbit of Corellan orbit that put her squarely between the Triad fleet and the two Bakuran destroyers. She had not the slightest doubt that both sides were tracking her, watching her go by. Probably both of them recognized her ship for what she was a civilian non-combatant, accidentally caught between the two fleets. As long as she floated unpowered through space, she represented no particular danger. But she also had no doubt at all that both sides would fire immediately if they felt in the slightest way threatened by the gentleman caller. And the gentleman caller was surrounded. There was no direction at all she could find that wouldn't take her close to the path of one ship or another. She did not dare maneuver, for fear of one side or the other deciding she was a booby trap, a bomb or a weapon disguised as a civilian ship. All she could do was sit here and pray to whatever god she could think of that no one decided she was getting in the way. No one knew exactly what was going to happen next, Tendra least of all. But whatever did happen, she was going to have a ringside seat for it. It has been said by more than a few observers, who have put it more than a few different ways, that warfare consists of long stretches of boredom, interspersed with short, sharp bursts of chaos and terror. Lando had been through battles enough in his day to realize the truth of that description. Or, to put it another way, it was a long, long flight from drawl to center point. Long enough that Luke, aboard the X-Wing, returned to the intruder twice for brief rest periods as they traveled. Luke, Jedi Master that he was, certainly could have toughed it out, but Luke was not a fool. And only fools deliberately went into combat worn and unrest. The others Han and his crew, Mara, and Lando could all get up and stretch, set the autopilot, and sneak off for a nap. Not Luke. They could have used a very brief jump through hyperspace to shorten the trip substantially, but there were reasons they did not want the Triad fleet thinking too much about hyperspace. And they also wanted the Triads to have their attention focused on the intruder, the three trading ships, and the intruder's fighter escort. The more they looked there, the less they would look in other directions. Lando punched up his own detector system and tried to get an idea of how the Triad fleet was reacting. So far, they didn't seem to be in the least bit distracted by the intruder. The whole fleet was still moving in towards center point at a slow, steady pace of its own. Nothing substantially different from the last time he checked, or the time before that. Soon, though. Soon. They were getting close enough to start picking targets, planning their attack wait a second. Lando frowned at his display. Had that been there before, or had he just missed it? A tiny ship, civilian by the looks of what the detectors could tell him, right smack in between center point and the triad fleet. And wait another second. Where could that ship have come from? Lando sent a signal querying the intruder's position board database for the last few days. He went back to the time just before the interdiction field went down, and played it forward from there. The tiny ship winked into existence before the triad ships. But how could anybody get here before the triad, unless Lando sat bolt upright? Unless they were closer than the triad ships, coming from much closer in. From inside the interdiction field, for example. Lando finally had the sense to try it the easy way. He sent the standard ship ID query signal. Fifteen seconds later he had his answer back. Twenty seconds after that he had changed course and accelerated to his top sublight speed in order to intercept. 
It was a full minute later before he realized he should have asked permission, a realization he came to mostly because his calm board started lighting up. He punched the transmit button. Lady luck to intruder, he said. I've ah uh, just spotted something. I'm just heading over to investigate it. I'll be back with the fleet in good time for the main event. Intruder to Lady Luck, replied a rather fussy-sounding voice. The object you are on intercept for is an identified and uninvolved civilian spacecraft. No need to investigate. Well, I'm going to anyway, Lando said. She might not be as uninvolved as you think. Or at least, he thought, she's not going to be uninvolved for long. To Ebrahim's eye, the control room of Drawl's planetary repulsa looked as if a bomb had hit it. It was knee-deep in crumpled bits of paper and discarded food containers. Little knots of technicians were huddled in every corner of the room, arguing over readings, debating. What? Various arrangements of purple and orange and green cubes and bars of light might mean. Handwritten labels were stuck over about half the controls on the console. As the other half of the controls seemed to appear and disappear and change shape and size almost at whim, it was a trifle more difficult to label them. Jaina and Jason were asleep on cots in the next room over. Ebrahim and Marco were still on the go. In the thick of it, helping the techs order their readings, sketching out the various transmutations of the control panel. Q9 usually seemed to have two or three remote sensors out as he traced this signal, or that through the interior of the control system, and took power readings, and he and 3PO had found any number of things to bicker about. But all the rest of them could work as hard and as much as they wanted. Anakin was still in the center of it all, still going strong, working the controls as he was asked, shifting the system from one mode to another helping the grown-ups understand what all the buttons meant. He had that wild-eyed look in his eyes that human children sometimes seemed to get when they had been up too long, or had been too stimulated for too long. Sooner or later it would all be too much for him, and the poor child would simply keel over from exhaustion. Ordinarily, it would already be time, and past time, to get the child to bed, but under the circumstances they had to get as much out of him as possible before. Newses! I have good incuses! An excited voice shouted. Everyone stopped what they were doing and looked up as Drachmas rushed into the room. The Sikorian Salonians! What a splendid idea this bribing was! Must congratulate Honor Jade on fine suggestion. They've agreed to cooperate? Ebrahim asked eagerly. No, honored Ebrahim, said Drachmas in the same gleeful voice. They refuse. They delay. Maybe later they come around, but not yet. Then why are you so happy? Marka demanded. Because bribe suggestion gives them idea. She held up a data pad and waved it in the air. They still not willing to help with their repulsor but they willing to sell instruction manual. Let me see that, Anton said, and grabbed at the data pad. He turned it on and paged through it, grinning more and more widely as he did so. He nodded enthusiastically. This is it, he said. With what Anakin has shown us, and what this tells us about the notation I think I am not sure but at least I think, we can run this place. You mean, said Ibrahim, you think that Anakin can run this place for Dash? He stopped in mid-sentence. Oh dear, said Tripio. He's done it again. It often happens when he stays up too late. Anakin was still sitting in the control panel's chair, but his head was resting on the panel itself, and he was sound asleep. Ibrahim nodded in wonder. Human children. Bizarre creatures. Anakin had been wide awake and busily working not thirty seconds before. Ah, well, Ebrahim said. The rest of us can keep working, 
but I suppose a child has to get a good night's sleep if he's expected to save two or three star systems in the morning. Lando? She asked. He was the first human being she had seen in a month. Tendra. And suddenly they were in each other's arms, holding each other tight. Oh, Lando. Lando. You shouldn't have come. You shouldn't have. There are ships on all sides of us, and sooner or later the shooting is going to start and dash. Hey, hey, said Lando. Sure. Take it easy, he said. Take it easy. My ship is plenty fast enough to get us out of here. We'll be all right. But it's too dangerous, she insisted. It was too risky. Come on, Lando said, stroking her chin and giving her a big, warm smile. I had to think of my image. How could I possibly turn down the chance to rescue the damsel in distress? Tendra Risen was asleep when it happened. The first she knew that there was anything going on was when a large booming noise echoed through the hull of the gentleman caller. To say she found it a startling way to wake up would be a massive understatement. She nearly jumped out of her skin. She sat up in bed, listening fearfully. What was it? Had a meteor crashed into the ship? Had something in the engine room blown up? Then she heard the whirring noise of doors sliding open and air pumps working. The airlock. Someone had docked with the gentleman caller as she scrambled out of bed and pulled her robe on. Who was it? What did they want? A weapon. She needed a weapon. Was there even a blaster on board the ship? She stepped out into the corridor and froze in her tracks. There he was, right in front of her, grinning from ear to ear. I tried to call ahead, he said, but there wasn't any answer. The hours crawled past. The triad ships moved towards Centerpoint. The Sentinel and the Defender kept up their guard over Centerpoint, and the intruder's little fleet of armed trading ships and fighters moved in toward the triad ships. Osilage watched it all on his status boards, hour after weary hour, alone on the flag deck. No one needed to come here. Not until the battle began. Time was the enemy now, and time was the ally. They had to thread this needle carefully, oh, so carefully. Too soon, and they would give the game away, and all of Sorsay's efforts would be in vain. Too late and the other side would jump first, attack the Bakuran ships and be done with it. And then there was the whole vexed question of the repulsor. Would they have it, or wouldn't they? Would it work, or wouldn't it? Were Kalrishan's figures for the timing of Centerpoint's next shot even accurate? They had checked over the figures a dozen times, and they seemed correct. But what of the error no one saw, the bad assumption that everyone agreed to without even realizing it? They were the sort of questions that had plagued military commanders from the beginning of time, and they were likely to keep on doing so for quite some time to come. Time. That was the question. What was the proper time? There was no way of knowing for sure. No way of reading intentions off a display grid. No way of judging enemy morale and fighting prowess from a remote infrared image. The ships moved closer to each other. Closer. Closer. At last Admiral Hordel Osilage stood up, walked over to the main display grid, and inspected it carefully, studying each ship, each status report in turn. Satisfied, or at least as satisfied as he was going to get, he returned to the admiral's chair, sat down, and pressed the calm button. This is Osilage. Advise all ships via prearranged signal. Commence operation sidestep exactly on the hour, 35 minutes from now. One hour after sidestep, it would be time for Source. One hour, five minutes, and 15 seconds after sidestep, center point would fire. 
Either they would manage to deflect the shot, or they would not. One hour. They would have to hold for one hour. He let go of the calm button and wondered if he had gotten the timing right. All right, Chui, said Han, half an hour later. Jump off in five minutes. Let's look sharp. Lay a time for you to get up to the turret and strap in. Leia stood up from the observer seat and nodded. I know, she said. But she didn't leave. Not immediately. First, she stepped forward, pulled Han's head toward hers, and gave Han a kiss. A warm, lingering kiss that did not so much end as fade gently away. I love you. She said. I know, said Han. And you know I love you. Leia smiled. You're right, she said. I do. She stood up straight, reached over, and ruffled the fur on top of Chewbacca's head. So long, Chewy, she said. See you on the other side. And with that, she turned and left the cockpit. Han turned and watched her go, then looked over to Chewbacca. You know, Chewy, he told the Wookiee. There's a lot to be said for this being merry business. Chewbacca let out a low, rumbling. Laugh. And. Went. Back. To double-checking the shield settings. Han checked the time. Four minutes to go. Luke Skywalker sat in the cockpit of his X-Wing and felt the old tingle of fear and excitement starting to build. He reminded himself that he was a Jedi, that Jedi were calm in battle, that there was no fear. But Luke, better than any human being alive, knew that Jedi did not live in a world of absolutes and abstracts, any more than other people did. It would be just as bad to force all emotion from his life as to wallow endlessly in all his feelings. It was time to fight. He was ready to do so. His Jedi abilities made him more ready. That should have been enough. And it was. Luke glanced at his chronometer. Three minutes. Mara Jade sat alone in the command center of her ship. A Joan. She had come to this star system with a pilot and a navigator, Trautfa and Nestin. They had vanished, along with so many others, in the first days of the war. Mara did not know if they were dead, or captured by one group or another, or hiding under some pile of rubble until it was safe to come out. Mara knew war as well as anyone. She knew full well that it was most likely that they were dead. They had been good at their jobs, and good, honest people, both of them. And now they weren't there anymore, more than likely executed for the simple crime of getting in the way of someone's bloody ambition. If nothing else had happened to inspire her to fight, that would have been enough. But of course, plenty more had happened. And she was going to start giving it back in about two minutes' time. I'm not so sure I did you any favor by rescuing you, Lando said, strapping himself in. Where you were, you might have been killed by accident. Now if you get killed, it'll be because someone did it on purpose. Tendra shook her head and smiled. Trust me, Lando. If there is one thing I learned on board the gentleman caller, it's that I don't want to die alone. I've had enough being alone for a lifetime. Lando reached out a hand to Tendra, riding in the co-pilot's seat. She took it and held it tight. Neither of them said anything more, but the silence in the cabin said more than enough. But then the countdown alert beeped the one-minute warning, and there was no time. Belindy Kalenda was already there, along with the rest of the flag staff, but Gary O'Captison just got back to the flag deck in time to strap herself in. I was in my cabin, she said, though Ocelage hadn't asked. Meditating, and thinking about my daughter. My daughter, Melinza, who has already lost her father. Is this the day she stops having a mother as well? A good time for it. 
Osilage said. There will not be much leisure for thought, starting in another thirty seconds. Gariel dug her fingers into the arms of her acceleration scat and stared out through the flag deck's main viewport, out over the intruder's main bridge level, and through the bridge's forward viewport. The stars, she thought. The warm and inviting stars. Was one of the ones she saw Bakura? Probably her home star was nowhere near bright enough to be visible at this range. Home. She thought of home and longed to be there. Ten seconds. The main speaker announced. All hands, prepare for the jump to light speed. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two, one. Zero. And the stars lanced out into spikes of fire, starlines that filled the viewport with a blaze of light and then the starlines flared away, and were gone, and the familiar stars of Corellia's sky were right back where they had been. But now there were more than stars in the sky. Ships. Ships of all sizes and descriptions had suddenly popped into existence. The intruder, the sentinel, the defender, and ail the lesser ships had made simultaneous, precision minimum distance hyperspace jumps straight into the thick of the enemy fleet. Oscillage had hoped it would give them the benefit of surprise, and it would appear that it had. The intruder's main laser cannon opened up at once, stabbing out at the ship nearest her, a boxy, ramshackle old troop transport that had no business in the middle of a combat fleet. The transport exploded in a bloom of fire, but by then the main lasers had already found another target, a modern-looking corvette about the size of the Jade's fire. The corvette got her shields up in time but they were not intended to hold off intense short-range fire from a light cruiser's gun. Her shields failed and she went up as well, another blaze of hellfire glory. The intruder? Fighter screen winked into existence around her, fifteen general-purpose attack fighters that immediately went over to the attack, blazing away at the smaller, lighter craft in this part of the fleet. The intruder's secondary battery began to speak, blasting away at some target out of Gariel's view. A triad ship fired and caught a GPA coming out of a loop low over the intruder's main bridge. The fighter exploded, a blinding bright flash of light that heaved a torrent of debris at the cruiser. The shields deflected most of it and slowed the rest of it. Loud crashes echoed throughout the bridge as debris banged into the outer hull, but there did not seem to be any real damage. Except, of course, to the GPA and its pilot. The surviving fighters whirled and dashed about, blasting the X-Tie uglies and B-Wing chop jobs out of the sky. At last an opponent worthy of the intruder hove into view, an old, tough-looking ex-imperial destroyer of a class Gariel did not recognize. The ship was smaller than the intruder, but quite possibly her match in firepower. The intruder opened up on her, directing all guns fire directly at the destroyer's forward laser turret. The destroyer returned fire from her forward and rear turrets, but failed to concentrate her fire with any effectiveness. The destroyer's forward battery blew up, and the intruder instantly redirected fire to her rear battery. The destroyer's overall shields must have been damaged in the first explosion, for they gave way completely after only a few seconds of concentrated fire on the rear turret. The turret went up in a dramatic sheet of flame, and the destroyer was disarmed. Gariel glanced over at Oscillage, and was astonished to see that he was paying no mind at all to the fire and chaos outside. His eyes were glued to the tactical display in front of him as he watched the overall progress of the fight. He was letting the intruder's Captain Semak fight her ship, while he attended to the larger battle. It's going well. Oscillage announced to no one in particular. At least, thought Gariel, it's starting well. Hang on, R2. Luke cried out as he flipped his X-wing over onto its back and then pulled its nose up, pursuing the X-tie ugly, that was making a run-in on the Lady Luck up ahead and above. Lando. Break starboard and down, hard on my mark. 
Three, two, one, mark. Luke broke the X-wing down and to starboard a fraction of a second before the Lady Luck did. The XTI Ugly, a monstrosity of a ship slapped together out of the combined wreckage of an X-wing and a TIE fighter, was nowhere as mancuverable as an X-wing. The Ugly fell into the trap, making a longer, shallower dive in pursuit of the Lady Luck and setting itself up for a perfect shot from Luke. Luke fired, and the starboard tie wing blew clean off the ugly, sending it tumbling out of control and out of the fight. It took Luke a moment to find the lady, and he was not surprised to see her already in trouble again, trying to fight off a pair of what looked like light attack fighters with beefed up engines and weapons. Heavy Light Attack Fighters It was nearly always a mistake to hang overpowered weapons and propulsion on a design that wasn't meant to support them. That sort of beefed-up compromise was usually nothing more than a collection of weaknesses held together with rap wire and optimism. Luke decided to test the theory by experiment. He poured fire into the closest HLAF from extreme range and caught it in the port side engine, setting the fighter tumbling out of control before the pilot could kill the starboard engine. The engine flared over and started spewing thick clouds of vapor that enveloped the HLAF. The vapor dissipated instantly in the vacuum of space, and the HLF was hidden inside a strange, fast-moving cloud tumbling across space. Luke checked Lando, and saw he had dispatched the other HLF. Himself. For the moment their little patch of sky was clear. That meant it was time to move elsewhere. Lando. Luke called. I'm tracking a slow-moving destroyer toward the rear of the formation. You have it? I was just about to call it in to you, Luke, said Lando. Let's go for it. Just what we're looking for. The plan was for the attacking craft to move through the triad formation toward its rear, picking off targets of opportunity and trying to get the triad ships to reverse course and pursue. And never mind the obvious flaw in trying to encourage 80 major armed vessels and all their auxiliaries to chase you with all guns blazing. Sometimes you just had to take your chances. Off we go. Luke agreed. Anakin sat in the control chair, listening intently to technician Antone as he ran down the checklist. All right, said Antone. That clears out the targeting sequence. We should be locked on to the south pole of center point. Ready for the power initiation sequence? Don't think so, Anakin said a little doubtfully. Something doesn't feel right. Antone shoved his long black hair out of his eyes for about the zifflianth time and looked nervously at Anakin. Feel right? He asked. What do you mean it doesn't feel right? He does it all by feel, Jason said. He knows by instinct and intuition. You've got an instruction manual. You're the one who said you didn't think he understood what it did. Do so. Anakin protested angrily, glaring at his brother. Do you, Anakin? Jaina asked. She was plainly getting as fed up as Antone. Do you really understand or are you just showing off? Anakin frowned deeply and crossed his arms. Stop being mean to me, or I won't help you anymore. And with that, he hopped down off the chair and stalked away. Oh boy, said Jaina. I suspect that young Master Anakin is overtired, 3PO said. He was up too late last night. He is often rather cranky the next day on such occasions. Antone's eyes bugged out, and his jaw dropped open. It was at least a full five seconds before he was able to speak. He's cranky? He's the he's the only one who can who can dash. Antone gestured frantically at the control panel. The Starbuster is going to fire in an hour, and you tell me he's cranky T. Take it easy, Ebrahim said. But he's gone, Antone said. He's the only one who can run the machine. You've been up all night, Ebrahim said. 
you're overwrought. We'll get him back. Yeah. Up all night, said technician Antone, nodding manically as he paced. Maybe I'm just cranky too. He turned and stopped his pacing to face the twins. Except that's not quite it. Actually, I think I'm in full-blown panic. I've got relatives on Bovo Yagen. Antone went on, half raving. If I get her planet incinerated, my aunt is going to kill me. Settle down, Ebrahim said in a sterner tone of voice. He can have gone far. We need both of you to make this work. Jason, go and get your brother back. Calm him down. And try to remember that the lives of 12 million people are riding on one cranky seven-year-old saving them in an hour's time. So please. When he comes back, let's everyone be nice to him. All right. Jaina said, her own voice turning a bit sulky. But only for an hour. Concentrate volley fire on the forward airlock hatch. Mara's voice called out from the ship-to-ship -ship link. Those welds look nice and sloppy. Fire poured from the jade's fire into the lumbering, old, much-repaired Mon Calamari frigate that had ended up fighting for the other side. Copy that, said Han. Leia, hang on. I'm going to pitch over a bit to give you a clean shot. I'm in the clear already, Leia said. Commencing fire. The quad laser turrets started shooting. The outer door of the airlock had gotten jammed open somehow in the fighting. It began to glow red, then orange, then fire white and then the inner hatch blew off, the ship's atmosphere streaming away into space. The airflow cut off suddenly as a hatch slammed shut somewhere on the ship. The frigate fired back, heavy volley fire straight into the Millennium Falcon. The shield alarms went on almost at once, and then cut off just as quickly as the Jade's fire blew the frigate's main laser turret clean off with a mini torpedo. Disarmed and damaged, the frigate seemed to decide she had had enough. She came about and boosted away for all she was worth. Let her go, Han said to Mara. She's out of the fight, and that's all that matters. How long has it been? Leia asked over the intercom. About forty minutes, Han said. Watch out, a pair of B-wing uglies coming in from above. I'm on them, Leia said, the strain in her voice plain to hear. Fire lanced out of the quad laser turret. An explosion broke up one B-wing and the other decided that discretion was the better part of valor. If only the Falcon could have the luxury of reaching that conclusion. Sooner or later, one of those attacks was going to get through. Mara! Han called out. Let's keep moving through them. He reached over and cut out the ship-to-ship -ship comm link. Another twenty minutes, Han said to Leia and Chui. Another twenty minutes, and it'll be over. And so it would. One way or the other. Defender reports damage to main armament, but secondary weapons fully functional, said Kalenda. Numerous minor hits, no major damage so far. But a hundred minor hits could serve to weaken the ship enough for the hundred and first to destroy it. O.S. Silage shook his head. That was no way to think. Not for an admiral in the midst of running a battle. What of Sentinel-T, he asked. Sentinel has partial loss of propulsion. Explosive decompression of unspecified aft section, reported as contained. All weapons functional, reports numerous successful engagements. Very well, Oselage said as he studied his tactical display. Intruder had taken a similar amount of damage. Forward slash forward slash was working, he thought. They were paying a high price indeed, but it was working. Oselage had assigned a lane through the enemy formation to each big ship and to each pair of smaller craft. The idea was to drive through the enemy ships toward the rear, keeping
keeping up a series of running engagements, intended to cause disruption as much as damage. And it was working. The tidy enemy formations were unraveling, and it seemed that half of them had reversed course to head off in pursuit of their tormentors. Sir, Captain Semak reports for frigates closing on intruder. It appears to be a coordinated attack. Does it indeed? I was wondering how long it would take them to mount one. Very well. Now we will see Captain Semak's skills as a defender. Osilage watched his tactical displays. Four identical bulbous nose frigates were closing in from four different directions, lasers blazing. The intruder shields held, at least under the initial onslaught. Captain Semak brought the nose of the intruder up and accelerated, trying to get out of the crossfire. The intruder's main guns began to return fire, concentrating on the closest of the four frigates. The ship's nose came down hard as Semak attempted to break free, but the frigates adjusted course to stay with the intruder, matching her move for move. Osilage frowned. Something was wrong. The frigates were pouring laser fire into the intruder, but it was having no effect. There should have been local burn-throughs, the shield should have been weakened here and there. Osilage checked the power levels from the frigate's lasers. Why were they so low? Unless unless the lasers were just there as a deception, a distraction. And come to think of it, how were the frigates able to absorb so much fire from the intruder? He brought up a close-up view of the nearest frigate on his tactical display and felt his blood run cold. Its windows were painted on. Painted on over what looked like solid durasteel. He slapped down his comm link. Captain Semak. Those frigates are camouflaged robot Rarn ships. Their guns are harmless. They are merely trying to get in close enough to but it was too late. The first of the ramships fired its high boost engine and accelerated at terrifying speed, directly at the intruder a multi-megaton battering ram headed straight in at them. It struck just forward of the bridge. Okay, Jason said. I have him back. Good, said technician Antone. Great. Let's get back to it. Anakin came back into the compartment and looked long and hard at each of them before he took his seat again. Okay, he said. Ready. Good, good, said Antone, forcing a smile onto his face. Then let's start the power initiation sequence. No, said Anakin. The sweat was standing straight out on Antone's forehead. Anakin, please. Try to understand. This isn't a game. Lots of people, lots and lots of people, are going to to die unless we fire this repulsor at exactly the right time in exactly the right direction. I know that, said Anakin. But it isn't aimed just right. It's too heavy. Too heavy somehow. What do you mean, too heavy? Antone asked. Gravity. Jason shouted. He means gravity. Those instructions you got are for the repulsor on Salonia. The gravity is different there. Right, said Anakin. Too heavy. Antone thought for a minute, muttering frantically. Sweet stars in the sky. He's right. He's right. He checked the countdown clock. And we've got ten minutes to recalculate the aim from scratch. Antone grabbed one of the other techs by the shoulder and shoved him at Anakin. Run him through the power initiation sequence and the rest of it, and we'll retarget just before we fire. And with that, technician Antone raced frantically away to find a desk and a data pad. The second and the third robot ranch ships slammed into the intruder, sending the ruined Hulk pinwheeling across the sky. The fourth ram missed, but that did not matter. 
The ship was dead already. Osilich picked himself up off the deck and staggered back over to his chair. Gariel had managed to stay in hers. Belindy Kalenda climbed to her feet and looked around in shock. They were the only ones left. Everyone else on the flag deck was dead. Osilage didn't even bother looking down to see if anyone had survived on the bridge. Most of it wasn't there anymore. Abandoned ship. The overhead speaker shouted. All hands abandon. Ship. I can't feel my legs. Gariel announced. I can see they're bleeding, but I can't feel them, and I can't move them. Osilage nodded, not really knowing why. Spinal damage, he thought. She must have been slammed around hard by those impacts. Admiral Hordel Osilage realized that he was holding his left hand over his stomach. He lifted his hand away for a moment and saw the red, open wound. Astonishing that he wouldn't feel something like that. Abandoned ship. The automatic voice called again. Osilage looked from himself to Gary O'Captison, to Kalenda. Go! He shouted at Kalenda. We can't make it. You can. Go! Suddenly he felt very weak. But dash. Kalenda began. But I have a gut wound and the Prime Minister cannot walk. We would not survive the trip to the escape capsule and if we did we would not survive until pick-up. Go. Now. That is an order. You, you have been a good officer, Lieutenant Kalenda. Do not waste yourself now over a pointless gesture. Go. Kalenda looked as if she were about to say something more, but then she stopped. She saluted Osilage, bowed to Gariel, and then turned and ran. Good said Osilage. I hope she makes it. We have to blow the ship, Gariel said, her voice barely more than a whisper. Don't let her be captured. Osilage nodded to her. Yes, he said. You are right. But we must wait. Give the survivors time to escape. Wait until we are in deep among the enemy ships. Take them with us. Wait, wait for Sorsay. Sorsay? Gariel asked, her voice vague and weak. Sorsay, said Osilage. We have to wait for Admiral Akbar. One hour, Luke. Lando shouted. Let's get out of here while we're still in one piece each. Copy that, Lando, said Luke. Back the way we came, and fast backslash. What's going on? Tendra asked. Why are we retreating? We're not retreating, said Lando as he healed the Lady Luck around. We're following Asilis' plan. A plan so simple that even we could follow it. Get in, do as much damage as you can for one hour, and then get out of the way. Get out of the way for what? For Source, my dear Source T. What are you talking about? Lando laughed out loud. It's not much of a code name system, but there it is. Source T for Tendra, Source for Admiral Akbar. Osilage started getting coded hyperwave messages from him the minute the jamming field went down. Akbar had spent every waking moment since we left Karuskin trying to put some sort of task force together. It sounds like he wasn't able to get that big a fleet together, but 25 modern ships with modern weapons will. That ought to do some good out here. Especially if the opposing force is already pretty banged up and disoriented and out of formation and pointed in the wrong direction. Lando dodged the Lady Luck around the shot-up wreck of a modified B-Wing and ran at top speed straight for Centerpoint Station. I think we'll head for the north end of Centerpoint, thank you very much. The end that doesn't fire interstellar death rays. 
But what about Admiral Akbar? What's the rest of the plan? Well, that's pretty simple too. When Admiral Akbar does his precision hyperspace jump, he'll land right on top of them, and they'll never know what hit them. And our ships don't want to be sitting in the shooting gallery. When does he show up? Lando checked the ship's navicomputer and the chronometer. Oh, he said. Right here. And right now. The piece of empty space in front of them was suddenly ablaze with the flaring light of starships coming in out of hyperspace. Ships that were streaks of blazing white, flashing into existence, and screaming past the Lady Luck to either side, over her, under her, so close that they could almost hear the non-existent winds of space rushing past them as the ships roared by. It was an incredible sight, a beautiful sight and a terrifying one. Lando clenched his teeth and wrapped his hands around the flight stick. He held on for dear life, forcing himself by sheer strength of will not to try to dodge the oncoming ships, for fear of flying smack into one he did not see. And then they were passed, and then they were gone, and then Lando slowed the lady to a reasonable speed, and breathed. And then the war was over, for Lando, and for Tendiari. Gary O'Captison was starting to feel the pain. Not in her legs, of course, but everywhere else. Admiral O.S. Silage sat beside her, barely conscious himself, bleeding badly. Gary o thought she could smell something. Burning behind her. Not that such things mattered anymore, of course. In spite of everything, somehow Osilage had managed to open up the control panel set into the side of his chair the ship self-destruct. He had flicked up all of the safeties and pushed down all of the buttons. All but the last. He was waiting, still waiting, still watching his tactical displays. They were barely working, but they would not have to work well at all to show him what he needed to see. There. He said. There. Ship's coming in. They're here. It's time, then, said Gariel. You're a good man, Admiral Osilage. You did your duty. You held them. You stopped them. Well done. Thank you, ma'am. I was I was proud to serve with you. And I with you, she said. But now it's time to go. She thought of her daughter, Melinza, left all alone in the universe. She would be cared for, of that Gariel had no fear. Perhaps, perhaps the universe would compensate for all the sorrow of her young life, and bring her nothing but good as she grew older. It was a comforting thought, Gariel decided. A good thought to go out on. I can't, I can't move my arm, said Osilage. I can't push the button. Here, said Gariel. She looked up and saw at least three triad ships were near. She smiled and reached over. Here, she said again. Let me. The explosion lit the sky, tore a hole across the triad fleet. For a few glorious seconds a new light blazed up, a pillar of fire brighter than all the stars in the sky. Oh, sweet stars in the sky, said Tendra. That was the intruder. They're gone. They're all gone. It's over. Lando looked down at the ship chronometer again, then to center point station, and then toward the distant dot of light that was drawal. No, it isn't, he said. But in one minute and twenty seconds it will be. Maybe for a lot of people. Antone, Jaina shouted. Now. Now. We have to do it now. I. Technician Antone came rushing back in, his eyes bijing out of his head. I can't, he said, and held up the data pad. It's still running. The last part of the problem is still running. It won't be done for another five minutes at least. Twelve million people. Twelve million people. 
Anton sat down on the floor and covered his head with his hands. We're doomed. 3PO moaned. If they control the Starbuster, our enemies will destroy us all. Jason Solo stood riveted to the spot, his eyes as wide as they could be. Everyone in the chamber was rooted to the spot. Twelve million people. They had one chance to make this work, and it would fail because they couldn't give the right numbers to a seven-year-old kid. Wait a second, he said to himself. Who needs numbers? He turned toward his brother, still seated at the console. Anakin, he said. It felt too heavy, right? Can you fix it? Can you close your eyes and feel it? Make it feel right, make it go right? What are you saying? Ebrahim asked. You want him to guess all. Not guess, said Jaina. Feel. Reach out to it, Anakin. Let go of your conscious feelings. Reach out with the Force. Anakin looked at his brother and his sister and swallowed hard, and then he shut his eyes. Yeah, he said. Yeah. Eyes still closed, he held out his hands for controls that weren't there, controls that took form under his hands even as he reached for them. Glowing grids of orange and purple and green appeared and flared up and vanished around his head, but Anakin did not see them. Deep beneath their feet, a deep, determined vibration began to build. They heard the crash of thunder from the repulsor, and the sound of power being gathered, of unimaginable force being channeled and focused and held and ready. The joystick-like control materialized, slithering up perfectly into Anakin's grasp. He pushed the control stick slowly forward, and a cube of perfect blazing orange appeared before his still-closed eyes. He made tiny, imperceptible adjustments with the controls, and the orange cube flickered once and grew brighter. He held the stick forward for a long, long moment and then he pulled it down, as hard as he could. The chamber shuddered with power, and a stream of lightning blazed down the corridor and out into the chamber. They could not see it in the control chamber, except for Anakin, who saw everything perfectly from behind closed eyes. But those on the surface and those in space could see it. They could see the repulsive thunder and roar with repressed power power that seethed and pulsed and flickered in its eagerness to be set free. They saw the power in that repulsor that built up and up and up. And they saw it leap out of the repulsor chamber, tear across space, land square on the south end of center point, just as practically every countdown clock in space reached zero, just at the moment center point was to fire. The south pole lit up with the energy that was supposed to stream out invisible, unseen, undetected into hyperspace, was supposed to reach out across space and murder a star. But the repulsor beam broke up the opening into hyperspace, defocused the beam, detuned it enough that some small part of its energy was converted into visible light. The south pole of center point began to glow, began to throb and pulse with its own power. The glow spread, expanding outward, stretching itself out into a magnificent bubble of light harmless light, that lit the skies of all the Corellian worlds, gleaming, shining, blooming, growing and then guttering down to nothing. Lando Calrissian watched it all from the north end of center point, and started breathing again. He hadn't even realized he had stopped. Now, he said to Tendra, Now it's over. Epilogue. Epilogue. I don't even know why you were so eager to have my fleet come here, said Admiral Akbar in his gravelly voice. He turned and regarded Luke Skywalker through his goggly eyes. They were on draw. As Akbar had been curious to inspect the repulsor, there was hardly any work left for RNY ships to do thanks to Ad. Myro Osilage and Gary O'Captison. Thanks to them, yes, sir, said Luke. Luke thought of Gariel, thought of her daughter, Melinza. 
Luke had promised Melinza he would take care of her mother. How was that debt to be paid? He thought of Osilage, of the difficult, impossible man who also had a knack for doing the difficult, the impossible. I will mourn them both for a long time to come. But we have one. Thanks to them, and many others. And in large part thanks to those three children, over there. Anakin and Jason and Jaina were racing around, climbing around the hummocks of dirt that the repulsor had forced up when it had shoved its way out of the ground. They were being chased by a laughing Jenica Sunson and a Belindy Kalenda who was too busy making ferocious faces to laugh. They were playing in the shadow of the repulsor. Once hidden underground, the top of the cylinder now rose a hundred meters up out of the ground. Han and Leia laughed out loud as their children turned the tables and started chasing Sunson and Kalenda. Mara watched the fun, smiling quietly, and even Chewbacca was enjoying the show. Not far off, Ebrahim and the Duchess Marka were lounging on the ground, intent in conversation. Judging by their eager, focused expressions, they were either talking over some complicated matter of state or, more likely, dissecting some particularly juicy bit of family gossip. It was probably the latter but Luke hoped it was the former. The Duchess would need to practice. Lysiah had told Luke of her plan to appoint Marka the new Governor General of the Sector. Drachma sat by the two drawl, apparently so enthralled with their conversation that she had fallen sound asleep. Luke heard a high-pitched voice raised in protest behind him, answered by a rapid, high-pitched twittering that sounded far from complimentary. He turned around to see Arta and Q9 at it again, bickering over some fine point of droid design or other. 3PO was standing between them, trying to carry them both down. Luke had a feeling 3PO would meet with his usual degree of success. You know, he said, it's the beings on this plane, the humans and the Salonian and the Drawl and the Wookiee and the droids right here. They're the ones who won this war. Not the ships or the guns or the hardware. You're right, of course, said Admiral Akbar. But no one wins a war. There are just different degrees of losing. The damage done on these worlds is shocking. Shocking. It will take them many years to rebuild it all, to sort out all the loose ends. Luke nodded. But at least some of the loose ends were being tidied up already. Admiral Akbar brought news of the arrest of one Farnas Gleesri, a self-styled agent of the Human League part of the spy ring that had sliced its way into far too many government files back on Coruscant. It had taken very little to get Gleesri singing like a bird. The whole Human League spy ring back in Coruscant had been scooped up and thrown in jail where they belong. There was, of course, the question of what to do about the next star on the Starbuster list. The short-term solution was to de-imprint the repulsor controls so they could be used by someone over seven, be ready with the right targeting numbers, and simply fire this repulsor or the one on Salonia as needed. Once it was too little, and too late, the Sikorian Sionians had indeed caved in altogether. The long-term solution was to get the shutdown codes from the triad. As the triad was in an understandably cooperative mood what with the New Republic occupation troops already on the way that didn't seem likely to be too much of a problem. Someone had started the completely false rumor that the New Republic Navy was going to re-aim center point straight at Sikoria's sun, and leave it that way through all the Starbuster pulses until they got the shutdown code. The rumor might well encourage cooperation. And then there was the whole question of studying center point and the repulses on the other three worlds. Who had built the Corellian system, and when, and why, and what had happened to them? Well, some ends were looser than others. Those mysteries might easily take centuries to be solved if they ever were. There was one other loose end that Luke took a personal interest in. But he had a feeling that it would get sorted out without undue delay. You know, said Admiral Akbar. You said it was the people here who won this war. 
I can't help noticing two rather prominent names that seem to be missing. They were on the transport with us. Where in the world have they gone to? Luke smiled. He knew exactly where they were, but he had a feeling they were not much in the mood for. Company. I wouldn't worry too much, Admiral. They're both the sort who are pretty good at taking care of themselves. Lando? Asked Tendra as they wandered about on the churned-up land that the rise of the repulsor had produced. It was not the loveliest of landscapes, but it did have the advantage of providing a good deal of privacy behind every hummock and fro of ground. Yes? Lando asked. What is it? Tendra had found herself on top of a higher-than-usual clump of loose rock. Lando offered his hand, and she took it, used it to steady herself as she slipped and slithered down into the next little furrow of ground. He did not let go of her hand once she was on level ground, and she did not let go of his. Remember how I told you that a Sikorian woman is not allowed to marry without her father's consent, no matter how old she is. Lando felt a little flutter in his chest, a flutter of fear, and excitement, and interest, all mixed up together. Yes, he said, managing to keep his voice steady. What about it? Well, she said, there's just one thing. We don't have to do anything about it immediately, but there's something more I want to tell you about that law. An interesting legal technicality. It's been well established by many precedents that a Sikorian woman is not bound by that law dash, slash she is outside the Sikorian system. If she were on O draw, for example. Is that so? Lando asked, quickly regaining his old equilibrium. The idea needed time, and thought but he definitely liked it at first glance. He smiled, and looked at her lovely face. Is that a certifiable fact? He asked. It is, she said, smiling right back at him. Then why don't we get back to the Lady Luck and discuss the whole matter over dinner? He asked. I've always found legal technicalities to be downright fascinating. End of Star Wars The Corellian Trilogy Book 3 Shutdown at Centerpoint By Roger McBride Allen